Prologue This book is about the rise, fall, and resurrection of an American banking empire, the House of Morgan. Perhaps no other institution has been so encrusted with legend, so ripe with mystery, or exposed to such bitter polemics. Until 1989, J.P. Morgan and Company solemnly presided over American finance from the corner of Broad and Wall. Flanked by the New York Stock Exchange and Federal Hall, the short building at 23 Wall Street, with its unmarked, catter-corner entrance, exhibited a patrician aloofness. Much of our story revolves around this chiseled marble building, and the presidents and prime ministers, moguls and millionaires who marched up its steps. With the records now available, we can follow them inside the world's most secretive bank. The old pre-1935 House of Morgan was probably the most formidable financial combine in history. Started by an American banker, George Peabody, in London in 1838, it was inherited by the Morgan family and transplanted to New York to famous effect. In the popular mind, the two most familiar Morgans, J.P. Morgan, Sr., 1837 to 1913, and J.P. Morgan, Jr., 1867 to 1943, are rolled into a composite beast, J.P. Morgan, that somehow endured for more than a century. Their striking physical resemblance, the bald pate, the bulbous nose, the pear-shaped frame, has only fed confusion. For admirers, these two J.P. Morgans typified the sound, old-fashioned banker whose word was his bond and who sealed his deals with a handshake. Detractors saw them as hypocritical tyrants who bullied companies, conspired with foreign powers, and coaxed America into war for profit. Nobody was ever neutral about the Morgans. Before the Depression, 23 Wall was headquarters of an empire with several foreign outposts. Seated behind roll-top desks on the Broad Street side, the New York partners were allied with three other partnerships, Morgan Grenfell in London, Morgan et Compagnie in Paris, and Drexel and Company, the so-called Philadelphia branch of J.P. Morgan. Of these, Morgan Grenfell was easily the most powerful, forming the central London-New York axis of the Morgan Empire. It was a transatlantic post office for British and American state secrets. Before the New Deal, the term House of Morgan applied either to J.P. Morgan and Company in New York, or, more broadly, to the whole shadowy web of partnerships. The old House of Morgan spawned a thousand conspiracy theories and busy generations of muckrakers. As the most Mandarin of banks, it catered to many prominent families, including the Astors, Guggenheims, DuPonts, and Vanderbilts. It shunned dealings with lesser mortals, thus breeding popular suspicion. Since it financed many industrial giants, including U.S. Steel, General Electric, General Motors, DuPont, and American Telephone and Telegraph, it entered into their councils and aroused fear of undue banker power. The early House of Morgan was something of a cross between a central bank and a private bank. It stopped panics, saved the gold standard, rescued New York City three times, and arbitrated financial disputes. If its concerns transcended an exclusive desire for profit, it also had a peculiar knack for making good works pay. What gave the House of Morgan its tantalizing mystery was its government links. Much like the old Rothschilds and Barings, it seemed insinuated into the power structure of many countries, especially the United States, England, and France, and to a lesser degree, Italy, Belgium, and Japan. As an instrument of U.S. power abroad, its actions were often endowed with broad significance in terms of foreign policy. At a time when a parochial America looked inward, the bank's ties abroad, especially those with the British crown, gave it an ambiguous character and raised questions about its national loyalties. The old Morgan partners were financial ambassadors whose daily business was often closely intertwined with affairs of state. Even today, J.P. Morgan & Company is probably closer to the world's central banks than any other bank. This empire was shattered by the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, which erected a high wall between commercial banking, making loans and accepting deposits, and investment banking, issuing stocks and bonds. 
In 1935, J.P. Morgan & Company chose to remain a commercial bank and spun off Morgan Stanley, an investment house. Seeded with J.P. Morgan capital and personnel, Morgan Stanley for decades clearly exhibited common ancestry with its Morgan brother down the block. They shared many clients and kept alive a family feeling no less potent for its informality. Glass-Steagall didn't bar J.P. Morgan from holding a minority stake in an overseas securities house, however. Until 1981, it kept a one-third interest in Morgan Grenfell. As our story will show, the three Morgan houses functioned as a de facto House of Morgan long after the New Deal ended, and in the early 1970s even contemplated reunion. Today, for the first time, the three houses lack formal links and are engaged in fierce rivalry. As deregulation in London and New York has dismantled old regulatory barriers, the three increasingly clash as they sell competing services. While people know the Morgan houses by name, they are often mystified by their business. They practice a brand of banking that has little resemblance to standard retail banking. These banks have no teller cages, issue no consumer loans, and grant no mortgages. Rather, they perpetuate an ancient European tradition of wholesale banking, serving governments, large corporations, and rich individuals. As practitioners of high finance, they cultivate a discreet style. They avoid branches, seldom hang out signposts, and until recently wouldn't advertise. Their strategy was to make clients feel accepted into a private club, as if a Morgan account were a membership card to the aristocracy. The truest heir to the old house of Morgan is J.P. Morgan & Company, also known by the name of its bank subsidiary, Morgan Guarantee Trust. A universe away from the coarse bustle of Chase Manhattan or Citibank, it seduces the rich with leather armchairs, grandfather clocks, and polished brass lamps. In private dining rooms, anniversaries of accounts are celebrated, with customers receiving engraved menus as souvenirs. The bank won't soil its white gloves with just anybody's cash, and many depositors bring along corporate connections. Although the bank is bashful about revealing precise figures, it prefers personal accounts of at least $5 million and will occasionally stoop as low as $2 million as a favor. The Morgan Bank is the foremost repository of old American money. While private accounts give Morgan its glamorous cachet, they generate only a small fraction of the profits. The bank concentrates on blue-chip corporations and governments organizing large credits and securities issues, and trading foreign exchange and other instruments. The Morgan Bank used to boast that 96 of America's 100 largest corporations were clients, and hinted that in two of the remaining cases it had blackballed the companies as unfit. As with personal accounts, it never wanted to appear too eager for business. Instead of setting up offices hither and yon, it preferred to have clients make pilgrimages to it. This rule applied to its outposts abroad as well. A Lyon businessman would travel to Paris, a Midlands businessman to London, to see his Morgan banker. Even in today's far more competitive world, there is seldom more than one J.P. Morgan office in a country. For more than a century, this traditional formula, reworked many times, has paid off handsomely. On the eve of the 1987 crash, J.P. Morgan & Company was America's most expensive bank, even though only the fourth largest. Based on its share price, it would have cost $8.5 billion to buy, or more than Citicorp. Although beleaguered by over $4 billion of Latin American debt, J.P. Morgan's subsidiary bank, Morgan Guarantee, was America's only major bank to boast a AAA rating. For most of the 1980s, it had the highest return on equity of any bank, often ranking second in profits only to Citicorp and with only half its assets. As the nation's premier trust bank, it managed $65 billion in securities on Black Monday 1987. It has been praised as first in quality by about any measure you can think of and, for many, the perfect bank. Although a fair share of blunders and isolated scandals have undercut the hyperbole, the judgments remain generally valid. 
At least until it swept into hostile takeovers in the late 1980s, Morgan Guaranty best retained the historic Morgan culture of gentlemanly propriety and conservative dealings. As confidant of the Federal Reserve and other central banks, it still exhibits vestiges of its old statesman's role. Morgan Stanley, in contrast, has wandered furthest from its roots. From 1935 through the 1970s, it enjoyed a reign such as no investment bank will ever match. Its clients included six of the seven sister oil companies, Gulf Oil being the exception, and seven of America's ten largest companies. Such success led to storied arrogance, a comic vanity. When one partner left for first Boston in the mid-1970s, he was congratulated by another. That's really exciting. Now you'll be dealing with the second best list of clients. Indeed, the client rosters of any two competitors together couldn't have touched Morgan Stanley's. When the firm started advertising in the 1970s, an agency created a sketch of a thunderbolt piercing a cloud with the caption, If God wanted to do a financing, he would call Morgan Stanley. For Morgan Stanley partners, this neatly summarized their place in the cosmos. Asked at the 1988 annual meeting about the firm's policy of serving on non-client boards, Chairman S. Parker Gilbert paused thoughtfully and replied, We have no non-clients. Once nicknamed the House of Blood, Brains, and Money, Morgan Stanley fussily demanded exclusive relations with companies. If clients dared to consult another house, they were advised to look elsewhere for a banker. Wall Street grumbled about these golden handcuffs, but neither it nor the Justice Department could ever break the shackles. Far from feeling imprisoned, companies craved this association with the Morgan mystique and gloried in their servitude. In floating stocks or bonds, Morgan Stanley insisted on being sole manager, its name engraved in solitary splendor atop the tombstone ads that announce offerings. This pomposity was clever advertising, helping to make Morgan Stanley the Rolls-Royce of investment bankers. Today, Morgan Stanley occupies 16 floors of the Exxon Building in New York City. Its odyssey from a small, genteel underwriting house to a razzle-dazzle financial conglomerate traces the rise of modern Wall Street itself. It has been the perfect bellwether of post-war finance. Long regarded as uncommonly successful but stuffy, it underwent a startling metamorphosis in the 1970s, from which it emerged in unrecognizably aggressive form. Once Wall Street's most conservative firm, it violated taboos it had conscientiously upheld and made respectable a far rougher style of finance. In 1974, it carried out the first hostile raid of the modern era, then dominated that rambunctious world. In early 1989, it was still America's top merger advisor, claiming $60 billion in deals during the year's first half. In the 1980s, it gentrified junk bonds and amassed a huge $2 billion war chest for leveraged buyouts, the decade's riskiest innovation. After shocking Wall Street by siding with corporate raiders, it became a raider itself, acquiring stakes in 40 companies. For more than a decade, an incredulous business press has exclaimed, This is Morgan Stanley? All the while, with its 30% return on equity, it has consistently rated as the most profitable of publicly traded securities firms. It has had unerring strategic judgment. To complete the family album, we note Morgan Grenfell, one of London's most prestigious merchant banks. Throughout its history, it has exuded an aura of Eton, country houses, gentlemen's clubs, and Savile Row tailoring. Tucked away at an angle on L-shaped Great Winchester Street in the city, London's equivalent of Wall Street, it stands unmarked behind a tall, pedimented portal and gauzy curtains. Inside, it has the winding, intimate passageways of a private mansion, lined with small conference rooms named after deceased partners. In the early post-war years, Morgan Grenfell was run by a clutch of rather tired, apathetic old peers and was derisively termed the House of Lords by Morgan Guarantee people. It still has several knights and lords on its blue-ribbon board. 
Through much of the 1950s and 1960s, it mostly issued securities for venerable industrial clients and battled against a lethargy bred by success. Then, like Morgan Stanley, it cast off its sloth and turned into the city's most marauding firm, specializing in aggressive takeovers. Like Morgan Stanley, it used its prestige to stretch the limits of acceptable behavior and became the gentleman pirate of the city. As the star of London's takeover scene in the 1980s, it shattered the sedate world of British finance it had once exemplified. Throughout the decade, it regularly ranked first in London takeovers, and by 1985 was managing four of the six largest acquisitions in the city. Then its dandified raiders, with their swaggering style, led the firm straight into the share price manipulation of the Guinness scandal. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher would personally demand the heads of two Morgan Grenfell executives in what was regarded as the city's worst scandal of the century. The story of the three Morgan banks is nothing less than the history of Anglo-American finance itself. For 150 years, they have stood at the center of every panic, boom, and crash on Wall Street or in the city. They have weathered wars and depressions, scandals and hearings, bomb blasts, and attempted assassinations. No other financial dynasty in modern times has so steadily maintained its preeminence. Its chronicle holds up a mirror in which we can study the changes in the style, ethics, and etiquette of high finance. To order this vast panorama, we will divide our saga into three periods. This framework applies principally to the Morgan houses, but also has, I think, more general relevance to other banks. During the pre-1913 baronial age of Pierpont Morgan, bankers were masters of the economy, or lords of creation in author Frederick Lewis Allen's phrase. They financed canals and railroads, steel mills and shipping lines, supplying the capital for a nascent industrial society. In this age of savagely unruly competition, bankers settled disputes among companies and organized trusts to tame competition. As the major intermediaries between users and providers of capital, they oversaw massive industrial development. Because they rationed scarce capital, they were often more powerful than the companies they financed and acquired increasing control over them. This produced a generation of headstrong bankers who rolled up fabled fortunes, aroused terror in the populace, and finally prompted a political campaign to curb their hypertrophied influence. In the diplomatic age of J.P. Morgan, Jr., bounded by the two world wars, Private bankers served as adjuncts of government, performing covert missions and operating as co-equals of central banks. Morgan bankers were now power brokers and unofficial representatives of governments at global conferences. As confidants of kings, presidents, and popes, they operated under the close supervision of Washington or Whitehall in foreign dealings. To the outside world, they often seemed the visible face of government policy. At home, they remained traditional banker to companies that, if still loyal, decreasingly needed the patronage of a strong banker. Maintaining exclusive relations with clients, the Morgan partners enjoyed the luxury of a world that seems enviably graceful and unhurried by modern standards. In the post-war casino age, bankers have lost control over clients in the fierce, anonymous competition of global markets. Multinational corporations now tower over bankers and rival them in terms of capital and financial expertise. Institutional investors, such as insurance companies, mutual funds, and pension funds, present new countervailing sources of power. With companies and governments able to raise money in many currencies and countries, the power balance has tilted dramatically away from the bankers. This sounds paradoxical in an age dominated by daily news stories of flashy billion-dollar deals. Yet, as the Morgan story shows, this new style of financial aggression is really a symptom of the banker's weakness. As their old clients have been liberated, gentlemen bankers have had to hustle for business and search for new niches. They have found these niches in a ruthless world of corporate takeovers that has rescued them but endangered the economy. 
In this bruising new age of finance, bankers have jettisoned traditions that had ruled Anglo-American finance since Victorian times. This book's thesis is that there will never be another bank as powerful, mysterious, or opulent as the old House of Morgan. What the Rothschilds represented in the 19th century and the Morgans in the 20th won't be replicated by any firm in the next century. The banker no longer enjoys a monopoly on large pools of money. As world finance has matured, power has become dispersed among many institutions and financial centers. So, our story looks back at a banking world fast vanishing from sight, one of vast estates, art collections, and ocean-going yachts, of bankers who hobnobbed with heads of state and fancied themselves ersatz royalty. Contrary to the usual law of perspective, the Morgans seem to grow larger as they recede in time. Brooklyn, New York, July 1989 Part 1. The Baronial Age, 1838-1913 Chapter 1. Scrooge When Baltimore merchant George Peabody sailed for London in 1835, the world was in the throes of a debt crisis. The defaulting governments weren't obscure Balkan nations or South American republics, but American states. The United States had succumbed to a craze for building railroads, canals, and turnpikes, all backed by state credit. Now Maryland legislators, with the bravado of the ruined, threatened to join other states in skipping interest payments on their bonds, which were largely marketed in London. As one of three state commissioners assigned to renegotiate the debt, Peabody urged officials to tone down their rhetoric and placate British bankers. But American legislators found it easier to pander to the hatred of foreign bankers rather than to raise new taxes to service debt. London was the sun in the financial solar system. Only Britain had a huge surplus of funds in a capital-short world, and sterling was the currency of world trade, its official use dated back to William the Conqueror. In the afterglow of the Napoleonic Wars, bankers of the city, London's financial district, were self-styled potentates, often with access to more money than the governments and companies they financed. Firms such as Barings and Rothschilds maintained an imperial reserve, omitting their names from doorways and letterheads, refusing to solicit business or open branches, and demanding exclusive client relations. Statesmen from Europe and Latin America trooped humbly to their doorsteps. One observer remarked, To be asked for lunch was like being received in audience by a king. Though intensely patriotic, the forty-year-old Peabody identified with the British creditors. When the other Maryland commissioners returned home in despair, Peabody threw a glittering dinner for a dozen bankers to persuade them that Americans weren't all rustic swindlers. He argued that only new loans could guarantee repayment of the old, a convenient line to be echoed by many future debtor states. Far from cutting off Maryland's credit, the bankers advanced another eight million dollars. As his friend, the English political leader George Owen, said of Peabody, he borrowed the money on his face. 
To mitigate British prejudice against venal Americans, he boldly waived his $60,000 commission from Maryland. Peabody, a good talker, was not prepossessing. Over six feet tall, with light blue eyes and dark brown hair, he had a rumpled face with knobby chin, bulbous nose, side whiskers, and heavy-lidded eyes. That this homely man would found the house of Morgan, later a white glove affair, with high society partners famous for good looks and stylish dress, is ironic. He carried the scars of early poverty, and was quick to feel slights and perceive enemies. Like many who have overcome early hardship by brute force, he was proud but insecure, always at war with the world and counting his injuries. Born in Danvers, Massachusetts, he had only a few years of schooling. When he was a teenager, his father died, and Peabody worked in his brother's shop to support his widowed mother and six siblings. When he later prospered in a Baltimore dry goods business with a rich older partner, Elisha Riggs, he remained haunted by his past. I have never forgotten, and never can forget, the great privations of my early years, he later said. He hoarded his money, worked incessantly, and retained a lonely air. In 1837, Peabody moved to London. A year later, he opened a merchant house at 31 Moorgate in London, furnishing it with a mahogany counter, a safe, and some desks. He joined a select group of merchant bankers who traded in dry goods and also financed such trade. Hence, their businesses became known as merchant banks. They developed a form of wholesale banking remote from the prosaic world of bank books, teller windows, and checking accounts. Their specialty was high finance, serving only governments, large companies, and rich individuals. They financed overseas trade, issued stocks and bonds, and dealt in commodities. Ordinary people could no more do business with George Peabody than they can today place a deposit with Morgan Guarantee, Morgan Grenfell, or Morgan Stanley. In setting up in London, Peabody planted the American flag in alien territory. The United States relied on British capital to finance development, and often resented that its economic fate was decided abroad. As one congressman said in 1833, the barometer of the American money market hangs up at the stock exchange in London. Peabody, hoping to tap this transatlantic money flow, became a leading dealer of American state bonds in London, reversing a contemporary trend in which London banks sent representatives to America. The House of Baring, which bankrolled the Louisiana Purchase and always had an American on its board, employed Thomas Ward as its American agent, while the Rothschilds, who were ambivalent about America, posted August Belmont Sr. to New York. Instead of blending into his British milieu, Peabody shrewdly flaunted his Americanism, wrapping himself in the flag and boosting American products. He declared that George Peabody and company would be an American house, and that he wanted to give it an American atmosphere, to furnish it with American journals, to make it a center for American news, and an agreeable place for my American friends visiting London. Yet amid the patriotic pride lurked a colonial mentality, possibly a sense of his own inferiority, a constant need to impress the British. He hoped to refute what had almost become a byword among the English, that no American house in London could long sustain their credit. Beneath a genial air, Peabody was a solitary miser. He lived in furnished rooms in a Regent Street hotel, and aside from taking occasional fishing trips, worked non-stop. During one twelve-year period, he never took off two consecutive days, and spent an average of ten hours per day at work. Notwithstanding his stirring speeches about America's destiny, he didn't return home for twenty years, and during that time his personality darkened, along with the dismal performance of American state bonds. During the severe depression of the early 1840s, a decade dubbed the Hungry Forties, state debt plunged to fifty cents on the dollar. The worst came when five American states, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, Indiana, Arkansas, and Michigan, and the Florida Territory, defaulted on their interest payments. 
In an early debtor's cartel, some American governors banded together to favor debt repudiation. To this day, the reprobate Mississippi remains in unashamed default. British investors cursed America as a land of cheats, rascals, and ingrates. State defaults also tainted federal credit, and when Washington sent Treasury agents to Europe in 1842, James de Rothschild thundered, Tell them you have seen the man who is at the head of the finances of Europe, and that he has told you that they cannot borrow a dollar. Not a dollar. Clergyman Sidney Smith sneered at the American mob, and said that whenever he met a Pennsylvanian at a London dinner, he felt a disposition to seize and divide him. How such a man can set himself down at an English table without feeling that he owes two or three pounds to every man in the company, I am at a loss to conceive. He has no more right to eat with honest men than a leper has to eat with clean men. Even Charles Dickens couldn't resist a jab portraying a nightmare in which Scrooge's solid British assets are transformed into a mere United States security. When his beloved Maryland defaulted, Peabody's own nightmare was complete. Whenever he met a British investor, he said, he felt shame. The British were especially incensed over Maryland and Pennsylvania, because those states were settled by Anglo-Saxon stock, and therefore should have known better. Having marketed about half of Maryland's securities to individual investors in Europe, Peabody was victimized by his own success. The brouhaha had direct repercussions, and he became persona non grata around London. The London Times noted that while Peabody was an American gentleman of the most unblemished character, the Reform Club had blackballed him for being a citizen of a country that reneged on its debts. Gloomily, he wrote a friend, you and I will, I trust, see that happy day when, as formerly, we can own ourselves Americans in Europe without a blush for the character of our country. A hallmark of merchant bankers was that they vouched for the securities they sponsored. At first, Peabody merely sent letters to Baltimore friends, scolding them about the need for Maryland to resume interest payments. Then he tired of persuasion and rewarded reporters with small gratuities for favorable articles about the state. At last, in 1845, he conspired with Barings to push Maryland into resuming payment. They set up a political slush fund to spread propaganda for debt resumption and to elect sympathetic legislators. They even drafted the clergy into giving sermons on the sanctity of contracts. By means of a secret account, the two firms transferred £1,000 to Baltimore, 90% from Barings and 10% from Peabody, a strategy Barings duplicated in Pennsylvania. Most shocking of all, Barings bribed Daniel Webster, the orator and statesman, to make speeches for debt repayment. The bankers conducted this shabby campaign with a skulking sense of guilt. It wasn't their preferred style. Your payment to Mr. Webster would not appear very well if it should get out. Joshua Bates, the senior bearing partner, warned Thomas Ward, American bagman for the operation. Bates, a sober, diligent Bostonian, cringed at what they were doing. I have a sort of instinctive horror of doing one thing to affect another, or using any sort of subterfuge or reserve, he confessed to Ward. Whatever their scruples, the conspiracy thrived. Pro-resumption Whigs were elected in both Maryland and Pennsylvania, and London bankers again received payments from both states. Peabody, never one to forget an injury, excluded the most persistent debtors, Florida and Mississippi, from his later philanthropies. Even altruism had its limits. When the depreciated state bonds Peabody had bought up in the early 1840s paid interest again, he reaped a fortune. Then, as revolution swept across the continent in 1848, American securities seemed a safe haven in comparison with Europe. And as the California gold rush and Mexican war wiped away the last vestiges of depression by the late 1840s, Peabody took new pride in his native roots. Now he fancied himself the ambassador of American culture in London, and dispensed barrels full of American apples, Boston crackers, and hominy grits. 
On July 4, 1851, he hosted the first of his Independence Day dinners, featuring the elderly Duke of Wellington as guest of honor. Beneath a portrait of Queen Victoria and a Gilbert Stuart of George Washington, the British minister in Washington and the American minister in London drained an oak loving cup and toasted the start of the great exhibition in London's new Crystal Palace. Because Congress wouldn't finance American exhibitors, Peabody played the impresario, paying to display Cyrus McCormick's Reaper and Samuel Colt's revolvers. But not all of Peabody's July 4th pageants of Anglo-American friendship followed the desired script. In 1854, when Peabody toasted Queen Victoria before President Pierce, an act Washington thought arch-heresy, James Buchanan, the U.S. ambassador in London and later president, indignantly stormed from the room. As banker and Cicerone for Americans in London, once, in a single week, he dined eighty visiting Americans and took thirty-five to the opera, Peabody was constantly exposed to the fierce snobbery of British aristocrats toward the American commercial class. This condescension was particularly flagrant during Commodore Vanderbilt's trip to London in 1853. The Commodore, vulgar, profane, and lecherous, wanted to show London society the full splendor of America's richest man. With his wife and twelve children, he had sailed to England aboard his ornate 2,000-ton North Star equipped with caterer, doctor, and chaplain. Peabody squired the Vanderbilts about Hyde Park and installed them in his box at Covent Garden. Meanwhile, the court ostracized the ostentatious Commodore. Peabody amassed a $20 million fortune in the 1850s as he financed everything from the silk trade with China to iron rail exports to America. Although he built a lyceum and library for his native Danvers in the early 1850s, he mostly hoarded his money in preparation for the next panic. His insecurities only worsened as he had more to lose. He told a friend in 1852, My capital is ample, certainly nearer 400,000 pounds than 300,000, but I have passed too many money panics unscathed not to have seen how often large capitals are swept away, and that even with my own I must use caution. Junius Morgan, who became Peabody's partner in 1854, later told how he found him one morning at the counting-house looking sickly and rheumatic. The miserly Peabody didn't own a carriage, but came to work by public horse-car. Mr. Peabody, with that cold, you ought not to stick here, Morgan said. Taking hat and umbrella, Peabody agreed to go home. Twenty minutes later, on his way to the Royal Exchange, Morgan found Peabody standing in the rain. "'Mr. Peabody, I thought you were going home,' the younger man said. "'Well, I am, Morgan,' Peabody replied. "'But there's only been a tuppenny bus come along as yet, and I'm waiting for a penny one.' By this time Peabody's bank account bulged with over one million pounds. Enjoying the clerk's revenge, Thomas Perman, Peabody's assistant, handed down a trove of nasty stories that tarnished the halo Peabody acquired as a result of his benevolence. He told how his boss, who ate lunch at his desk each day from a small leather lunchbox, would dispatch an office boy to buy him an apple. These apples cost one pence halfpenny, and Peabody would give the boy tuppence. Although the boy dreamed of keeping the halfpenny change as a tip, Peabody always demanded it back. By the early 1850s, Peabody was approaching sixty and plagued by gout and rheumatism. His annual savings were staggering. He spent only about $3,000 of a total annual income of $300,000. With such wealth and such stinginess, he was ripe for spiritual conversion. As he later said, When aches and pains came upon me, I realized I was not immortal. I found that there were men in life just as anxious to help the poor and destitute as I was to make money. Wanting to dedicate himself to philanthropy, Peabody had only one problem. As an autocratic banker, he had never shared authority, and only reluctantly made his office manager, Charles C. Gooch, a junior partner in 1851, so that someone could act in his absence. Gooch was a sad-faced Bob Cratchit, who addressed Peabody like a trembling clerk. 
In fact, he had started as head clerk. He started one letter to his boss by writing, "'Dear Sir, I do not often trouble you with letters, for I know you do not like the trouble of reading them, and mine are on subjects not over-agreeable.' Gooch was being groomed for a career of permanent subordination and forelock tugging. Ordinarily, Peabody would have chosen a son or nephew to take over the business. Most merchant banks were family partnerships with a few talented outsiders. But as a bachelor, Peabody was in the unusual position of having to shop for an heir and bequeath his empire to a stranger. He was, however, no stranger to the company of women— while he didn't smoke or drink, he resorted to the shadowy world of illicit pleasures. The tale-bearing Perman regaled the Morgans with the story of Peabody's mistress in Brighton, whom he liberally favored with advances of two thousand pounds. He excluded this woman and her illegitimate daughter from his will, and for years after his death Peabody's daughter, Mrs. Thomas, would materialize and badger the Morgans for money. In the late 1890s, the Morgans received an appeal from her two sons, one training to be a barrister, the other at Oxford or Cambridge. The aging Perman was dispatched to verify their Peabody genes. When he returned, he breathed with amazement, Both of them have the old man's nose to a dot. We don't know why Peabody relegated love to the dim corners of his life. In general, he specialized in what Dickens called telescopic philanthropy, bountiful love for abstract humanity combined with extreme stinginess toward the individuals he knew personally. He would enjoy a reputation for generosity throughout the Victorian world, everywhere, in fact, but among his unacknowledged family and employees. Peabody had definite requirements for his successor— he wanted a sociable American with a family and experience in foreign trade. His Boston associate, James Beebe, recommended his junior partner, Junius Spencer Morgan. Junius had been with J. M. Beebe Morgan for three years. In May 1853, he visited London with his family, bringing along his high-spirited but sickly son, John Pierpont, then recovering from rheumatic fever. Pierpont was boyishly thrilled with his first exposure to British culture. He visited Buckingham Palace and Westminster Abbey, excitedly handled a million pounds of bullion at the Bank of England, and listened to a Sunday sermon at St. Paul's. Meanwhile, his father talked business with Peabody, whom Pierpont found pleasant but smoky. In general, Pierpont found Peabody a queer, likable old buzzard. Junius Spencer Morgan was tall with sloping shoulders and the thickening midriff of a strong but sedentary man. He had a wide face, light blue eyes, a prominent nose, and a firm mouth. He was witty and genial, but a deep reserve and watchfulness lay behind the charm. Junius Morgan always had a gravely mature air. His skeptical eyes gave him a hooded gaze, a banker's air of vigilance. Big and brooding, he was the sort of prematurely middle-aged young man old financiers found consoling. A contemporary writer called him grim-mouthed. Indeed, it is hard to imagine him young or carefree. He was solemn and businesslike, and always master of his emotions. Peabody asked Morgan to be his partner and receive his empire on a silver platter. Junius's grandson, J.P. Morgan, Jr., later recounted their exchange. "'You know,' said Peabody, "'I shall not want to go on much longer. "'But if you will come as a partner for ten years, "'I shall retire at the end of them, "'and at that time shall be willing to leave my name, "'and if you have not accumulated a reasonable amount of capital in the concern, "'some of my money also, and you can go ahead as the head of it.' "'Well, Mr. Peabody,' replied Morgan, "'that sounds like a very good offer.' but there are many things to be considered, and I could not think of giving an answer until I have looked over the books of the firm and have some idea of the business and of the methods by which it is done. It is revealing that Morgan didn't leap at the fortune, but responded with cool self-control. Evidently, he was mightily pleased by the books, 
capital of four hundred fifty thousand pounds, a calibre of business only one rung below the houses of Baring and Rothschild. So, in October 1854, he was admitted into partnership, and he settled into new walnut-panelled headquarters at 22 Old Broad Street. The partnership document stipulated that the firm would buy and sell stocks, engage in foreign exchange, extend banking credits, and broker railroad iron and other commodities. To entertain American visitors, Peabody gave Morgan an expense account of £2,500 per year. A fortune had been deeded over, or so it seemed at the time. A decade later, as Peabody was being canonized for his philanthropy, Junius Morgan would bitterly recall the promises Peabody had made to him, and he would join the ranks of those spurned during George Peabody's ascent to sainthood. When Morgan moved to London in 1854, it was a more auspicious time for an American banker than it had been when Peabody was flogging the hated Maryland bonds in the 1830s. American grain prices soared during the Crimean War, and Western railroads that transported grain boomed as well, creating a mania for their shares. Railroads devoured vast amounts of capital, and in the decade before the Civil War, investors poured one billion dollars into their development, triple any former commitment. As a leading London dealer of American railroad securities, George Peabody and Company was well placed to exploit this latest craze. Yet, as the decade passed, Junius Morgan must have doubted the wisdom of transplanting his family to England. Peabody was a trying partner, and no real warmth existed between the two, as shown by their correspondence when the junior partner visited America each year. Their letters are formal and correct, but notably lacking even in pleasantries. Morgan would make obligatory inquiries about Peabody's health, always apt to please his hypochondriacal partner, but addressed him as Dear Sir, and signed each letter with frosty respect, J. S. Morgan. Morgan found Peabody petty and vindictive, and told how his partner once spent half the afternoon hauling some poor cab driver down to the police station for overcharging him. Then, in 1857, it looked as if Morgan would be denied his promised fortune. Wheat prices tumbled with the end of the Crimean War, causing hardship for American banks and railroads. By October, New York banks stopped gold payments, preventing American correspondents from transferring funds to Peabody in London. He was suddenly overextended on his American bills. At the same time, London investors sold American securities, siphoning more funds from Peabody and provoking a serious cash squeeze. Rumors raced through London that George Peabody and company was about to fail, a prospect heartily relished by rivals who disliked the old American. Morgan had also earned the displeasure of Barings by aggressively cutting prices on American securities and trying to steal their accounts. Now the major London houses told Morgan they would bail out the firm, but only if Peabody shut down the bank within a year. When Morgan relayed this patent blackmail to Peabody, the older man reacted like a wounded lion. Defiant, he dared them to bring down his firm. George Peabody and Company was saved by an emergency credit line of £800,000 from the Bank of England, with Barings a guarantor of the loan. The vengeful Peabody, who felt Barings had mercilessly pressed him to pay outstanding bills, asked that the name of the firm be stricken from a published list of banks rescuing his firm. For Peabody, who had just made a resplendent return to America after a twenty-year absence, the incident confirmed his innate pessimism. "'It is not yet three months since I parted from you, and left the country prosperous and the people happy,' he wrote his niece. "'Now all is gloom and affliction.' The 1857 panic made a deep impression on Morgan's twenty-year-old son, Pierpont, who had just started on Wall Street as an unsalaried apprentice at Duncan Sherman & Company, New York agent for Peabody. Tutored by partner Charles Dabney, an excellent accountant, Pierpont learned to evaluate ledgers and fathom the mysteries of the chaotic American banking system. Ever since Andrew Jackson killed the Second Bank of the United States in 1832, the United States lacked a uniform currency, 
Each state had a separate banking system, and in many places debts could be settled in foreign currency. Pierpont, new to Wall Street, was vexed by rumors of his father's pending default and heard about the Bank of England rescue while visiting Cyrus Fields' office. His later tolerance for the proposed Federal Reserve System has often been traced to this early Bank of England bailout of his father's firm. It was a baptism by fire for the Morgan family. Shaken, the elder Morgan became a more cautious and skeptical banker. He now demanded to see statements from correspondent banks in America, even if it meant offending them. And he began to lecture his son, often at wearisome length, on the need for conservative business practice. The 1857 panic would be the text of many sermons. "'You are commencing upon your business career at an eventful time,' he wrote. "'Let what you now witness make an impression not to be eradicated.' Slow and sure should be the motto of every young man. Junius Morgan developed a lofty disdain for price competition and adopted the royal passivity of the Rothschilds and the Barings, who refused to offer cut-rate terms. If we cannot keep the account on such a basis, we must be content to let others outbid us. Another disaster soon followed. Like the French Banque d'Affaires or the Universal German Banks, London merchant banks took equity stakes in ventures. For instance, George Peabody and Company had helped to bankroll Sir John Franklin's expedition in search of the Northwest Passage. But its most far-sighted bet was a £100,000 investment in Cyrus Field's transatlantic cable, which would unite Wall Street and the city. The scheme looked inspired on August 16, 1858, when Queen Victoria made the first cable call to President James Buchanan. In a burst of national pride, New York City engaged in two weeks of fireworks and euphoric celebration. Peabody dizzily wrote to Field, "'Your reflections must be like those of Columbus after the discovery of America.' He spoke too soon, however. In September, the cable snapped, the venture's share prices plummeted, and Peabody and Junius Morgan absorbed steep losses. Eight years would pass before full service was restored. Although Peabody was nominal head until 1864, Junius Morgan assumed control of George Peabody and Company in 1859. In increasingly poor health, Peabody took his first European vacation in 21 years. After the outbreak of the American Civil War, Morgan traded Union bonds, which seesawed with the outcome of each battle. After the Union army was routed at Bull Run, bonds plunged, then rebounded sharply when Union troops stopped the Confederate advance at Antietam Creek. Sending a telegram via Nova Scotia, Pierpont alerted his father to Vicksburg's fall in July 1863, in time for the elder Morgan to profit from a sudden rise in American securities. Such calamity trading wasn't thought bloodthirsty or reprehensible among merchant bankers, but had an honored place in their mythology. As one Rothschild boasted, When the streets of Paris are running with blood, I buy. Despite his Yankee sympathies, Morgan was stymied in undertaking union financing. After southern banks drained their deposits from the north, Lincoln cast about for new sources of funds. With Lancashire textile mills closely allied with southern cotton plantations, the city was cool to any large-scale operation for the North. To finance the war debt, the president turned to Philadelphia banker Jay Cook, later dubbed a financial P.T. Barnum, whose agents fanned out across America to sell war bonds in the first mass-market securities operation in the country's history. Among the buyers in London were George Peabody and Junius Morgan. Yet the Civil War was the one major military conflict in which the Morgans were handicapped by political circumstances. It was a bonanza for German-Jewish bankers on Wall Street who raised loans from the numerous Union sympathizers in Germany. In future, the Morgans' political impulses would mesh perfectly with profitable opportunities. The Civil War years saw the metamorphosis of George Peabody from Scrooge to Santa Claus. He had been a prototypical heartless banker, a one-dimensional hoarder. 
as a contemporary said, Uncle George, as Americans call him, was one of the dullest men in the world. He had positively no gift except that of making money. Yet this dour man suddenly became prodigal in his gifts. His philanthropy was as immoderate as his earlier greed. He found it hard to break his miserly habits. It is not easy to part with the wealth we have accumulated after years of hard work and difficulty, he confessed. Now a lifetime of hoarding was disgorged in one compensatory binge, cleansing his Yankee conscience. Perhaps as a young man Peabody had worked too much for others, and as an adult too much for himself. In any event, he could do nothing by halves, and again went to extremes. By 1857 he had begun to endow a Peabody Institute in Baltimore. Unlike later Morgan benefactions, often anonymous and discreet, Peabody wanted his name plastered on every library, fund, or museum he endowed. In 1862 he began to transfer 150,000 pounds to a trust fund to build housing projects for London's poor. These Peabody estates, with gas lamps and running water, would be a vast improvement over the medieval poorhouses of Victorian London, and they still dot the city. He deeded a 5,000-share block of the Hudson's Bay Company to finance the operation. For this revolutionary act of generosity, he became the first American to receive the freedom of the City of London. From a full and grateful heart, he declared at a mansion house dinner, I say that this day has repaid me for the care and anxiety of fifty years of commercial life. Peabody's open-handedness became so proverbial that he was soon besieged with a thousand begging letters a month. During Peabody's last years, the scope of his charity grew dazzling. He endowed a natural history museum at Yale University, an archaeology and ethnology museum at Harvard, and an educational fund for emancipated Southern blacks. For this last, he handed over a $1 million batch of defaulted Mississippi and Florida bonds, hoping these states would someday resume payment and enrich the fund. There were further bequests for the housing projects, finally amounting to £500,000. As Peabody turned into a one-man welfare state, admirers saw celestial virtues in this former skinflint. Victor Hugo remarked, On this earth there are men of hate and men of love. Peabody was one of the latter. It is on the face of these men that we see the smile of God. Gladstone said that he taught men how to use money and how not to be its slave. Queen Victoria tried to honor him with a baronetcy or a knighthood, but Peabody, as if a stranger to worldly pleasures, declined this one. Instead, the Queen dashed off a fulsome personal note from Windsor Castle, praising Peabody's princely munificence to London's poor, and enclosing a miniature portrait of herself, wearing the Kohinoor diamond and the decoration of the Order of the Garter. Throughout this apotheosis, Peabody never extended his charity to Junius Morgan. In 1864, their ten-year agreement expired, and Peabody retired. At this point, according to the promise Peabody had made to lure Morgan to London, the junior partner was to receive the use of his name and possibly his capital. Instead, Peabody decided to pull both his name and his capital from the concern. Perhaps in his new sanctity he wanted to erase his name from the financial map and enshrine it in the world of good works. But to Morgan, as later recorded by his grandson, it was, at that time, the bitterest disappointment of his life that Peabody refused to allow the old firm name to be continued. Junius reluctantly renamed the firm J.S. Morgan & Company, its name until Morgan Grenfell was formed in 1910. Peabody also forced Morgan to buy the office lease at 22 Old Broad Street on onerous terms. J.P. Morgan, Jr. wrote, my grandfather always used to say that Mr. Peabody had been very hard on him as to the price of the lease. Of course, Junius Morgan's anger toward Peabody was tempered by the extraordinary profits they had divided, over 444,000 pounds earned in a ten-year period, and he had inherited the chief American bank in London. 
When Peabody died in 1869, at age 74, the British government dug a grave for him in Westminster Abbey, but his deathbed words, Danvers, Danvers, don't forget, deprived London of his remains. The Prince of Wales, later Edward VII, unveiled a statue of Peabody behind the Royal Exchange, a rare honor considering the scarce space in the city. Even in death, Peabody managed to foster Anglo-American harmony. The British had just built a forbidding warship, the Monarch, whose sheer size caused consternation in America and scare talk of the vessels being used to demand tribute from American cities. The young Andrew Carnegie sent an anonymous cable to the British cabinet. First and best service possible for Monarch, bringing home body Peabody. Whether this was the genesis of the idea or not, Queen Victoria shipped Peabody's corpse to America aboard the ironclad. The ship rigged up a maudlin funeral chapel, with tall candles burning above a black-draped coffin. In America, the ship was met by Admiral Farragut's squadron. Pierpont Morgan, in charge of funeral arrangements, devised a tribute of martial splendor, with British and American soldiers marching together behind the financier's coffin. Before leaving Peabody, we might note an exchange about him within the House of Morgan in 1946. Thomas W. Lamont, chairman of J.P. Morgan & Company, asked Lord Bister, senior partner of Morgan Grenfell, for a photostat of Queen Victoria's letter thanking Peabody for aiding London's poor. Two years from his death, Lamont was in a nostalgic mood, but Lord Bister enjoyed shocking the unsuspecting. I have always understood that Mr. Peabody, though known as a great philanthropist, was one of the meanest men that ever walked. I do not know if you ever saw the statue of him sitting on a chair behind the Royal Exchange. Old Mr. Burns told me once that when subscriptions were invited in the city to erect a statue, there was so little enthusiasm that there was not sufficient money to pay for the chair, and Mr. Peabody had to pay for it himself. When I first came here, the head of our office was Mr. Perman, and I remember, when he had been here sixty years, Teddy Grenfell and I gave all the staff a dinner at the Saucy, and we took them to a music hall afterwards, and old Mr. Perman was at his desk at nine o'clock the next morning. He knew George Peabody's form well, and used to tell Jack Morgan many stories, indicative of his meanness. I always understood that when he retired— he announced he was leaving his money in the business, and at once proceeded to take it out. I believe he left several illegitimate children totally unprovided for. Chapter 2 Polonius If Emerson was correct that an institution is the lengthened shadow of a man, then the shadow-caster of the House of Morgan was Junius Spencer Morgan. Pounded into his son Pierpont, his precepts codified Morgan philosophy for a century. He was a fuss-budget father, fretting over son and bank, a figure so massive and willful that only his son, retrospectively, could reduce him to merely the father of J. Pierpont Morgan. As one journalist said, the Morgans always believed in absolute monarchy. While Junius Morgan lived, he ruled the family and the business, his son and his partners. Until Junius died in 1890, his massive shadow dominated his son's life. Junius was cool and steady, and seldom showed his hand. He had a dry wit and a genial manner, and employed iron discipline. His friend George Smalley praised his grave, strong beauty, and his eyes full of light, but noticed the face ended in an immovable jaw, all will. Sometimes the stone façade broke down, but imperceptibly. Once or twice I have seen him angry, and he showed his anger by a sudden restraint of speech and of manner. That was as far as Junius betrayed emotion. Where George Peabody bore the scars of early poverty, Junius Morgan had the smooth manners and poise of inherited wealth. Among the possessors of great American fortunes, the Morgans boasted a uniquely pampered lineage. 
They didn't claw their way up from poverty or legitimize a bloody frontier fortune with later respectability. By the early 19th century, they were well-to-do, enjoying a cushion of security generations thick. Affluent and well-bred, they weren't rejected by European aristocracy, as were the Vanderbilts. One finds it hard to track down those poor, benighted Morgans whose early suffering made later wealth glorious. By no accident, the family produced defenders of the social order, whose vices sprang from too much comfort and too little exposure to ordinary human misery. The first Morgan in America was Miles, who emigrated from Wales to Springfield, Massachusetts, sixteen years after the Mayflower landed at Plymouth. He prospered as a farmer and fighter of Indians, spawning generations of landowning Morgans. His descendant, Joseph Morgan, fought with Washington's army during the American Revolution. In 1817, Joseph sold his farm in West Springfield, Massachusetts, and moved to Hartford, Connecticut, which would become the Morgans' ancestral home. Joseph had a refined air, a straight, delicate nose, and coolly discerning eyes. Like later Morgans, he was a hymn-singer and Bible-thumper, and subscribed to the Wadsworth Athenaeum, the city's new art museum. As a businessman, he strikingly resembled his progeny. He bought a stagecoach line and the Exchange Coffee House, on whose premises he helped to organize the Aetna Fire Insurance Company. In irrepressible Morgan style, he added the City Hotel, invested in canal and steamboat companies, directed a bank, and helped finance the Hartford and New Haven Railroad, whose grisly train wrecks would haunt his descendants. Joseph made his great windfall in December 1835, when a fire in the Wall Street area destroyed over 600 buildings. As an Aetna founder, he insisted that the firm pay customers promptly, and even bought up Aetna stakes from investors who hesitated to pay. Joseph Morgan's quick action made the firm's reputation on Wall Street, and later enabled it to triple its premiums. To Joseph's wife, Sarah, the Morgans owe those strange eyes, fearful, querulous, and burning, that shone with such famous intensity in the face of young Pierpont. Sarah had a fleshy chin and bulbous nose, adding a pleasant roundness to the patrician Morgan face. In 1836, Joseph bought his son, Junius, a partnership in the Hartford Dry Goods House of Howe and Mather. That same year, Junius married Juliet Pierpont, daughter of the Reverend John Pierpont of Boston, pastor of the old Hollis Street Church. This union of Morgan and Pierpont joined together in their infant son, John Pierpont, born in 1837, a wildly improbable set of genes. A poet and preacher, the Reverend John Pierpont was a fiery abolitionist and friend of William Lloyd Garrison and Henry Ward Beecher. With craggy face and tousled hair, he spurned the Morgan's Yankee trader values. He was a failed merchant from an old New England family, and had a romantic temperament and a crusading spirit. He engaged in a bitter public row with his Boston parishioners, and was charged with moral impurity for speaking the word whore. With the church cellar rented to a local rum merchant, the congregation found his views on temperance subversive. It was said that in the heat of argument, the Reverend Pierpont's prominent nose became inflamed, as would his grandson's. To Reverend Pierpont, the Morgans probably owe the streak of repressed romanticism and moralism in their later history. Not by chance would the House of Morgan fancy itself Wall Street's conscience and attract many sons of preachers and teachers. When Joseph died in 1847, he left an estate of more than one million dollars. Four years later, Junius cashed in his stake in Howe and Mather for an estimated six hundred thousand dollars and moved to Boston to hunt bigger game. As partner in the restyled J.M.B.B. Morgan & Company, the city's largest mercantile house, he operated on a global scale, exporting and financing cotton and other goods carried by clipper ships from Boston Harbor. It was here that he came to George Peabody's attention. By this point, Junius's son Pierpont already seemed quite contradictory. One side of him was pure homo economicus. 
As a small boy, he was restricted to a twenty-five-cent weekly allowance and minutely noted candy and orange purchases in a ledger. At twelve, he charged admission to a viewing of his diorama of Columbus's landing. As an adolescent, he was ardent and high-spirited, but also petulant and prone to sudden mood swings. He was afflicted with facial rashes, which made him morbidly self-conscious, and his childhood was marred by constant headaches, scarlet fever, and ailments of mysterious provenance. Perhaps the contrast between his own steady nature and Pierpont's unruly temper made Junius fret unduly about his boy. With granite will he began to mold Pierpont, instructing him to associate with those of his grammar school classmates as are of the right stamp, and whose influence over you will be good. This Polonius-like voice would drone on for decades. When his father moved the family to Boston, Pierpont enrolled in the English high school there, from which he graduated in 1854. While there, he suffered a severe bout of inflammatory rheumatism, and in 1852 spent several months recuperating in the Azores, the illness left one leg shorter than the other. For the rest of his life, assorted ailments would confine Pierpont to bed several days each month. He was a curious study in contrasts, sometimes sickly, sometimes capable of great bursts of energy that would exhaust him and send him back to bed. Early on, Pierpont figured in his father's business plans. Junius knew that the houses of Baring and Rothschild operated largely as family enterprises, grooming sons to inherit their respective businesses. In fact, the Rothschild insignia of five arrows commemorated five sons dispatched to five European capitals. The British economist and journalist Walter Badgett noted, The banker's calling is hereditary. The credit of the bank descends from father to son. This inherited wealth brings inherited refinement. Since merchant bankers financed foreign trade, their bills had to be honored on site in distant places, so their names had to inspire instant trust. As a twentieth-century Hambro's bank chairman would put it, our job is to breed wisely. The family structure also guaranteed the preservation of the bank's capital. Besides his three sisters, Sari, Mary, and Juliet, Pierpont had a younger brother, Junius Jr., fondly nicknamed the Doctor, who died in 1858 at age twelve. So it was on to Pierpont, the lone surviving male heir, that Junius Morgan projected his imperial ambitions, in preparation for which he provided him with a gentlemanly education. To allow him to attain fluency in foreign languages and to season him for global business, Junius in 1854 sent Pierpont to the Institute Silic, a boarding school on Lake Geneva. This was followed by a stint at the German University in Göttingen in 1856, where Pierpont enjoyed the bluff camaraderie of student clubs. He was a dashing, foppish boy, partial to polka-dot vests, bright cravats, and checkered pants. Already self-conscious about his skin eruptions, he shied away from the popular student duels that might disfigure his face. Throughout his life, Pierpont had little intellectual curiosity or aptitude for theorizing, and at Cottingen he excelled most at math. Beneath a rough, boyish swagger, he was sensitive to art. He also collected autographs of presidents and famous figures, and broken shards of stained glass found in cathedral closes. In later years, these fragments would be embedded in the windows of the West Room of his famous library. Junius Morgan feared his son's hot temper, and moaned to friends, I don't know what in the world I'm going to do with Pierpont. He said the boy needed restraining, and tried to inculcate a strong sense of responsibility. When Pierpont was twenty-one, Junius told him he was the only one the family could look to for counsel and direction, should I be taken from them. I wish to impress upon you the necessity of preparation for such responsibilities. Have them ever in view. Be ready to assume and fulfill them whenever they shall be laid upon you. Weighty Injunctions for a Young Man After Pierpont started work at Duncan Sherman during the panic year of 1857, he displayed awesome but unsettling precocity. 
While visiting New Orleans in 1859, he entered into a rash, unauthorized speculation. He gambled the firm's capital on a boatload of Brazilian coffee that had arrived in port without a buyer. He bought the entire shipment and resold it at a quick profit. This first proof of his supreme confidence petrified the gray men of Duncan Sherman. It was probably on the basis of this incident that the firm refused to make Pierpont a partner. In 1861, he struck off on his own, forming J.P. Morgan & Company at 54 Exchange Place with his cousin James J. Goodwin. At age 24, he was now New York agent for George Peabody & Company. This J.P. Morgan & Company would be short-lived. The name would be revived in 1895. A photo of Pierpont from this period shows he had lost his look of teenage frivolity. He was now burly and handsome, with handlebar mustache, full lips, and an intense gaze. Unlike his father's composed look, his already seemed restless. An important part of Pierpont's duties in New York was supplying his father with political and financial intelligence. Merchant banks required news about government financings, or the credit of client companies, and placed a premium on such information. The Rothschilds had a celebrated covey of carrier pigeons and courier boats at Folkestone. In a famous lament, Talleyrand sighed, The English ministry is always informed of everything by Rothschilds ten to twelve hours before Lord Stewart's dispatches arrive. Pierpont began drafting lengthy letters to his father, outlining political and economic conditions in America, and posting them on Nassau Street. He reserved Tuesday and Friday evenings for these reports. For thirty-three years, Junius not only digested them, but bound them, like sacred relics, and set them on his shelf. Whether less sentimental than Junius, or else aghast at their contents, Pierpont burned the collection in 1911, twenty-one years after his father's death. For these thirty-three years, Junius and Pierpont had an intense relationship, despite the geographical distance. They managed to spend an enormous amount of time together. In the fall of each year, Junius made an annual trip to the United States of up to three months, and in the spring, Pierpont made his ritual London pilgrimage. But their separation at other times of the year only heightened Junius's anxiety that he couldn't tame his son's wayward nature. He pumped the poor boy full of endless advice and was full of maxims. No aspect of Pierpont's life was too trivial to be overlooked. "'You are altogether too rapid in disposing of your meals,' he told him. "'You can have no health if you go on in this way.'" During the Civil War, Pierpont confirmed his father's fears concerning his rashness. Amid a mad rush of Wall Street profiteering, Pierpont financed a deal in 1861 that, if not unscrupulous, showed a decided lack of judgment. One Arthur M. Eastman purchased 5,000 obsolete Hall carbines, then stored at a government armory in New York, for $3.50 apiece. Pierpont loaned $20,000 to a Simon Stevens, who bought them for $11.50 each. By rifling these smooth-bore weapons, Stevens increased their range and accuracy. He resold them to Major General John C. Fremont, then commander of the Union forces in Missouri, for $22 each. Within a three-month period, the government had bought back its own, now altered, rifles at six times their original price. And it was all financed by J. Pierpont Morgan. The extent of Pierpont's culpability in the Hall Carbine affair has been endlessly debated. The unarguable point is that he saw the Civil War as an occasion for profit, not service, though he had an alternative role model in his grandfather, the Reverend Pierpont, who served as a chaplain for the Union Army when it was camped on the Potomac. Like other well-to-do young men, Pierpont paid a stand-in $300 to take his place when he was drafted after Gettysburg a common, if inequitable, practice that contributed to draft riots in July 1863. A future president, Grover Cleveland, also hired a stand-in, although he had a widowed mother to support. In later years, Pierpont would humorously refer to his proxy as the other Pierpont Morgan, and he subsidized the man. 
During the war, he also leapt into wild speculation in the infamous Gold Room at the corner of William Street and Exchange Place. Prices would gyrate with each new victory or defeat for the Union Army. Pierpont and an associate tried to rig the market by shipping out a large amount of gold on a steamer and earned $160,000 in the process. If Pierpont seemed corrupted by rowdy wartime Wall Street, he could also be unexpectedly tender-hearted. In 1861, the year of the Hall Carbine Affair, Pierpont, then 24 years old, had a quixotic love affair with Amelia Sturgis, a frail girl with oval face and hair parted down the middle, whom Pierpont had known for two years. Her father was a patron of the Hudson River School of Artists, and her mother was an excellent pianist. When Pierpont wed Mimi in the parlor of her family's East 14th Street townhouse, she already had a terminal case of tuberculosis. Pierpont had to carry Mimi downstairs and prop her up during the ceremony. Guests watched this vignette from a distance, through an open door. After the ceremony, Pierpont carried his bride to a waiting carriage. They had a touching, if bizarre, honeymoon, Pierpont toting Mimi around the warm Mediterranean ports and hoping to restore her health. When she died in Nice four months later, Pierpont was inconsolable, and his pious adoration for her never ceased. When he afterwards bought his first painting, it was of a young fay woman, and he hung it in an honored place over his mantle. The experience with Mimi may have taught Pierpont the wrong lessons, a fear of his best impulses, a need to stifle his deep-seated romanticism. Beneath their straight-laced exteriors, the Morgans would always be a sentimental clan, their public reserve often warring with powerful private emotions. Over fifty years later, Pierpont in his will bequeathed $100,000 to endow a rest home for consumptives called the Amelia Sturgis Morgan Memorial. Even his son Jack would regard the memory of Mimi as sacred and to be discussed only in hushed tones. Observing his son's reckless dealings and startling choice of a wife, Junius decided to take Pierpont's life in hand. Between Pierpont and Junius Morgan there would be total loyalty, but also a fierce contest of wills. In 1864, Junius orchestrated an alliance between Pierpont, then 27, and Charles H. Dabney, 30 years his elder, to form the new firm of Dabney Morgan & Company. Bolstered by capital from Junius, it would serve as his New York agent. He would retain final control over the credits it issued and the clients it selected. Dabney was expected to exert a steadying influence on Pierpont and for the next twenty-six years Junius kept a moderating father figure near his son. In his private life, too, Pierpont fell into line. In May 1865 he married Frances Louisa Tracy, Fanny as she was known, daughter of a successful lawyer, Charles Tracy, who later performed legal work for Pierpont. She was tall and pretty, with a rosebud mouth. She had a taste for elegant gloves and earrings, and seemed thoroughly safe and respectable. If Mimi was a temporary madness, Francis was a return to sanity. Yet it was Mimi whose memory Pierpont would cherish, while the practical marriage to Fanity would prove the fiasco, causing terrible pain to them both. Pierpont's unrequited romantic longings would only grow over the years, until they later found other, and notoriously varied, Outlets. The father-son team of Junius and Pierpont Morgan came on the world banking scene at a time of phenomenal expansion of banking power. We shall call it the Baronial Age. It coincided with the rise of railroads and heavy industry, new businesses requiring capital far beyond the resources of even the wealthiest individuals or families. Yet, despite these tremendous needs for capital, Financial markets were provincial and limited in scope. The banker allocated the economy's scarce credit. His imprimatur alone reassured investors that unknown companies were sound, there were no government agencies to regulate securities issues or prospectuses, and he became integral to their operation. Companies would come to be associated with their bankers. The New York Central Railroad, for instance, would later be called a Morgan Road. 
In this phase of the Industrial Revolution, companies were dynamic but extremely unstable. In an atmosphere of feverish growth, many businesses fell into the hands of unscrupulous promoters, charlatans, and stock manipulators. Even visionary entrepreneurs often lacked the managerial skills necessary to convert their inspirations into national industries, and no cadre of professional managers yet existed. Bankers had to vouch for securities, and often ended up running companies if they defaulted. As the baronial age progressed, the line between finance and commerce would blur until much of industry passed under the control of the bankers. With such leverage over companies, the leading bankers developed a superior style, behaving like barons to whom clients paid tribute. They operated according to a set of customs that we will call the Gentleman Banker's Code. The House of Morgan would not only transplant this code from London to New York, but would honor it until well into the 20th century. Under this code, banks did not try to scout out business or seek new clients, but waited for clients to arrive with proper introductions. They didn't open branch offices and refused to take on new companies unless the move was first cleared with their former banker. The idea was not to compete, at least not too openly. This meant no advertising, no price competition, and no rating of other firms' clients. Such an arrangement worked to the advantage of established banks and kept clients in an abject, dependent position. But it was a stylized competition, a world of sheathed rapiers, not a cartel, as it often seemed. The elegance of the surface often blinded critics to the vicious underlying relations among the banks. No less than to industry, bankers dictated terms to sovereign states, and countries, like companies, had their traditional bankers. Benjamin Disraeli wrote of the mighty loanmongers, on whose fiat the fate of kings and empires sometimes depended. Byron's witty couplet claimed there, Every loan seats a nation or upsets a throne. The bankers acquired such power because many governments in wartime lacked the sophisticated tax machinery to sustain the fighting. Merchant banks functioned as their ersatz treasury departments or central banks before economic management was established as a government responsibility. The London banks didn't lend their own funds, but would organize large-scale bond issues. Through conspiring closely with governments, they acquired a quasi-official aura. Josef Fexberg has referred to merchant banks operating in the twilight zone between politics and economics. This was turf the Morgans would later claim as their own. It was also very lucrative turf, for bankers to sovereign states might also handle their foreign exchange transactions and pay out dividends on their bonds. Every London house could unfurl a scroll of illustrious state loans. From their St. Swithin's Lane townhouse, the Rothschilds financed Wellington's Peninsular Campaign and the Crimean War. A familiar adage said that the wealth of the Rothschilds consisted of the bankruptcy of nations. In 1875, Lionel Rothschild would arrange the four million pound financing that permitted Britain to wrest control of the Suez Canal from France. Disraeli laughingly confided to Queen Victoria, I am of the opinion, madam, that there never can be too many Rothschilds. Besides bankrolling the Louisiana Purchase, Barings financed the French indemnity payment after Waterloo, prompting a lapidary tribute from the Duc de Richelieu. There are six great powers in Europe, England, France, Prussia, Austria, Russia, and Baring brothers. After the failure of Ireland's potato crop in 1845, the Peel government used Barings to buy American corn and Indian meal to relieve the famine, so-called Peel's brimstone. By the time of the Civil War, Barings was the agent bank for Russia, Norway, Austria, Chile, Argentina, Canada, Australia, and the United States. For their trouble, the grandees at Eight Bishops Gate were awarded with four peerages by the close of the 19th century, Ashburton, Northbrook, Revelstoke, and Cromer. Why this perfect mesh between merchant banks and statecraft? As private partnerships, 
These small banks were free of prying depositors or shareholders and could indulge their political biases. They didn't have to submit to outside examination, and their naturally discreet style made them ideal channels for diplomacy. Because they financed overseas trade, they were far more internationalist in outlook than the high street bankers who financed British industry and dealt largely with shopkeepers. The rarefied world of the Rothschilds and the Barings was the one Junius Morgan aspired to, a world hitherto barred to Americans. After Peabody's death, he needed some dazzling daring do with which to leap into the top ranks of Victorian finance. Only so much glory could be gained from trading Chinese tea or Peruvian guano or selling iron rails to Commodore Vanderbilt. Now in his late fifties, Junius had grown stout with wealth. He was an imposing six-foot figure with high forehead, beetling brow, and watchful eyes. As an early American patron of Savile Row's bespoke tailors, he dressed in suits conservatively tailored by pools. With Peabody gone, he urgently needed to replenish his capital base, which was still meager compared to the Rothschilds and the Barings. Yet he was extremely selective about the business he did, and had learned the need for caution. As he lectured Pierpont, never, under any circumstances, do an action which could be called in question, if known to the world. Junius's big chance for estate financing came in 1870, when the Prussians crushed French troops at Sedan in September, seized the Emperor, Napoleon III, and laid siege to Paris. After a republic was proclaimed, French officials retreated to Tours and set up a provisional government. Otto von Bismarck, the Prussian Chancellor, tried to isolate the French diplomatically. When they approached London for financing, he conducted a propaganda campaign, blustering that a victorious Germany would make France repudiate its debt. A rare opportunity opened up for an enterprising banker. This was one of the few times in the century that financially self-sufficient France needed to raise money abroad. Barings had floated Prussian loans and didn't wish to upset delicate relations by dealing with France. The Rothschilds dismissed the French cause as hopeless. The city had lately been rocked by defaults in Mexico and Venezuela, and nobody was in a particularly venturesome mood for foreign loans. Enter Junius, who decided to float a syndicated issue for France of ten million pounds, or fifty million dollars. The French hoped that by using an American banker, they might also be better positioned to purchase American arms. The French loan showed that he hid a riverboat gambler's flair behind the steely air. This would be Junius's signature deal, complete with that obligatory Rothschild touch, carrier pigeons. In backing France, he had to contend with Bismarck, who was privy to his moves. It later turned out that the private secretary of the French finance minister was a German spy and was feeding Bismarck daily reports on their dealings. Because Junius couldn't speak French and wouldn't take anything on faith, he brought over from France his son-in-law and later partner, Walter Hayes Burns, to act as translator. Junius insisted that every French document be accompanied by a certified translation. An innovation in European finance was then enhancing the banker's power. The syndicate, elite groups of banks that practiced what the French called haute banque. Instead of floating bond issues alone, the banks pooled their capital to share the risk of underwriting. Reflecting the extraordinary risks of the French loan, a Morgan-led syndicate offered the bonds at 85. This was 15 points below par, the value at which the bonds could later be redeemed. This sharp discount was designed to coax a skittish public into buying. The French felt blackmailed by these degrading terms, which they thought suitable for a Peru or Turkey. Yet Junius hadn't exaggerated the risks. After Paris fell in January 1871, followed by the Paris Commune, the bonds dropped from 80 to 55, and Junius desperately bought them to prop up the price, nearly wiping himself out. This was all very strange for a man who had urged caution on Pierpont. He was betting the future of his firm on one roll of the dice. Whatever the risks, it must have been a heady experience for an American to be swaggering like a Rothschild and playing with gigantic sums. The loan had its full complement of theatrics, 
A brief Morgan guarantee history still pulsates with the excitement of the episode. Some communications between Paris and London were implemented by the use of a fleet of carrier pigeons. Several of them, bearing capsules filled with text on tissue paper, actually completed their journeys. One particularly bulky package of documents was sent from Paris to London by balloon. Some pigeons were apparently shot down and gobbled up by starving Parisians. This left French politicians in the dark during critical moments in the bargaining. When the war ended, the defeated French didn't renege on the loan, as Bismarck predicted. Instead, they prepaid the bonds in 1873, bringing them up to par, or 100. As with Peabody and his Maryland bonds, Junius pocketed a fortune from this sudden windfall. The loan netted him a whopping 1.5 million pounds. This vastly augmented his firm's capital and propelled him into the upper ranks of government financing. Now, the name J.S. Morgan & Company would appear frequently in tombstone ads, apparently so-called because of their rectangular shape and placement on newspaper obituary pages, announcing underwriting syndicates. George Smalley said that with the 1870 French loan, his friend Junius went from being a successful man to a power in the city. His impressions of Junius at this moment are telling. On the one hand, he was modest and breezily dismissive about his triumph. He said he had researched the history of twelve French governments since 1789, and not one of these governments had ever repudiated or questioned the validity of any financial obligation contracted by any other. The continuing financial solidarity of France was unbroken. But Smalley wasn't fooled by such nonchalance. He noted, a fire in his eyes as he spoke, which showed he was not insensible to the triumph he had won. Why should he be? It was considered, and has ever since been considered, an event in the history of English finance. As Junius developed into the wealthiest American banker in London, he acquired the trappings of magnificence. He lived in a Knightsbridge mansion, 13 Prince's Gate, a five-story building of neoclassic design facing the south side of Hyde Park. The Morgan household was very dignified. Attended by butlers, the family dressed formally for dinner, which concluded with claret and Havana cigars. It was also a pious place, with Junius lining up the servants each morning for prayers. Following merchant banking tradition, Junius dabbled in art collection and often visited galleries with Pierpont when his son was in town. Junius's friends said his home resembled a museum, with 16th-century Spanish embroidery on the walls, silver-filled vaults, and an excellent collection of paintings by Reynolds, Romney, and Gainsborough. Seven miles away, in the London suburb of Roehampton, Junius purchased Dover House, a 92-acre estate with rolling lawns that swept down to the Thames. It was a miniature kingdom. Its dairy flowed with fresh milk and cream. Its hothouses yielded blooms, gardeners tended strawberry beds, and children played on playground swings. Dover House was rustic in a formal way, with well-spaced trees and trimmed lawns. In a photograph from 1876, Junius is playing tennis dressed in bowler hat and a three-piece suit and is clutching his racket like a club. He looks incongruous in a recreational setting. Periodically, he performed his patrician duty and shot pheasants on a moor. Junius, tall, sociable, self-confident, and his wife, Juliet Pierpont Morgan, made an odd pair. She was a short, plain, buxom woman who grew increasingly sickly and hypochondriacal. Often homesick, she frequently sailed to New York to stay with Pierpont. While her husband blossomed into one of London's magnificos and was blessed with robust health, Juliet became more feeble and withdrawn. In her later years, she was an invalid often closeted in an upstairs bedroom. She seems to have suffered some form of premature senility. This pattern of the sickly wife and the autocratic, headstrong husband would be repeated in the life of their son Pierpont. It also set a pattern of private grief and loneliness that would come to haunt the spectacularly successful Morgan family. Chapter 3 Prince as Junius Morgan's Wall Street agent for thirty years, 
Pierpont moved with the massed power of British capital behind him. A Wall Street jest said that his yacht, the Corsair, flew the Jolly Roger above the Stars and Stripes, and the Union Jack above both. Throughout his life, Pierpont would slyly hint at dissent from the pirate Henry Morgan. The young Morgan resembled a burly roughneck with a coat of British polish. Broad-shouldered and barrel-chested, he had dark hair and a pugilist's hands. Over six feet tall, he was something of a dandy, now given to checkered vests. Where Junius had a hard and impenetrable stare, Pierpont's hazel eyes were sad and cloudy. Where his father had unfailing composure, Pierpont was mercurial. In early pictures he looks edgy, as if spoiling for a fight. There was plenty to fight about in the rough-and-tumble of the post-war railroad boom. Everybody had a sense of immense enterprise ahead. We are going some day to show ourselves to be the richest country in the world in natural resources, Pierpont predicted during the Civil War. The railroads would unlock the resources in the American wilderness. Perhaps no business has ever blossomed so spectacularly. Within eight years of the war's end, railroad trackage doubled to 70,000 miles, a spree fed by tens of millions of acres in federal land grants. More than just isolated businesses, railroads were the scaffolding on which new worlds would be built. As Anthony Trollope noted during an American visit, railroads were in fact companies combined for the purchase of land, whose value they hoped to increase by opening a road. Towns sprang up along the tracks, settled by European immigrants imported by the railroads. As speculation and rail shares grew frenzied, European investors were stumbling about in the dark. Between Kansas and the Rocky Mountains, schoolboy maps showed a blank space, dubbed the Great American Desert. Europeans relied on their American agents to guide them through this financial wilderness and American bankers had to keep posted on developments. Soon after completion of the first transcontinental railroad in May 1869, Pierpont and Fanny Morgan made an extended rail journey across the country, stopping to see Mormon leader Brigham Young in Utah. A competition was already underway on Wall Street between Jewish bankers, such as Joseph Seligman, who wooed German investors with railroad shares, and Yankee bankers, such as Pierpont Morgan, who drew on London money. From the outset, railways were in a chaotic state, as they covered the country in a crazy quilt expansion that frequently produced more roads than traffic. Because of their exorbitant fixed costs, they should have been public utilities, but this was impossible in an age of freebooting individualism. As a result, assorted hucksters and rogues threw up twice the trackage actually needed. What appeared to be solid investment one moment was revealed as so much watered stock the next. In Henry Adams's judgment, the generation between 1865 and 1895 was already mortgaged to the railways, and no one knew it better than the generation itself. Such anarchy could easily fire a moralistic young banker like Pierpont Morgan. In his early years, he was exposed to many incorrigible Wall Street rascals, including Daniel Drew, the rustic sharpster who sold Erie stock short while sitting on the railroad's own board, he was called the speculative director, and Jay Gould, the small, swarthy, full-bearded financier who prodigally bribed legislators as he vied for control of the Erie and other railroads. This was the infamous era of the Tweed Ring, Jay Gould's 1869 attempt to corner the gold market, and other acts of larceny on a scale never before imagined. While Junius inhabited the white-glove world of the city, Pierpont had to deal with Wall Street's squalor, and found it alternately seductive and repellent. Confronted by corruption, he saw himself as a proxy for honorable European and American investors a tool of transcendent purpose, representing the sound men on Wall Street and in the city. But what he saw as a moral crusade, others might regard simply as competing self-interest. In his early years, at least, he wasn't always clearly distinguishable from the robber barons he was supposedly contesting. In 1869, Pierpont, 
aged 32, was enlisted in a dispute over a small upstate New York railroad that would establish his reputation as a self-assured young banker, unafraid to dirty his hands. This corporate fight would dramatize the transition of the American banker from a passive figure, issuing shares for companies, to a strong, active force in managing their affairs. The line in question, the 143-mile Albany and Susquehanna, was small and inconsequential. It had only 17 locomotives and 214 cars, and ran through the sparsely populated Catskill Mountains between Albany and Binghamton, New York. Yet it became a battleground for competing powers when Jay Gould decided it could advance the fortunes of his Erie Railroad, the so-called Scarlet Woman of Wall Street. Through this road, Gould helped to sell Pennsylvania coal to New England and also vie with the New York Central for freight from the Great Lakes. To this end, Gould bought up a block of A&S stock, made an alliance with the dissident wing of directors, and had his pet judge, George C. Barnard, suspend the railroad's founder, Joseph H. Ramsey, from the board. Ramsey countered by having several Gould partisans judicially suspended in turn. In these early days, corporate warfare was no mere euphemism, and the Ramsey and Gould forces sometimes slugged it out directly rather than filing suits and obtaining injunctions. In the Battle of the Susquehanna, Jim Fisk, a former circus roustabout and Gould's chief lieutenant, and his Bowery boys, thugs scraped off New York's streets and operating as Gould's stooges, piled onto a train heading east from Binghamton, their army numbering about 800 men. The Ramsey forces loaded about 450 fighters onto a train heading west from Albany. In a cinematic finale, the two trains crashed head-on at the long tunnel near Binghamton. Their headlights were smashed, one locomotive was partly derailed, and eight or ten people were shot before the Gould forces fled. Governor Toots Hoffman summoned the state militia to stop the bloodshed. On September 7, 1869, momentarily putting down their weapons, the Gould and Ramsey forces converged on the annual board meeting of the ANS. Ramsey, a little, gray-headed, sallow-faced gentleman, weighing about 115 pounds, with a very bright eye, had recruited the husky Pierpont, who had just returned from his western trip. Pierpont bought 600 shares of stock in the road for Dabney Morgan. Pierpont's son-in-law, Herbert L. Satterley, later claimed that at the September 7th meeting, Pierpont hurled chubby Jim Fisk down a flight of stairs. The story may be apocryphal. But the meeting was so tense that Ramsey, who had hidden the subscription books in an Albany cemetery, had the documents lowered into the room from a back window to keep them from the hands of the Gould forces. In the end, the meeting was stalemated by competing injunctions, with each side again claiming control of the road based on two separate elections. Under Pierpont's tutelage, the Ramsey forces found a friendly judge in the upstate town of Delhi, New York, who obligingly ousted the Erie Slate. Pierpont then advised the Ramsey forces, now back in control, to merge their railroad with the friendly Delaware and Hudson Line, which they accomplished in February 1870. In settling the dispute, Pierpont made a move that marked his subsequent financial maneuvers. He took payment, not simply in money, but in power becoming a director of the newly merged railroad. This first board seat was a sign of things to come, starting an era in which bankers sat on corporate boards and gradually came to rule them. Board membership would become a warning flag to other bankers to stay away from a captive company. During the 1870s, Pierpont began to style himself as far more than a mere provider of money to companies. He wanted to be their lawyer, high priest, and confidant. This wedding of certain companies to certain banks, relationship banking, would be a cardinal feature of private banking for the next century. It came about not because bankers were strong, but because companies were still weak. Pierpont's life was now prosperous and settled. He was making the gigantic salary of $75,000 a year. He and Fanny lived in a brownstone at 6 East 40th Street, just across Fifth Avenue from the Croton Reservoir, which arose like a vast Egyptian tomb on the site of today's New York Public Library. The Morgan home was comfortable and cluttered, 
furnished with rugs, heavy mahogany furniture, and gilt-framed pictures crowding one on top of the other. In 1872, Pierpont bought Cragston, a country retreat on the Hudson River near West Point. A three-story white Victorian house with rambling porches, its grounds comprised several hundred acres of spectacular river scenery and was Pierpont's answer to Junius's Dover house. There were horse stables, a dairy, tennis courts, and kennels for breeding collies. When the collies got boisterous, he switched to breeding blooded cattle. From April to October, Pierpont commuted to Wall Street, crossing the river on his steam launch, the Louisa, which seated about eight people. Then he took the train into Manhattan. The Morgans now had three children, Louisa, born in 1866, John Pierpont, Jr., or Jack, born in 1867, and Juliet, born in 1870. Before long, they would add another daughter, Anne. Behind the aura of comfort and precocity, Pierpont was a troubled young man. He continued to be bedeviled by headaches, fainting spells, and skin flare-ups. In 1871, his partner, Charles Dabney, retired, and their partnership was dissolved. Not for the last time, Pierpont contemplated retirement. As if unable to stop his own ambition, he would assume tremendous responsibility, then feel oppressed. He never seemed to take great pleasure in his accomplishments, and for the rest of his life he craved a restful but elusive peace. With Dabney retiring, Junius needed to find a partner for Pierpont. He also wanted to broaden the House of Morgan beyond its New York-London axis and strengthen its international securities business. Although we think of global finance as a modern invention, Victorian merchant banks were already multinational in structure and cosmopolitan in orientation. Instead of branch offices, they set up interlocking partnerships in foreign capitals, precisely what Junius now decided to do. In January 1871, he was approached in London by Anthony J. Drexel regarding an affiliation between his Philadelphia bank and the Morgans. Among the Philadelphia banks, Drexel's was second only to J. Cook's in government finance. Junius was already Drexel's London correspondent. As when George Peabody approached him, a financial fortune was being laid at Junius's feet. He was not only the ablest American banker of his day, he was also the luckiest. Son of Francis M. Drexel, an itinerant Austrian portrait painter turned financier, Tony Drexel at forty-five was slim and refined, with a smooth forehead, domed head, mild eyes, and handlebar mustache. At the time, Wall Street was shaping up as a provider as well as importer of capital, as financial power gravitated from Philadelphia and Boston to New York. Sensing this seismic shift, the influential Drexel wished to fortify his New York operations. As before, with Charles Dabney, Junius hoped to hedge the young Pierpont with safeguards and place him under the protective tutelage of an older man. So he suggested to Drexel that he take on Pierpont as his chief partner in New York. However prodigious Pierpont's gifts, he was still clay modeled by his father's hands. Junius urged him to respond to any invitation from Drexel. Hence, in May, he dutifully traveled to Philadelphia, dined with Drexel, and chatted with him after dinner. He returned to New York with a partnership agreement scribbled on an envelope. According to the deal, Pierpont would become a partner of Drexel & Company in Philadelphia and Drexel Hargis in Paris. He would also manage a New York partnership called Drexel Morgan & Company. The order of the names reflected the importance of the partners. Tony Drexel and his two brothers, Francis and Joseph, were worth about $7 million, while Pierpont had a puny $350,000. To even the score, however, Junius pumped in $5 million. Pierpont always acknowledged his debt to his father. He never pretended to be self-made, and later told New York Governor Grover Cleveland, if I have been able to succeed in the station of life in which I have been cast, I attribute it more than anything to the endorsement of my father's friends. The new Drexel Morgan was the forerunner of J.P. Morgan and Company. Before signing the deal, Pierpont laid down a curious condition, that he delay working on the new partnership. Far from itching to start, he felt a need to recuperate from emotional and physical travail. 
Apparently, he was on the edge of a nervous breakdown. Under doctor's orders, he took a fifteen-month vacation, traveling to Vienna and Rome, and sailing up the Nile. At work, Pierpont could never relax, and developed a powerful urge for escape. He would vacation three months each year, and joked that he could perform twelve months of work in just nine months. His son-in-law, Herbert Satterley, later wrote, He seemed to feel better when he was actually traveling than when they settled down anywhere. In the late 1870s, when Pierpont tried to flee work by taking a vacation in Saratoga, New York, a blizzard of business letters and telegrams trailed after him. There is only one way of getting real rest, he told Junius, and that is to get on board of a steamer. Two years after its debut, in 1873, Drexel Morgan moved to the corner of Wall and Broad Streets. It would be the most celebrated address in banking, the financial crossroads of America. Tony Drexel had bought a parcel of land across the street from the New York Stock Exchange for $349 a square foot, which stood as a record for the next thirty years. He built a heavily ribbed marble building with mansard roof, dormer windows, and ornate façade and allegorical figures above the doorway. The six-story building was one of the city's first with an elevator. Splendidly symbolic, its unusual catter-corner entrance simultaneously faced the sub-treasury building on Nassau Street, the most important branch of the U.S. Treasury system, and the stock exchange on Wall Street. Appropriately, Drexel Morgan would specialize in both railroad and government finance and occupy a pivotal place between Wall Street and Washington. From a personal standpoint, the Drexel Morgan match wasn't smooth. Pierpont was already gruff and difficult and insisted on having his own way. Joseph Seligman saw him as a rough, uncouth fellow, continually quarreling with Drexel in the office. But the merger worked just as Junius had planned, in terms of tempering Pierpont's successes. An early Dunn & Company report said, This young man is smart, and is perhaps the most venturesome member of the firm, but he is kept in check by the Drexels. The merger with the Drexels gave the Morgans new international breadth. In 1868, Drexel had sent John J. Hargis of Philadelphia to set up a Paris partnership, which performed with Elan during the Paris Commune, switching operations to Switzerland to service American travelers and businessmen. This wartime role would later be quintessentially Morgan's. As social butterflies who married into many prominent Philadelphia families, the Drexels also added a high society image to the Morgan Bank, and the Philadelphia House would always be a glamorous corner of the emerging empire. Through their interlocking partnerships, the Morgans now had footholds in New York, Philadelphia, London, and Paris. These would remain the brightest stars of the Morgan constellation for a century. Soon after the Drexel-Morgan merger came an event that catapulted Pierpont Morgan, age 36, into the Empyrean of American finance. In 1873, Washington decided to refund, at lower interest rates, the $300 million in bonded debt remaining from the Civil War. Until then, Jay Cook, Tony Drexel's main Philadelphia rival, reigned as the white-bearded emperor of federal finance. The self-made Cook had started out as a bank clerk with a quick eye for counterfeit money. At a time when government bonds were the exclusive province of rich men and European banks, he marketed them to the masses. During the Civil War, he pioneered in retail distribution, sending 2,500 Minuteman agents to peddle Union bonds across America and winning Lincoln's gratitude. With his riches, Cook built a 52-room castle outside Philadelphia. In the early 1870s, the phrase, rich as Jay Cook, had the same magic resonance as rich as Rockefeller would have in a later day. Cook seemed invincible to competitors at least until he financed the Northern Pacific Railroad in 1869. His promotion for $100 million in Northern Pacific bonds was liberally spiced with invention, fraudulence, and political bribery. To lure European settlers to towns serviced by the railroad, he created a tissue of brazenly surreal lies. Colorful ads depicted fruit groves flourishing along its Great Plains tracks 
fantastic claims that won the railroad the nickname of J. Cook's Banana Republic. Cow towns were puffed up into vast metropolises, and Duluth, Minnesota was trumpeted to European immigrants as the zenith city of the unsalted seas. When grain prices fell after the Franco-Prussian War, the fortunes of the Northern Pacific and other railroads fell along with them. Thus began J. Cook's undoing. His vulnerability in relation to the Northern Pacific would provide an opening for Drexel Morgan to usurp his exalted place in government finance. In 1873, Cook teamed up with two Jewish houses, Seligman's on Wall Street and the Rothschilds in Europe, to obtain the $300 million refunding issue against a vigorous challenge from Drexel Morgan, J.S. Morgan & Company, Morton Bliss, and Baring Brothers. Large-scale finance was increasingly shaping up as a contest between powerful syndicates. The sums and the risks were now too large for single houses to shoulder alone. The Drexel Morgan Group contested the Cook monopoly and also circulated insidious rumors that Cook needed victory in the refunding issue to recoup his Northern Pacific losses. Tony Drexel, a close friend of President Grant, proselytized through his partial ownership of the Philadelphia Public Ledger. Bowing to intense pressure from the Drexel Morgan Group, the Secretary of the Treasury awarded half of the issue to each syndicate, although the status-conscious Junius was disturbed by Cook's name preceding theirs on the contract. The prominence of American banks in this display of federal financing reflected the new post-war power of Wall Street. The year 1873 was one of panicky markets that allowed the Morgans to leave behind their reputation as relative outsiders and achieve a commanding position in federal finance. Financial markets were at first unsettled by the scandal of the Crédit Mobilier, builder of the Union Pacific Railroad, and exposed as a giant sinkhole of fraud and corruption. The scandal tarred the reputation of many congressmen holding the ephemeral company's stock. By August 1873, London investors wouldn't touch American bonds, one reporter said, even if signed by an angel of heaven. Then, debilitated by the Northern Pacific, the mighty house of J. Cook failed on Black Thursday, September 18, 1873. The failure ignited a full-blown Wall Street panic. For the first time since its formation, the New York Stock Exchange shut its doors for ten days. The corner outside the exchange became a wailing wall of ruined men. Diarist George Templeton Strong noted that the central focus of excitement was, of course, at the corner of Broad and Wall Streets. People were swarming on the Treasury steps, looking down on the seething mob that filled Broad Street. Pierpont called in his loans and cabled Junius, Affairs continue unprecedentedly bad. 5,000 commercial firms and 57 stock exchange firms were dragged down in Cook's maelstrom, a cataclysmic experience for a generation of Americans. To my parents and to the outside world, financial journalist Alexander Dana Noyes would later recall, the financial crash of September 1873 had been as memorable a landmark as, to the community of half a century later, was the Panic of October 1929. By today's standards, Wall Street looked almost pastoral. Trinity Church was the tallest structure, and street lamps on the cobblestone streets stood higher than many buildings. The six-story Drexel building soared above its neighbors. Yet after J. Cook's failure, it was popularly seen as the Street of Sin, a place responsible for corrupting the manners and morals of a pristine frontier nation. Not for the last time, America turned against Wall Street with puritanical outrage and a sense of offended innocence. Thomas Nast's cartoons in Harper's Weekly showed heaps of slaughtered animals in front of Trinity Church, the church itself scowling, with the words, Moral, I told you so, emblazoned on its steeple. Wall Street already had a way of being renounced once the party was over. In much the same way as the Morgan Bank would in 1929, Pierpont managed a handy profit in the panic year of 1873. He made over one million dollars, boasting to Junius, I don't believe there is another concern in the country that can begin to show such a result. 
With Jay Cook conveniently wiped off the map, Drexel Morgan stood, with miraculous suddenness, at the apex of American government finance. Never again would Pierpont Morgan be an outsider, and before long he would be the chief arbiter of the establishment. Drexel Morgan couldn't immediately capitalize on its fame, however, since the 1873 panic ushered in a period of extended deflation and depression, during which it became hard to credit Junius's injunction to remember one thing always, always be a bull on America. The House of Morgan's future approach to business was shaped in the gloomy days of 1873. The panic was a disaster for European investors, who lost $600 million in American railroad stocks. Stung by all the railroad bankruptcies, Pierpont decided to limit his future dealings to elite companies. He became the sort of tycoon who hated risk and wanted only sure things. I have come to the conclusion that neither my firm nor myself will have anything to do hereafter, directly or indirectly, with the negotiation of securities of any undertaking not entirely completed, and whose status, by experience, would not prove it entitled to a credit in every respect unassailable. Another time, he said, The kind of bonds which I want to be connected with are those which can be recommended without a shadow of doubt, and without the least subsequent anxiety as to payment of interest as it matures. This encapsulated future Morgan strategy, dealing only with the strongest companies and shying away from speculative ventures. Under the Gentleman Bankers Code, bankers held themselves responsible for bonds they sold, and felt obligated to intervene when things went awry. And the railroads were going awry. Even before the 1873 panic, a new way of dealing with railroad rascality had appeared, devised, improbably, by Jay Gould. When investors boycotted an Erie bond issue in 1871, he proposed to bring in outside coal, railway, and banking interests to run the railroad as voting trustees who would control a majority of Erie stock. To placate the conservative side of Wall Street in the city, he proposed Junius Morgan as one trustee. The plan was stillborn, but later was revived. By mid-decade, Junius was warning the president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad that rate wars among railroads were undermining investors' confidence. The following year, when the Erie went bankrupt, the irate bondholders shackled the road with a voting trust that would run the operation. It was a pivotal moment, the revenge of the creditors against the debtors, the bankers against the railway men. Later, in Pierpont's hands, the simple device of the voting trust would convert Morgan into America's most powerful man, placing much of the country's railway system under his personal control. Through such trusts, he would convert financiers from servants to masters of their clients. The story of Pierpont Morgan is that of a young moralist turned despot, one who believed implicitly in the correctness of his views. Strong-willed and opinionated, he had an unshakable faith in his own impulses, a quality that later made him appear as a force of nature, a child of the zeitgeist, making snap decisions that were often eerily right. He differed from most of the Gilded Age robber barons in that their rapacity stemmed from pure greed or lust for power, while his included some strange admixture of idealism. As he confronted an economy that offended his sense of business propriety, his very conservatism gave him a revolutionary zeal. He believed, quite arrogantly, that he knew how the economy should be ordered and how people should behave. By no coincidence, he was active in the Young Men's Christian Association, which discouraged gambling among the working class. He also sponsored revival meetings at Madison Square Garden and backed the moral policeman Anthony Comstock, who favored the covering up of nude statues. Pierpont developed a reputation for snappishness and barking at people, a propensity that grew with his fame. Even in letters to his father as early as the 1870s, he seemed committed to his own way of doing things, and wrote less as a servile son than as a highly confident business partner. In 1881, a report by R. G. Dunn & Company referred to Pierpont's peculiar brusqueness of manner, and said it had 
made him and his house unpopular with many. He sat behind a glass partition in the mahogany partner's room at 23 Wall Street, chewing on a big cigar and growling out yes or no when given offers on foreign exchange. He wouldn't haggle and presented his bids for foreign exchange on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. He had a way of letting people cool their heels and knew all the silent tricks of authority. With his clear-cut sense of right and wrong, he quickly became accustomed to exercising leadership. Not surprisingly, he had trouble delegating authority and low regard for the intelligence of other people. He agonized over finding new partners, and people never measured up to his inflated standards. To find suitable candidates in 1875, he pored over business directories from New York, Philadelphia, and Boston in vain. The longer I live, the more apparent becomes the absence of brains, particularly soundly balanced brains, he told Junius. Once again, Pierpont flirted with the notion of quitting banking and casting off the oppressive weight of business. In 1876, when Joseph Drexel left the firm, Pierpont wanted to follow him, but he held back, awaiting word of Junius's plans. He was chained to his bank by a sense of mission that never abandoned him. Perhaps never in financial history has anybody else amassed so much power so reluctantly. J. Pierpont Morgan was more exhausted than exhilarated by success. He didn't enjoy responsibility and never learned to cope with it. Pierpont was a natural leader on Wall Street. Whatever the general public might think of the Morgans, businessmen respected them for their honest dealings. August Belmont Sr. thought Pierpont brusque but fair. Andrew Carnegie, who raised the money for his first rolling mill by brokering bonds to Junius, told the story of how during the 1873 panic the Morgans sold his interest in a railroad for $10,000. He already had $50,000 on deposit with Pierpont, and when he showed up to claim his $60,000, Pierpont handed him $70,000 instead. Pierpont said that they had underestimated his account, and insisted he accept the additional $10,000. Carnegie didn't want to take the money. "'Will you please accept these ten thousand with my best wishes?' Carnegie asked him. "'No, thank you,' Pierpont replied. "'I cannot do it.' Carnegie decided that in future he would never harm the Morgans. Interestingly, Carnegie venerated Junius as the model of the sound, old-fashioned banker, but there was always friction between him and Pierpont. After one 1876 meeting with Carnegie, Pierpont bluntly chastised him, "'You used language very offensive in its character,' and proceeded to rebut Carnegie's statements about his firm's role in a lawsuit. The standing of Drexel Morgan rose steadily through the 1870s. In 1877, a congressional dispute held up payment due the army of General Miles, then fighting the Nespers Indians out west. In a flamboyant gesture, Drexel Morgan volunteered to cash the Army's pay vouchers for a 1% commission, which made Pierpont very popular with the soldiers. By 1879, the ascendant Morgans were joining with August Belmont and the Rothschilds to market the last Civil War refunding loan. The United States resumed specie payment that year, that is, government notes were payable in silver or gold, and the issue was a great success. Far from being thrilled by this new parity with the Rothschilds, Pierpont was offended by the supposed high-handedness of his partners. The more conciliatory Junius insisted that the Rothschilds share in any syndicate, but Pierpont's enormous ego brooked no condescension. As he wrote his brother-in-law, Walter Burns, now Junius's partner in London, I need scarcely tell you that having anything to do with Rothschilds and Belmont in this matter is extremely unpalatable to us, and I would give almost anything if they were out. The whole treatment of Rothschilds to all the party, from father downward, is such as, to my mind, no one should stand. In fact, the Rothschilds had badly miscalculated America's importance to the future of world finance, and it would prove an irremediable blunder. Their representative, August Belmont, bemoaned their utter want of appreciation of the importance of American business. Now the Morgan Star was on the rise, and within a generation, 
it would outshine that of both the Rothschilds and the Barings. The financial writer John Moody said that until 1879, Pierpont Morgan was merely the son of his grim-mouthed father. Junius, all business, found it hard to give up his all-consuming work. Now portly, like an East Indian merchant prince in an old English play, he appears slightly bent in photographs, sedentary, heavy with care, gazing from beneath shaggy eyebrows. The airy elegance of youth has settled into a craggy look of suspicion. In 1873, when he reached sixty, Pierpont was already urging him to cut back his schedule. He wrote, "'It occurs to me to suggest that you need rest as much as I do, and I do not quite see why you cannot also take two days away from office per week.'" Junius wasn't as rigidly attached to the office as Peabody, but he was domineering, and at times had only one partner. The elder Morgan now began to reap the honors of a semi-retirement. On November 8, 1877, he enjoyed a last hurrah in his native country, with a New York dinner at Delmonico's in his honor, sponsored by the city's business community. This impressive gathering of more than a hundred people numbered John Jacob Astor and the elder Theodore Roosevelt among its dignitaries. Breaking a self-imposed ban on public appearances, Samuel J. Tilden, a former governor of New York and just defeated presidential candidate, presided. Toasting Junius as America's preeminent banker in London, Tilden lauded Junius for upholding unsullied the honor of America in the tabernacle of the old world. As in Peabody's day, American businessmen believed they had to prove their worth in London. In reply, Junius said his lifelong crusade was that no evil should be spoken of America. Nobody in those days talked of British obligations or of nascent American power, only of how Americans should please British creditors. Under Pierpont, the financial position of the two countries would be strikingly reversed. Pierpont's relationship with his father was the most important in his life. Junius was the sort of punishing father who built character by stinting on praise and setting exacting standards, keeping up psychic pressure, and always making Pierpont prove himself. Tough and demanding, he produced a son who lashed himself into ever greater exertion only to lapse into sickness, fatigue, or depression. Junius strengthened those already relentless impulses in Pierpont's nature, his overmastering need to achieve, his inordinate sense of responsibility, his hatred of disorder. Yet the patriarchal Morgan clan permitted no rebellion, only veneration of father. Whatever fear and resentment Pierpont felt were transmuted into exaggerated love, and such filial worship would be equally apparent in Pierpont's own children and grandchildren. Under his sometimes stern façade, Junius clearly adored Pierpont. The obsessive grooming was a tacit acknowledgment of his son's gifts. In 1876, he decided to buy Pierpont a princely gift, Gainsborough's portrait of the Duchess of Devonshire, possibly the world's most popular painting at the time. The Rothschilds had already bid for it, and Junius was prepared to top them by paying Agnews of Bond Street $50,000. Before the sale was consummated, however, the painting was stolen from Agnews. Even a £1,000 reward couldn't coax it back. Interestingly, when the painting resurfaced in 1901, Pierpont rushed to buy it for £30,000, or $150,000. If the truth came out, he conceded regarding the staggering price, I might be considered a candidate for the lunatic asylum. It was a deeply sentimental homage to his father. At 13 Prince's Gate, the London townhouse he inherited from Junius, he hung the painting in the cherished spot over the mantelpiece. In 1879, Pierpont began to emerge from his father's shadow and take charge of major deals. He was picked to market the largest block of stock ever publicly offered, 250,000 shares of New York Central. It was a landmark event for the Vanderbilts, who owned the railroad. Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt had died two years before, at 83, leaving a fortune of about $100 million. Though he rejected champagne as too expensive in his last days, he probably ranked as America's richest man. 
Crude and tobacco-chewing, a white-haired, red-cheeked rogue, he chased pretty maids to the end. In his dotage, he fell under the influence of spiritualists and held business talks with the late Jim Fisk, the tough whom Pierpont bested over the Albany and Susquehanna, later killed by a rival suitor to his mistress. Commodore Vanderbilt's death was a pivotal moment in the shift of business from family to public ownership, a transition rich in possibilities for Pierpont Morgan. To keep his railroad empire intact, the Commodore bequeathed to his oldest son, William Henry, 87% of New York Central stock. William was a homely, torpid, thick-set man, then in his late fifties, whom the Commodore had thought a dunce, berated freely, and exiled to a rude farm on Staten Island. William certainly wasn't groomed to manage the New York Central, which the rough-hewn Commodore ran from a cigar-box full of records. The Commodore had merged eleven small railroads to form the 4,500-mile New York Central. It branched north from New York City to Albany and then swept west to the Great Lakes, opening the interior to eastern ports. That such power would pass to William Vanderbilt appalled many people. As William Gladstone wrote the Vanderbilt's lawyer, Chauncey M. Depew, I understand you have a man in your country who is worth one hundred million dollars, and it is all in property which he can convert at will into cash. The government ought to take it away from him, as it is too dangerous a power for any one man to have. William didn't help to reassure the public and talked his way into the history books with his retort, The public be damned! I am working for my stockholders. The scope of Vanderbilt wealth spread fear and led to new calls for public accountability. What finally induced William Henry to reduce his New York central stake was publicity generated by New York State Assembly hearings in 1879, chaired by A. Barton Hepburn. This investigating committee exposed secret deals made by the New York Central, which gave preferential rates to oil refiners. As the railroad's chief executive and star witness, William Henry seemed ignorant or evasive about the clandestine maneuvering. To counter bad publicity, he approached Morgan, probably steered to him by Chauncey Depew. New York State was beginning to levy punitive taxes against the New York Central, and it was hoped that by having William Henry sell a huge chunk of stock, thus making him a minority share owner, the state legislature might relent. That Vanderbilt chose the 42-year-old Pierpont to carry out this delicate operation probably stemmed from the House of Morgan's Anglo-American structure. The principal concern was how to liquidate up to 250,000 shares without collapsing the stock's price. The Morgan-led syndicate demanded that the Vanderbilts refrain from further sales for a year or until all syndicate shares were placed. Another technique to mask the high-volume sale was to sell shares abroad, and J.S. Morgan & Company took an initial 50,000-share block. Junius could act with a discretion impossible on Wall Street. But it was no easy sales job. British investors were still getting mauled by American railroads, and dozens more foundered that year. The world economy was still depressed, with a deep slump in foreign lending. And in the largely unregulated baronial age, stock prospectuses were comically skimpy. The New York Central Prospectus, for instance, was grandly evasive. The credit and status of the company are so well known that it is scarcely necessary to make any public statement. With so little information about a company, the reputation of the sponsoring bank was critically important. The New York Central deal had an unstated agenda. The syndicate allotted 20,000 shares to Jay Gould, 15,000 to Russell Sage, and 10,000 to Cyrus Field. The inclusion of the odious Gould was part of a truce between Vanderbilt's New York Central and Gould's Wabash, which had been feuding. At first, Vanderbilt wasn't thrilled about this, but Gould effectively blackmailed his way into the syndicate by threatening to deprive the New York Central of Wabash traffic. Gould also felt this association with the Morgans might cloak him in a new respectability and perhaps entitle him to better credit in the future. When Pierpont announced that he had mysteriously sold the huge block of New York Central shares, much of it abroad, the financial world gaped with wonder. 
the commission was a colossal three million dollars. As he had during the feud over the Albany and Susquehanna, Pierpont demanded a seat on the railroad's board of directors. As Junius told a partner, Pierpont was to represent the London interest. That is, he would vote their proxies. Having long chafed at American railroad brigands, even organizing a $300,000 defense committee to protect their stake in Gould's Scarlet Woman, European investors now exacted their revenge. They were tired of railroad shenanigans, bankruptcy, skipped dividends, poor management. So Pierpont Morgan would be their blunt instrument with which to bludgeon American railroads into responsible behavior. He had just the right clubman's pedigree to inspire their trust. Once he chastised a railroad president by exclaiming, Your roads! Your roads belong to my clients! Because railroads required constant capital and exhausted the resources of loan entrepreneurs, they were ripe for such banker domination. As intended, the sale of William Vanderbilt's stock dispersed ownership, and New York State slackened its assault against the road. But what the legislators didn't reckon on was that Pierpont would take those scattered shares and effectively recreate their combined power in himself. He began placing his golden manacles on the road. Besides voting all the London proxies, he insisted that the New York Central maintain its eight-dollar dividend for five years, with the House of Morgan acting as fiscal agent to disperse those dividends in New York and London. Before long, the New York Central would be a Morgan Road, and the company whose shares were recommended most frequently by the Morgan family. In standing up foursquare for British creditors, Pierpont took the risky step of identifying himself with a foreign power, creating confusion in the popular mind as to his political loyalties. From this time on, he would often be criticized as a mere appendage of London bankers, a sort of colonial administrator, a representative in America of the financial might of Britain. This ambiguity regarding the bank's Anglo-American character would not only foster considerable paranoia in the American heartland, but would also create an identity crisis within the Morgan Empire itself. In the meantime, while Wall Street buzzed over the New York Central affair, Pierpont seemed to derive little joy from it. Far from puffing up with pride, he sounded frazzled and dispirited. Yet again he contemplated giving up business. An 1880 letter to his cousin Jim Goodwin shows how explicitly he began to view himself as an instrument of larger purpose, the representative of masses of investors. He wrote in part, I am pressed beyond measure. I never have had such a winter, and although my health has been better than I have had for many winters, still, so far as time is concerned, I have had no leisure whatever. If it were simply my own affairs that were concerned, I would very soon settle the question and give it up, but with the large interests of others on my shoulders it cannot be done, and I do not suppose there is any reason why it should, except that I often think it would be very desirable if I could have more time for outside matters." Several commentators have noted Pierpont's savior complex, as seen in his private life by his marriage to the tubercular Mimi, and in his business life by his crusades for the London interests. In his own mind, he often acted to benefit others, not simply for self-aggrandizement. This pronounced sense of martyrdom made him extremely sensitive to criticism and also shielded him from true self-knowledge. In more extreme moments, it could invite megalomania. It was too easy to camouflage selfish impulses by invoking a higher cause as the real cause. At the same time, he wasn't motivated by purely selfish motives, and had larger concerns than most bankers of his day. In future years, Morgan partisans would praise the bank's high ethical standards and reputation for fairness, while critics would see the self-congratulatory rhetoric as sanctimonious and hypocritical. And both sides would prove right. Chapter 4 Corsair In 1882, Pierpont was making half a million dollars a year, and the power balance within the Morgan Empire began to tip from London to New York. To mark their new financial status, 
Pierpont and Fanny sold their high-stooped house on East 40th Street and bought a brownstone formerly owned by Isaac N. Phelps, of Phelps Dodge Copper fame, at 219 Madison Avenue at the northeast corner of 36th Street, still in Manhattan's Murray Hill neighborhood. In this less crowded New York, the East River was still visible from the house. At a time of sybaritic indulgence, when businessmen wallowed in luxury and showy greed was all the rage, the Morgan home was imposing but unadorned. Its entryway was flanked by ionic columns and a bay window overlooked Madison Avenue. Heavy wood furniture and bric-a-brac filled the rooms. In his high-ceilinged library, paneled in Santa Domingan mahogany, Pierpont set his massive desk. It stood in the middle of the room, as if the library were the partner's room of a merchant bank. This library was a place of such forbidding gloom that the staff of twelve servants called it the Black Library. A novel feature of the Morgan household was electricity. It was New York's first electrically lighted private residence. Pierpont's interest in the newly harnessed source of energy stemmed from a business deal. In 1878, Thomas Alba Edison had secured capital from the Morgan Partners and other financiers to establish the Edison Electric Illuminating Company. Unfortunately, the infernal racket of the electrical generator was the bane of the Morgan's neighbors. Downtown, Drexel Morgan hosted early meetings of the Edison Company and in 1882 became the first Wall Street office to draw electricity from Edison's generating station at Pearl Street. Edison himself, in a Prince Albert coat, attended the debut of electric power at 23 Wall Street, and he kept his personal account at the bank. The decision to stay in Murray Hill said much about the Morgans, who scorned the nouveau riche. When they opted for that neighborhood, the quality were already moving uptown. Along Fifth Avenue, exhibitionist moguls built gaudy palaces, their styles plundered from European chateaus. From 51st to 52nd Streets, in elephantine splendor, rose William Henry Vanderbilt's mansion. Between 57th and 58th Streets, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, son of William Henry, built another palace on the present site of Bergdorf Goodman. Matthew Josephson has offered an unforgettable portrait of Gilded Age vulgarity. At Delmonico's, the silver, gold, and diamond dinners of the socially prominent succeeded each other unfailingly. At one, each lady present, opening her napkin, found a gold bracelet with the monogram of the host. At another, cigarettes rolled in hundred-dollar bills were passed around after coffee and consumed with an authentic thrill. One man gave a dinner to his dog and presented him with a diamond collar worth $15,000. At another dinner, costing $20,000, each guest discovered in one of his oysters a magnificent black pearl. Another distracted individual longing for diversion had little holes bored into his teeth, into which a tooth expert inserted twin rows of diamonds. When he walked abroad, his smile flashed and sparkled in the sunlight. A cross between Connecticut Yankees and London aristocrats, the Morgans shrank from extravagance and shielded their lives from the newspapers. Like European haute banque families, the Morgans were very private. Pierpont was fanatic about his privacy and created an enduring image of a top-hatted tycoon snarling and brandishing a stick at photographers. He belonged to nineteen private clubs most of the sort restricted to Anglo-Saxon Christian men, and liked to mingle with old money. Unlike most members, he preferred building clubs to using them. When some friends were blackballed from the Union Club, he had Stanford White design the Metropolitan Club, which acquired the tag of the Millionaires Club. Morgan was the first president. He was never a champion of social justice or equality. When Theodore Seligman, son of one of New York's most prominent Jewish bankers, was blackballed from the Union League Club in 1893, Pierpont didn't protest the exclusion. For Pierpont, a gentleman wasn't a rich man, but a member of a social caste. He is associated with two statements about yachting that sum up his philosophy. The first is that, You can do business with anyone, but you can only sail a boat with a gentleman and the second, perhaps apocryphal, that anyone who asked about the cost of maintaining a yacht shouldn't buy one. 
He had no time for bounders or upstarts, and despised the rich, idle young men about town who pursued women in clubs and cafes. The Morgans would always be strong believers in the work ethic and the duties of the rich. They shunned the snobbish version of high society embodied by Mrs. Astor and Ward McAllister's Four Hundred, supposedly the creme de la creme of New York society. In bluff, manly style, Pierpont would have thought their balls prissy or vulgar. A stuffed shirt, Pierpont liked to play chess or whist in the company of older, settled men. He believed in convention, and always wore social uniforms suitable to the occasion, a bowler in winter, a Panama hat in summer, for instance. Even when he toured Egypt in 1877, he wore knickerbockers, watch-chain, and pith-helmet, the approved dress for the imperial tourist. Physically and intellectually, Morgan reproduced the traditional old-time London banker, said Alexander Dana Noyes. At the office, sitting at his roll-top desk, he wore stiff-winged collars, ascots, and heavily starched shirts, trademarks of the serious banker. Only on sweltering days would he peel off his coat in the club-like atmosphere. Like his father, he called himself a merchant, and his firm a counting house. The early 1880s saw Pierpont's metamorphosis from a dashing, muscular young man into the portly tycoon with fierce visage and blown-up nose. Now in his forties he had graying hair and eyebrows, and still sported a handlebar mustache. The acne rosacea that had troubled him since adolescence took root in his nose, enlarging and inflaming it until it became Wall Street's most talked-about protuberance. Over the years, it would take on a cauliflower texture. Many people would notice a link between the nose and Pierpont's fiery temper. The nose certainly contributed to an insecurity and lack of social ease that were thinly masked by a barking voice and tyrannical manner. The blustery tone warned the world not to stare at the face. The nose must have been a terrible handicap for a shy, self-conscious man with a tremendous need for female admiration. The body swelled with the face. In the 1880s, a generation of Wall Street bankers was doomed by the wisdom of one William Everts, who credited his longevity to never under any circumstances having taken exercise. Pierpont usually played cards at a club after work, rather than join in a game of tennis. He occasionally lifted dumbbells, but in the late 1880s a medical sage advised him to stop exercise in every form. Never even walk when you can take a cab. Pierpont loyally followed doctor's orders, doing so while smoking Havana cigars so big and black that they were dubbed Hercules Clubs. A teetotaler by day, the Morgan Banks by tradition never served alcohol at lunch, he compensated for this abstinence at night, progressing from pre-dinner cocktails to sherry or claret with meals, and then to brandy or port afterward. More than husky, he began to develop the sleek girth that symbolized contemporary tycoons. Although a retiring person beneath his bossy manner, Pierpont maintained an acquaintance with an extensive number of people. As a merchant banker, he had to cultivate clients, and his business life was necessarily social. As a later Baring Brothers chairman remarked of the business, one of the facets of the art is that if you do not get on with the people you are trying to advise, then you find yourselves out the door. And Pierpont engaged in a constant whirl of dinners and civic functions. These social pressures took their toll on his marriage, which had already begun to turn into a cold, empty charade. Fanny Morgan was bashful and lacked all relish for the social duties incumbent upon a merchant banker's wife. Sad and anxious, sweet and pious, she preferred reading, gossiping with friends, talking about religion, and discussing social questions. She would be more popular with both their children and their grandchildren than would the dagger-eyed Pierpont. As his world grew larger, Fanny's spirit was either not large enough or not willing enough to fill that space with him. One also suspects that the couple clashed as a result of their very similarity— both were sensitive and high-strung, and too melancholic to provide much solace for the other. Fanny wasn't a tonic to Pierpont's habitual moodiness, and he was doubtless much too busy to attend to her needs, 
The practical marriage, the supposed antidote to the Mimi affair, turned out to be dangerously impractical. When Junius returned to London after his 1877 dinner, Pierpont followed. It was the first Christmas he spent away from his children. The next year, Fanny didn't join him for the annual spring trip abroad, and he thereafter developed the habit of traveling to Europe with one of his daughters, spending months apart from his wife each year. These trips combined business and pleasure, and provided cover for infidelity. As a high Victorian, he was proper and respectful toward Fanny in public, even as their separations lengthened. Over time, she would become morose and something of an invalid, pouring her heart out to her son Jack, among others. Pierpont wasn't the sort to suffer a loveless marriage lightly. As revealed by his love for Mimi, he was highly romantic. He made pilgrimages to Mimi's grave in Fairfield, Connecticut, traveling there on the anniversary of their wedding or of her death. His eyes cloudy and troubled, he had the soul of a voluptuary beneath a banker's custom-made suit. Even as he scared people away, he was a lonely man, carrying around a vast despair that he couldn't share with anyone. His unhappy marriage probably plunged him deeper into business, while also denying him the pleasure of his triumphs. Pierpont's connections in the realm of charity were almost as extensive as his business interests. He preferred to give to religious, cultural, and educational causes, not to social welfare agencies. He never tried to solve the problem of poverty. He wanted to build institutions that were private and elite. He was an original patron of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the American Museum of Natural History, had a box within the Metropolitan Opera's Golden Horseshoe, he liked romantic florid operas, especially Il Trovatore, and was a major contributor to St. Luke's Hospital. After Junius took in S. Endicott Peabody, a distant relative of George's, as a partner in London, Pierpont helped his son, the Reverend Endicott Peabody, to buy ninety acres north of Boston for a new prep school, Groton. Modeled after rugby, it was supposed to develop a good, manly, Christian character in its pupils. Ironically, it spawned that arch-enemy of the House of Morgan, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Through his friend and personal physician, Dr. James W. Marco, Pierpont gave one of his rare gifts to the immigrant masses then streaming into New York's Lower East Side. In 1893, Marco told him of an operation he had performed in a tenement kitchen to save an immigrant mother and her baby. Pierpont counted out $300 bills. See that she gets the proper care, he said, handing the money to the doctor. Eventually, Dr. Marco persuaded him to contribute over one million dollars to erect a new building for the New York Lying-In Hospital, where nurses would provide poor pregnant women with food, milk, and prenatal care. Dr. Marco became the director. As Pierpont became more of a philanderer, his concern for unwed mothers would be the subject of wisecracks about town, as well as stories of doctors at the hospital who married Pierpont's mistresses. But the institution that most absorbed Pierpont was the Episcopal Church, which was part of the Anglican Communion. Religion united his values, beauty, order, hierarchical relationships, veneration of the past, pageantry, and pomp. As New York's most influential Episcopal layman, he attended the Church's triennial conventions and participated in its abstruse debates. Religion logically accompanied the moralism that drove him at work, and lay at the bottom of his indignation at American business practices. His maternal grandfather was a preacher, his paternal grandfather a lusty hymn-singer, and his father's banking maxims were phrased in the epigrammatic style of sermons. Junius often sounded like a frustrated clergyman. Self-approbation, and a feeling that God approves, will bring a far greater happiness than all the wealth the world can give. And Pierpont himself was wont to pontificate at 23 Wall Street. For Pierpont and Fanny, Sundays were devoted to religion. They attended St. George's Church on Stuyvesant Square, where Pierpont had been a vestryman since 1868, and spent Sunday evenings singing hymns. To gratify Fanny, Pierpont also attended Wednesday evening sessions of the Mendelssohn Club, a choral group. In his early years, he had a strongly prudish streak. 
In general, his religious interests weren't tied to codes of earthly conduct. Religion moved him on a more primitive level. Whether roaring out hymns at revival meetings or sitting alone in St. George's, savoring organ music in semi-darkness, he seemed mesmerized by ritual and lapsed into reveries of mystic depth. Approaching scripture with the literalism of a fundamentalist, Pierpont was as credulous as a child. In 1882, he visited Palestine. Deeply moved, he wrote Fanny about the sensations he experienced before the doorway of Christ's sepulchre. There is the slab on which he was laid. Impelled by an impulse impossible to resist, you fall on your knees before that shrine. In later years, he told his librarian, Belle da Costa Green, that he believed every word in the Bible, including the account of Jonah and the whale. Once traveling down the Nile with Bishop William Lawrence, he pointed out the precise spot where Moses was plucked from the bulrushes, and insisted it happened exactly as set forth in the Bible. In view of this credulity, it is not surprising that Pierpont was fascinated by the occult. For years he commissioned the astrologer Evangeline Adams to read his horoscope, asking her to study his stars on everything from politics to the stock market. When his son Jack was born, the infant's horoscope showed a cardinal cross associated with depressions, an apt prophecy for the Morgan who steered the bank through 1929. In 1883, the 33-year-old Reverend William S. Rainsford took over as St. George's rector. He was a handsome young Irishman with a Cambridge education. Having bankrolled the church's activity, Pierpont had a hand in his appointment. As a social reformer and fiery exponent of the social gospel, Rainsford told Morgan he would take the job only if the church were democratic and open to the poor. Done, said Morgan who agreed to make up the church's deficits. And Rainsford indeed welcomed the poor into St. George's now free pews. Eventually the two men became so close that they had breakfast together every Monday morning at 219 Madison Avenue, and Morgan built several new church buildings. Dr. Rainsford later ran into trouble when he tried to enlarge and democratize the vestry which met in Morgan's Black Library. This went against the grain of Pierpont's arm's-length philanthropy, and he bluntly retorted, I do not want the vestry democratized. I want it to remain a body of gentlemen whom I can ask to meet me in my study, gentlemen who would feel at home, and who could make up deficits out of their pockets. He sent a letter to Rainsford, resigning his post as senior warden. The young rector stubbornly refused to accept it. For several weeks the two men continued their Monday breakfasts, both eating in silence. During these meals Pierpont may have recalled the rich men who hounded his reformer grandfather, the Reverend Pierpont. After several weeks of this standoff, Morgan invited Rainsford to see him set sail for Europe. Alone with Rainsford in his stateroom, Pierpont threw his arms around him and exclaimed, Rainsford, pray for me, pray for me. The feud ended with this melodramatic display of contrition. Rainsford has left interesting impressions of Pierpont's religious faith. His beliefs were to him precious heirlooms. He bowed before them as the Russian bows to the icon before he salutes the master of the house. He saw that for Pierpont the church wasn't an active, reforming spirit, but a repository of ancient beauty powerful because it was archaic and unchanging. Rainsford also credited Pierpont with intense loyalty and forthright honesty. When he said a thing, and looked full at you as he said it, to doubt him was impossible. It was the same look that transfixed two generations of railroad presidents and industrial moguls. Although the business life of Pierpont Morgan was bound up with the railroads, Pierpont felt more keenly the allure of the sea. At a time when private railroad cars were common showpieces among tycoons, Pierpont never owned one and took private cars as needed from the railroads he directed. By midlife, the sea was his best remedy for depression, the place where he escaped from the perpetual strain of the office and was liberated from care. When a yacht-owning fad swept fashionable New York in the 1880s, he needed little inducement to participate. In 1882, 
he bought the first of a series of enormous yachts, named Corsair, and joined the New York Yacht Club. This black-hulled steam yacht, 165 feet long and the second largest in the club's fleet, marked a new Morgan magnificence. It was probably no coincidence that Pierpont bought the Corsair soon after it first became apparent that his marriage was disintegrating. The boat was more than a showy bauble. It gave him a social setting beyond Fanny and the children, and would later figure in many stories of secret revelry. It permitted an outlaw life beyond the stuffy Victorian bounds of his early married days. He created a group of friends known as the Corsair Club, which provided the camouflage needed to smuggle women on board. The ship was also a second home, particularly when Fanny and the children retreated up the Hudson to Cragston for the summer. Often, Pierpont would dine on the ship and spend the night as it lay at anchor off Manhattan. Purchase of the Corsair coincided with a new phase in Pierpont's career, in which he became an arbiter as well as a financier of railroads. The boat was useful as a meeting place to settle disputes, a secret clubhouse beyond spying eyes. Pierpont had an actor's talent for creating dramatic backdrops for his exploits, and the Corsair allowed his business life to take on an aura of operatic flamboyance. This was never truer than in the 1885 dispute between the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central, over a railroad called the West Shore. Pierpont's involvement had a personal dimension. One day in 1881, he saw a peddler leading a pair of donkeys up Broad Street. Delighted by their resemblance to small donkeys he had seen in Egypt, he sent a clerk out to buy them. Christened Beelzebub and Apollyon, they were favorites of the Morgan children at Cragston. The following year, his children felt menaced by Irish ruffians building a new railroad below his house on the Hudson's West Bank, and Pierpont forbade them to ride unaccompanied by an adult. At the same time, blasts of explosives from the construction of this new West Shore Road rattled Cragston's windows, invading the tranquil Morgan hideaway. The West Shore was that railroad bane of the period, the blackmail line. Extortion artists would lay down parallel lines just to be bought out by an established road. Since railroads were natural monopolies and couldn't survive much direct competition, they could be easily threatened by small competitors. The West Shore ran up the west side of the Hudson, parallel to the New York Central on the opposite bank, then tracked the Central to Buffalo. It was widely believed the powerful Pennsylvania Railroad stood behind the West Shore. So, in retaliation, the New York Central broke ground on a South Pennsylvania road to compete with the Pennsylvania from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. A fierce rate war between the West Shore and the New York Central hammered down stock and bond prices for both companies, confirming Pierpont's growing hatred of competition. It came at a precarious time for railroad bankers. During a stock market plunge in 1883, there was a near panic in American rail stocks in London, producing a rising clamor for a financial czar who could arbitrarily settle such disputes. Cyrus Field cabled Junius, Many of our businessmen seem to have lost their heads. What we want is some cool-headed strong man to lead. As fiscal agent for the road, Junius watched with alarm as New York Central stock fell below par for the first time. Its dividend was halved. In early 1885, Pierpont went to London to consult with Junius, and fumed over the absurd struggle for preeminence, plunging America's railroads into internecine warfare. By the spring of 1885, the West Shore had gone into the hands of a receiver, while the hard-pressed New York Central deferred critical maintenance. It seems anomalous that America's most famous financier was a sworn foe of free markets. Yet it followed logically from the anarchy of late 19th century railroads, with their rate wars, blackmail lines, and lack of standardized gauges. To destroy competing lines, railroads could simply refuse to transfer freight to roads that abutted theirs. From an engineering standpoint, Pierpont knew little about railroads. What he did know was that they required steady revenues to cover their fixed interest costs on bonds marketed in New York and London. In the mid-1880s, 
freight rates were declining sharply under the pressure of savage price-cutting. Pierpont decided that the principal thing was to secure a harmony between the Pennsylvania and New York Central. On the sultry morning of July 20, 1885, with an impresario's flair, Pierpont staged a reconciliation between America's two largest railroads. After picking up the New York Central's president, Chauncey Depew, he crossed to a New Jersey pier and took aboard George H. Roberts, president, and Frank Thompson, vice president, of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Pierpont always denied his yacht was chosen for the sake of secrecy. I do not know that that was a part of the consideration, he later testified. It might have been. Before bringing both parties on board, he worked out the broad outlines of a truce. While the Corsair sailed up and down the Hudson, he sat under the rear awning, flanked by the railroad chiefs and smoking his nightmarishly huge black cigar. He stressed the displeasure of European investors with American railroads, but mostly let the railway men debate among themselves. In general, he used two negotiating ploys. He would create a no-exit situation and add to it threats that his rivals faced a deadline, a way of building tension and softening up the parties. Also, by saying little, he underscored his position as honest broker and permitted the antagonists to vent their anger. Pierpont was by nature a laconic man. He had no gift for sustained analysis. His genius was in the brief, sudden brainstorm. As one lawyer said of him, Morgan has one chief mental asset, a tremendous five minutes concentration of thought. By the time the railroad presidents were deposited on their respective shores at seven o'clock that evening, they had agreed to buy out each other's lines and desist from their mutually destructive warfare. Years later, the tunnels and embankments from the abandoned South Pennsylvania line would be incorporated into the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and as the New York Central's business expanded, it enlisted the West Shore tracks for a second line along the Hudson River. The newspapers lionized the author of this great railroad treaty of 1885, also known as the Corsair Compact. Pierpont had pulled off such a masterly feat that even Junius, so stingy with compliments, told Fanny, Pierpont handled the West Shore affair better than I could have done it myself. Pierpont was forty-eight when Junius voiced this unprecedented compliment. Once again, Pierpont had performed the kind of task of industrial arbitration that would later be left to courts and public commissions. In the rough and tumble of the baronial age, competition was naked and brutal, and businessmen lacked trade groups in which they could discuss common problems. Bankers could intervene as neutral parties, particularly where, as with Drexel Morgan, they had performed work for both companies. Over the years, Pierpont would employ the sharpest lawyers, yet his preferred style was more British, informal deals, handshakes over brandy and cigars, cordial clubroom chats among bankers, as they stood in frock coats and stiff collars. The Morgans were never litigious. During one railroad battle, Junius wrote Pierpont, I hope you will not be tempted into litigation. Life is too short for that. Bloodletting among railroads intensified in the 1880s. Several railroads skirted bankruptcy. In 1886, Drexel Morgan reorganized the big Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. This involved issuing new bonds with lower interest rates and assessing shareholders to lighten the burden on the line. The revived railroad was then taken over by a Morgan antagonist named A. Archibald MacLeod, who later declared, I would rather run a peanut stand than be dictated to by J.P. Morgan. He freely defied Morgan and invaded the territory of his other railroads. The experience would convince Pierpont not to release his grip on reorganized companies. The basic weakness with America's railroad system was overbuilding, which forced the roads into endless rounds of rate cuts and wage cuts to service debt. At the same time, the massive power of their largest consumers, notably Rockefeller in oil and Carnegie in steel, forced them to grant preferential rebates to big shippers, enraging small western farmers and businessmen, and stimulating calls for government regulation. For Pierpont, the leading symbol of railway monopoly, 
pure competition was never an option. Years later, he said, the American public seems to be unwilling to admit that it has a choice between regulated legal agreements and unregulated extra-legal agreements. We should have cast away more than fifty years ago the impossible doctrine of protection of the public by railway competition. As we shall see repeatedly, the House of Morgan always favored government planning over private competition, but private planning over either. In 1887, Congress passed the Interstate Commerce Act, the first regulatory commission, which enshrined competition as its guiding principle and eliminated the controversial rebates. Supporters of the act formed a diverse constituency, ranging from small shippers to the railroads themselves. The latter accepted the inevitability of regulation and hoped that in the proper form it might provide some sorely needed stability. But within six months of the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission, the rebates reappeared. Hence, in 1888, the railroad chieftains decided to graft their own form of self-regulation on the ICC framework, under the aegis of Pierpont Morgan. That December, newspaper readers were regaled with accounts of mysterious doings at Morgan's Murray Hill home. As reporters staked out the house, they saw a procession of Western Railroad presidents and bankers disappear inside. Those arriving included Charles Francis Adams of the Union Pacific and a ghastly sick Jay Gould, representing the Missouri Pacific. The Morgan house was under siege. Reporters kept ringing the doorbell and fixed opera glasses on the windows. Inside, at the head of his library table, Pierpont opened the discussion with these words. The purpose of this meeting is to cause the members of this association to no longer take the law into their own hands when they suspect they have been wronged, as has been too much the practice heretofore. This is not elsewhere customary in civilized communities, and no good reason exists why such a practice should continue among railroads. Clearly, Pierpont's European experience formed his frame of reference. Backed by representatives of Barings and Brown Brothers, Pierpont offered the railroad presidents a deal. If they refrained from rate-cutting and cutthroat competition, the financiers would stop underwriting competing railways. It was a clever move, for while Wall Street accused the railroads of irresponsible behavior, the railroads blamed Wall Street for floating too many securities and creating the overexpansion that led to price wars. Morgan himself was accused of sponsoring overcapitalized lines that couldn't weather recessions because of their heavy debt load. The December 1888 meetings produced a gentleman's agreement to maintain rates for sixty days. Then the group would reassemble at Morgan's house. A similar gathering took place at Pierpont's Black Library in January 1889. This one yielded plans for a huge, centralized group to regulate the entire rail system, the Interstate Commerce Railway Association. This behemoth would set rates, arbitrate disputes, and mete out fines to offending railroads. Pierpont was to head the cartel. The New York Sun called the new group nothing short of a revolution in railroad methods. But the new group soon fell apart under the pressure of Western rate wars. Pierpont's last stab at establishing railroad stability took place at a meeting on December 15, 1890. Besides the earlier luminaries, this gathering drew Stuyvesant Fish of the Illinois Central, James J. Hill of the Great Northern, and T. F. Oaks of the Northern Pacific. Pierpont presented a plan for a Western Traffic Association, which would include one director from each railroad and would set uniform rates. Any railroad that cheated would be discharged. He was mightily pleased with his plan. In a rare burst of public candor, he exulted to a reporter, Think of it, all the competing traffic of the roads west of Chicago and St. Louis placed in the control of about thirty men. The statement is splendidly innocent, yet perilously blind. Pierpont believed so implicitly in his own fairness and good judgment that he saw no harm in a large section of America's economy coming under his personal dominion. The New York Herald blared, Railroad kings form a gigantic trust. Before too long, this plan, too, would crumble. 
In the last analysis, the gentlemen's agreements suffered the historic fate of cartels. They couldn't control small outside competitors, who cut rates, outflanked larger rivals, and won new business. With surreptitious cheating and lack of discipline, deals soon collapsed. Even the now immense authority of Pierpont Morgan couldn't solve the structural problems caused by too many railroads chasing too few passengers and owing too much money. As scores of railroads went bankrupt during the 1893 panic, Pierpont would reorganize many of them and use controversial new techniques to bring about order. This phase of Pierpont's life shows that his real vice was not money, but power. This was not power of a pathological sort, not power to bully men and bask in glory, though there was some of that, but power to take what he saw as a topsy-turvy financial world and set it right. Among robber barons, he was unique in suffering an excess of morality. He believed that he could master the problems of his era at a time when others were confused by the sheer dynamism and speed of economic change. As this new power accrued to the House of Morgan, making it the premier American bank, excruciating responsibility fell on Pierpont's shoulders. Yet his office staff was slim, with only eighty employees. Pierpont didn't even have a permanent secretary. Junius continued to warn his son against exhausting immersion in business. At the same time, his secretive merchant banker's sensibility was shocked when Pierpont appointed a clerk to open incoming mail. In the late 1880s, in a final volley of advice, Junius wrote that, "'Nobody, however strong and well he may be, can stand such strain upon his physical and mental powers as you have had for the last two years, without paying sooner or later the penalty,' unless he gives them a real rest and gives it to them in season. Yet Junius never saw how much his own unbending style and unrealistically high standards had contributed to Pierpont's slavish dedication to work. By the 1880s, as his health was fading, Junius Morgan slowly eased out of business. The Iron Duke of the Morgan Saga had become the most influential American banker in London, a peer of Barings and Rothschilds, his firm participating in an international smorgasbord of loans for the Egyptian National Bank, Russian Railways, Brazilian Provincial Governments, and Argentinian Public Works. Whatever his health problems, he gave an impression of rock-solid durability. The London Times declared him a hale and vigorous man for his years. In 1884, Junius's wife, Juliet, died at the age of 68. Surrounded by her favorite collection of china dogs, she had been, as the Morgan family tactfully phrased it, confused in her later years, and confined to an upstairs room much of the time. Thus she had been unable to share in her husband's life. After her death, Junius's solitude was relieved by twice-weekly letters from Pierpont and visits from his grandchildren. J. P. Morgan, Jr., whom the family called Jack, worshipped his grandfather, and particularly liked the English formality at Thirteen Princes Gate, including the way the servants treated him as heir apparent. Junius was as attached as ever to Pierpont. After a visit from him in the south of France, he wrote, Pierpont and family left today. House very lonely. Missed them dreadfully. These visits were Junius's main pleasure at the end. A photograph of him taken in 1890 shows the firm mouth and steady gaze of earlier years. His hair was snow-white, his eyebrows white and tufty, and the top of his head was bald. He spent winters at the Via Henriette in Monte Carlo, which had a beautiful view of the Mediterranean. Leading an orderly bourgeois life, he dined with friends and took afternoon carriage drives. During one excursion, on the afternoon of April 3, 1890, the horses were startled by an onrushing train. Junius jumped up to see whether his coachman could master the team. At that instant, the carriage ran against a heap of stones and flung him violently against a wall, breaking his wrist and causing a brain concussion. For five days he lay unconscious. Then the flow of maxims ceased forever. Perhaps it was appropriate that Junius's death was dealt by one stunning blow in his seventy-seventh year, rather than by a dribbling away of strength. 
In its obituary notice, the London Times remarked that he had hardly been ill in his life. Certainly there was mysterious symbolism in the fact that a train's sudden roar, upsetting a pastoral landscape, had killed one of London's foremost railroad bankers. Junius was buried in the Cedar Hill Cemetery in Hartford. As he had for Peabody, Pierpont devised a funeral suitable for an illustrious warrior hero. Hartford shopkeepers along the funeral route closed their businesses for the occasion, while flags flew at half-mast over the state capitol. Pierpont's inscription to Junius for the Morgan Memorial Building at the Wadsworth Athenaeum said much about their common identification with London's merchant banking tradition. In loving memory of Junius Spencer Morgan, a native of Massachusetts, a merchant of Hartford, afterwards a merchant of London. Did Pierpont resent his father's domination, or was his admiration as unmixed as he claimed? Whatever anger or ambivalence he felt was buried beneath gigantic monuments. He honored Junius like Hamlet mourning the dead king. For twelve years he gathered up land around Hartford's Wadsworth Athenaeum in order to create the Morgan Memorial, a $1.4 million pink marble building in English Renaissance style that doubled the museum's size. Years later, glancing impatiently at his pocket watch all the while, he surveyed blueprints and rapidly picked out three new buildings for the Harvard Medical School, again to certify a son's love. And upon the red damask wall of the west room of his own library, Junius's portrait would hold pride of place, ringed by Umbrian Madonnas and infant saviors, the powerful patriarch surrounded by loving children and ethereal females. After a small fire at his Madison Avenue townhouse, Pierpont was asked which treasure he would have rescued first. My father's portrait, he said, without hesitation. An American magazine had recently listed Pierpont and Junius as among America's richest men. Now Pierpont inherited an estate of $12.4 million, and his personal fortune doubled overnight. $10 million would stay in the bank. He was bequeathed control of a banking empire and assumed his father's position in the city. Like his father, he stood astride that flow of capital from Britain to America and would profit as it reversed direction in the new century. After Junius's death, some shackle was lifted from Pierpont's spirit. A new grandiosity flowered, and he self-consciously became J. Pierpont Morgan, mogul, pirate, patron of the arts. Before Junius's death, Pierpont's collections were modest. In 1888, he had bought his first literary manuscript, a Thackeray. Now he embarked on a buying spree that would eventually produce the world's largest art collection in private hands. To trumpet the new J. P. Morgan, he also enlisted his friend J. Frederick Tams to design Corsair II. Tams was given blank Drexel Morgan checks and told to forget about expense. The only restriction was that the boat be able to turn around in the Hudson River near Cragston. A dark, sleek ship with a glamorous black hull and yellow smokestack, this new Corsair measured over 241 feet in length and aggressively laid claim to the title of the largest pleasure vessel afloat. In time, the mere appearance of the Corsair II in foreign harbors would alarm the populace, as if warning of an impending invasion of American capital. The men in the Morgan family might have been far happier had not each of three consecutive generations produced only one son to survive to adulthood. In merchant banking families, the whole weight of the dynasty was at once placed on the male infants. Unlike publicly traded companies, which have a corporate life of their own, private merchant bank partnerships often relied upon the name, capital, and reputation of a single family. If the male heirs refused to go into the family business, it might have to be wound up. Thus, Morgan expectations were lodged first by Junius in Pierpont, then by Pierpont in Jack. In both cases, business pressures would tremendously intensify the typical father-son tensions. From the outset, Pierpont's relationship with Jack differed from his own with Junius. If Pierpont suffered from Junius's sometimes smothering attention, Jack suffered the curse of neglect. 
He craved the love of a father who seemed too remote and too self-absorbed to attend to his boyish needs. Between Jack and his father there would always be some distance, some nameless discomfort, that was very different from the intense, manly, mutual fascination between Junius and Pierpont. Both Pierpont and Jack were shy and clumsy and steeped in New England formality. It was difficult for the delicate, insecure Jack to cope with the great flashing, roaring engine of a famous father. Unlike Pierpont, who had been a wild, headstrong boy requiring a firm hand, Jack needed a father to buck up his faltering courage, which Pierpont didn't do. Jack was gentle and sedentary, lacking fire. He attended St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire, where rich adolescent boys were exposed to Spartan Yankee routines. They had to write weekly letters home, but couldn't receive presents, and had to seek pocket money from the rector. Where Pierpont wrote boyhood essays in praise of Napoleon, Jack seemed more protective of the weak. Explaining why one teacher was his favorite, he confessed, I suppose that it is partly because I feel sorrier for him than any of the others. The boys do plague him so. In 1880, at thirteen, he cried upon reading Dombey and Son, Dickens's novel about a stern magnate father and his sensitive son. Like his own father, Jack suffered migraine headaches that lasted for days. Big, awkward, and docile, Jack liked well-bred boys, not ruffians, and already sounded middle-aged at twelve, telling Fanny he refrained from marbles because it doesn't pay for the wear and tear and chapping of the knuckles. Jack lacked the nerve to contest his terrifying distant father. Where Pierpont had the fortitude to confront Junius, Jack silently hoped for approval and leaned on his mother for emotional support. He found his father a man of violent and mercurial moods. His anxiety grew especially acute about money, a subject invested with many family taboos. Like the young Pierpont, Jack kept strict accounts of his expenses. We find him recording ten cents for a library fine at school and charging expenses against his Christmas money or grandpa money. Whenever the subjects of Pierpont and money coincided, Jack trembled. You see, I don't mean to do anything about money that Papa wouldn't like, he told his mother. Papa hates so to have me come to him about money matters that I did not mean in any way to hint that he ought to pay the bill. Such sentiments abound in his boyhood letters. Jack's letters to his mother form the most complete record of Morgan family life. Unfortunately, no account from Fanny's side remains. It is clear, however, that Jack was passionately attached to his mother. Sensitive to each other's melancholy, they shared the great enigma of J. Pierpont Morgan, and consoled each other for forty years. Later on, we shall see Jack Morgan as a bitter old man, yet here he was as an ardent boy, bursting with affection, telling his mother, "'Dear, I love you, as you know, and just now I am full of comfort, thinking I am going to see you in less than a week. Even as a teenager, he felt protective toward Fanny, and sometimes sounded more like parent than child. As Fanny became depressed and bedridden, there are many references to her invalidism in Jack's letters. He tried to cheer her up. In 1889, he wrote, As to your blues, I can only say what everyone else does. Do take care enough not to overtire yourself, and watch against them all. You know how. As a teenager, he was slightly puzzled when a friend's mother described Fanny as calm, cold, unenthusiastic. Yet the episode suggests that Fanny may have been aloof in the outside world and showed her emotions only in private. While Pierpont had a smattering of university education at Gottingen, Jack was the first Morgan to obtain a college degree graduating from Harvard in 1889. He had a broad, smooth face with dark hair flattened on top and a mustache. His Harvard years, which coincided with his father's gentleman's agreements, were free of rebellion. While Pierpont knocked heads with railroad satraps in New York, Jack loafed, smoked pipes, and took a gentleman's sea, spending his senior year studying the properties of seaweed. 
It was symptomatic of Jack's humility and his insecurity that when he made an exciting discovery in his laboratory, he chalked it off to luck. Like his mother, Jack enjoyed literature, but seemed unsettled by dark worldviews. Proper and squeamish, he was disturbed by Faust's tragic ending and found La Dame aux Camellia depressing. There would be no tubercular Mimi or tear-stained adventures in Jack's young life. Sailing to Europe in 1887, he wrote, "'There is only one girl on board who could be called a belle, and I have kept very clear of her, because she struck me as being very common.' He flirted with no dangerous doctrines, and was already impatient with meddlesome people who stirred up trouble." I don't know why so many people seem to look upon business as if it were the general sewer in which all ambition and intelligence disappear. I must confess I don't see any harm myself in making a little money, provided that it can be done honestly and reasonably. He was also quite religious. Where other young men hotly debated the justice of the social order, Jack worried about whether gambling should be openly denounced from the pulpit. Jack has left a melancholy record of the emotional chasm that separated him from his father. He told one satiric story that also said much about Pierpont's self-absorption. He had invited a Harvard classmate to visit him at Cragston, and the young man rode up on the Corsair with Pierpont. After introductions, Pierpont promptly buried himself in the newspaper. When they landed, he said to Jack about the classmate, "'That is one of the nicest young fellows I've met.' Pierpont apparently found Jack soft and rather passive, lacking the sort of gumption he had as a young man. In 1884 and 1885, he arranged for his son to take a hunting trip in the Rockies with William Rainsford, the rector of St. George's, who was a great sportsman. Jack shot a bighorn sheep and slept in a snowbound cabin. Manly pursuits Pierpont hoped would toughen the young man up. Meanwhile, Jack's intimate life remained confined to his mother. In 1889, Jack graduated from Harvard and met Jane Norton Grew, daughter of Boston banker and mill owner Henry Sturgis Grew. Descended from several prominent families, including the Sturgises and the Wigglesworths, Jessie, as Jane was called, had a proper Bostonian pedigree. Yet before approving the match, the Morgans and the Grews circled around each other and sniffed for a while. Jack passed along Jesse's genealogy to the snobbish Pierpont, and kept requesting a chance to discuss their possible marriage. Finally, Pierpont consented to talk with his son during his next trip to Boston. In a letter both angry and wistful, Jack told Fanny what happened. On Saturday, Papa telegraphed me he should be in Boston a few hours, and hoped to see me. He was to arrive at 6.40 and go back at midnight, with a party of twelve for a Corsair dinner. I expected to be nearly an hour with him, instead of which his train was delayed, and instead of seeing him I waited under a railroad bridge in the rain for an hour, and had the delightful opportunity of driving from the station to the club with him in the same carriage with Mr. Bowden, Pierpont's partner, and Mr. Depew, then President of the New York Central. As he had not sent me on a single one of your telegrams, and had not told me anything about Rainsford's plans, or even if he himself was certain to sail on Wednesday, the visit was somewhat unsatisfactory. There certainly are some drawbacks to belonging to a busy man, no matter how fine he may be, as I believe you have sometimes found out. Most revealing is how the letter ends, with Jack portraying himself and Fanny as common victims of Pierpont. A month later, anxious and trembling, Jack blurted out the facts of the situation with Jesse. Pierpont responded that in the spring he and Fanny would consider the matter. Frightened of his father, Jack was always relieved and grateful when he received sympathetic attention. After a subsequent meeting, he told his mother, "'It would be hard for me to exaggerate my thankfulness for the way in which Papa received my confidences, and the satisfaction I feel in having spoken to him. It has made me less blue than I have been for months. On December 11, 1890, Jack and Jesse were wed in Boston's Arlington Street Church, a marriage that made the front page of the New York Times. The oral history that has come down through the Morgan family contends that Jack wanted to be a doctor, 
and became a banker only when his father made it a matter of family honor. In 1892, at the age of 25, Jack became a partner in the Morgan Banks in New York, Philadelphia, and Paris. During a 20-year business association, Jack would remain a close observer of his father, charting his manic, depressive moods and giving him more generous sympathy than he received in return, although the relationship would become somewhat more equal toward the end of Pierpont's life. Jack entered the Morgan Empire at a critical time. In June 1893, Tony Drexel died while visiting the Austro-Hungarian health resort of Carlsbad, leaving an estate said to be worth between twenty-five and thirty million dollars. While giving Pierpont managerial control in New York, the Drexel family had retained control of Drexel & Company in Philadelphia and Drexel Hargis in Paris. In October 1893, Anthony Drexel, Jr. decided to retire and devote himself to society pleasures, thus enabling Pierpont to strengthen his hold over the interlocking partnerships in New York, Philadelphia, Paris, and London. At a dinner meeting at the Metropolitan Club, the sole time in Morgan history that the New York and Philadelphia partners sat in one room, he announced a new plan for centralized control. In the 1895 reorganization, Drexel Morgan was rechristened J.P. Morgan & Company, while the Paris office became Morgan Hargis. The Philadelphia house remained Drexel & Company, but the Drexel family passed from the scene, and Pierpont tapped Edward T. Stotesbury, son of a Philadelphia sugar refiner, to head the Philadelphia office. J.S. Morgan & Company in London would soon undergo a major reorganization of personnel. Among the four Morgan partnerships, the only common denominator would be Pierpont's position as all-powerful senior partner. His associates, in contrast, might be partners in some, but not all, the firms. Pierpont would take 35% of the profits of the combined houses. Power had now passed from London to New York, which would remain the command post of the Morgan Empire. Despite its multinational veneer, the Morgan Empire would be American-based, with partners at 23 Wall wielding disproportionate power. Where Junius had dispatched Pierpont to New York as the lesser financial center, so Pierpont would dispatch Jack to London, soon to be eclipsed by New York. On the eve of an unprecedented industrial boom in America, which would see the creation of vast trusts, the House of Morgan had opportunely shifted its center of gravity westward across the Atlantic. Pierpont Morgan's thunderous presence at 23 Wall Street could be observed by visitors as soon as they entered his glass-enclosed, wood-paneled offices. The concept was copied from Junius's office. Seated in a swivel chair before a roll-top desk on the Broad Street side, a coal fire behind him in winter, he would rise, stroll over, and question his partners as he needed to. Lincoln Steffens recalled how he sat in a back room with glass sides and the door open. This sense of access was illusory, however, for his imperious stare could reduce interlopers to jelly. He unnerved those who overstayed a visit by simply writing and not looking up. Steffens recalled that his partners did not go near him unless he sent for them, and then they looked alarmed and darted in like office boys. Even his partners called him Mr. Morgan, or the senior. So there he sat, displayed like a carnival waxwork, the man Bernard Baruch termed the greatest financial genius this country has ever known. He invited intimacy, but then rebuffed it. His aura was so fearsome that crowds parted before him on the pavement. Once, when an Episcopal bishop visited Cragston, Pierpont was able to flag down a West Shore train in the middle of the night so the prelate could make his way back to Manhattan. There are many stories of Pierpont's brusque impatience and his economy of self-expression. He had a short attention span and sometimes worked only from eleven o'clock to three or four in the afternoon, pausing for a sandwich, pie, and coffee at his desk. After saving one merchant's business, he interrupted the man's grateful blubbering to say, No, it is a busy day. There is no time for that. Good morning. Few were privy to his thoughts and he often had his own unstated agenda. Journalist Clarence W. Barron tells the story of a young Boston financier, F. H. Prince, who went to Pierpont for investment advice. Prince confessed, I shook Mr. Morgan's hand 
and thanked him warmly for the great interest he was taking in me as a young man, and said I should never forget his advice. I knew at this time that he was doing everything he could to ruin me. After Junius's death, Pierpont needed to loosen his autocratic grip, as the sheer volume of work outgrew his need for domination. He had long bewailed his inability to delegate authority. It is my nature, and I cannot help it and held no formal meeting of his partners until after the 1907 panic. Despite the scope of his vision, Pierpont was extremely attentive to details and took pride in the knowledge that he could perform any job in the bank. I can sit down at any clerk's desk, take up his work where he left it, and go on with it. I don't like being at any man's mercy. He never entirely renounced the founder's itch to know the most minute details of the business. He examined the cash balance daily, boasted he could pay off all debts in two hours, had a dead eye for fake figures in scanning a ledger, and personally audited the books each New Year's Day. When he found an error, the effect could be memorable for the responsible employee. He was a perfectly huge man, and he had a voice like a bull, said Leonhardt A. Keyes, then an office boy who wound the gold Tiffany clock on his desk. Pierpont Morgan's power flourished during the steep industrial recession that began in 1893. Over 15,000 commercial firms failed in a contraction that led to class warfare and quasi-revolutionary strife in many parts of the United States. The bloody rout of steel workers in the Homestead Strike of 1892 gave way to the government's merciless crushing of the 1894 Pullman Strike. Over 600 banks failed during this period and cash grew so scarce as a result of hoarding that brokers traded it on Wall Street curbs. Every company that failed and was reorganized by a bank ended up the bank's captive client. In 1892, General Electric had been formed through a consolidation of the Edison General Electric Company and Thompson Houston Electric. When the new company failed the next year, Pierpont rescued it, and thus ensured GE's future loyalty to the House of Morgan. Oppressed by debt and overbuilding, more than a third of the country's railway trackage fell into receivership, and English investors exhorted Pierpont to bring order to the industry. Thwarted by gentlemen's agreements, Pierpont now tried another approach to forming railway cartels. He would reorganize bankrupt roads and transfer control to himself. Then, he wouldn't be at the whim of government or feuding railway chiefs. In reorganizing railways, he ascended to a new plateau of power, beyond what any other private businessman had yet achieved. The lengthy catalogue of railroads that fell under his control included the Erie, Chesapeake and Ohio, Philadelphia and Reading, Santa Fe, Northern Pacific, Great Northern, New York Central, Lehigh Valley, Jersey Central, and the Southern Railway. Virtually every bankrupt road east of the Mississippi eventually passed through such reorganization, or Morganization, as it was called. Some 33,000 miles of railroad, one-sixth of the country's trackage, were Morganized. The company's combined revenues approached an amount equal to half of the U.S. government's annual receipts. It is hard to exaggerate the power that Pierpont accrued. Railroads then comprised 60% of all issues on the New York Stock Exchange. Utility and industrial stocks were rated as too speculative for insurance companies and savings institutions, putting railroads in a blue-chip category by themselves. Also, by issuing free passes to politicians, the railroads exercised a giant, corrupting influence on state legislatures. As his bank became a gigantic mill for bankrupt railroads, Pierpont routinely picked up $1 million fees. With Morganization, fixed railway costs were slimmed, and creditors were forced to swap their bonds for ones with lower interest rates, enabling roads to resume debt service. Pierpont would also put a lien on the railroad's vast land and mineral holdings, so that money couldn't be diverted to other enterprises. A court case nearly a hundred years later would show how binding these arrangements were. In 1987, 
the Burlington Northern Railroad tried to free itself from covenants Pierpont had imposed on the bonds of its predecessor, the Northern Pacific, which fell into receivership in 1893. He had put a lien on 1.9 million acres of land and 2.4 million acres of mineral rights, stipulating that all proceeds should go to improving the road. Analysts estimated that coal, oil, gas, and other minerals on the affected lands were worth billions of dollars. From beyond the grave, Pierpont stood up foursquare for creditors. As a further guarantee that the roads would never again squander money, a majority of their stock was transferred to voting trusts. These were usually a euphemism for Pierpont and three or four of his cronies, who ran the railroads, typically for a five-year period. It was an extension of Pierpont's old trick of trading money for power, and it usurped commercial power on a scale unprecedented in banking history. No longer would the banker just finance and advise his clients, now he would intervene directly in running the companies. The distinction between finance and industry was eroding dangerously. Why would tens of thousands of shareholders yield their shares to this Wall Street Pope in exchange for so-called trust certificates? The answer lies in the peculiarity of 19th century finance. When companies lost money, shareholders in bankrupted companies could be dunned for assessments. So investors rushed to give up their shares and avoid the threatened penalties. Pierpont was now an altogether new species of robber baron, not nakedly voracious, not a Rockefeller snuffing out troublesome competitors, but a gruff, well-tailored banker with a legal, if highly controversial, system. Within the bank, Morganization was viewed benignly as an exercise of fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. Pierpont didn't seem to operate by any grand scheme. He was too instinctive for that. A later Morgan partner, Tom Lamont, remarked that he never knew of a man who addressed himself more exclusively than Mr. Morgan to the ad hoc situation and the ad hoc job that lay before him. All this talk about his devising or building up systems is perfect tosh. Pierpont didn't spin webs or plot paths to power. Rather, he had a messianic faith in his ability to reorder businesses. If he could tidy up America better than anyone else, so be it. He took the technique of the voting trust and endlessly multiplied his power. As Sereno S. Pratt, an editor of the Wall Street Journal, later said of him, his power is not to be found in the number of his own millions, but in the billions of which he was the trustee. If there was nothing devious about the voting trusts, they created a frightening concentration of Wall Street power. Before the Morganization period, more than two-thirds of American railroads had offices outside New York. Afterward, most were headquartered there. By 1900, the nation's railroads were consolidated into six huge systems controlled by Wall Street bankers, principally J.P. Morgan and & Company and Kuhn Loeb. In this perpetual motion machine, Pierpont not only reorganized roads, but locked up their future financing. By acting as their trustee, or holding a large block of their stock, he ensured bondage to 23 Wall. The banker was strong because the railroads were weak, and however much Pierpont deplored railroad instability, he thrived on such chaos. Pierpont alone could never have carried out the exhausting work of Morganization, hence the importance, then and later, of Morgan Partners. In history books, they are often portrayed as mice scurrying in the background. Yet many were towering figures in their own right, the shadow cabinet of the Morgan government. The railroad reorganizations were carried out by a staff of fewer than 150 employees. This was at a time when old-fashioned banks, such as the House of Morgan, frowned upon typewriters as newfangled. Visitors always marveled at the discrepancy between the bank's power and its size, in 1905, Dr. Hjalmar Schacht, later Hitler's finance minister, recorded this impression. The entire office was contained in a single room on the ground floor in which were dozens of desks where the employees worked. No question of visitors being formally announced, no waiting or anterooms. 
anyone who saw that a principal was disengaged could walk right up to his desk. Relations between heads and employees were very informal and free and easy, without thereby lacking in respect. Pierpont selected partners not by wealth or to fortify the bank's capital, but based on brains and talent. If the Morgan style was royal, its hiring practices were meritocratic. The bank had many first-rate technicians. Pierpont's transportation man, Samuel Spencer, was said to know better than anyone in America every detail of railroading, from the cost of a car break to the estimate for a terminal. Most impressive was Charles Coster, a pale man with neatly brushed hair, pensive eyes, and handlebar mustache. As a young man, Coster had published a history of stamps, and his compulsion to organize and classify never left him. He was the obscure wizard of Morganization. Jack Morgan said of him, His mastery of detail was complete, his grasp of a problem immediate and comprehensive, and his power of work astonishing. Wall Street caught fleeting glances of this sedentary genius. Men saw him by day, a white-faced, nervous figure, hurrying from director's meeting to director's meeting, at evening carrying home his portfolio of corporate problems for the night. Yet Coster was no downtrodden clerk. Thanks to the wonders of voting trusts, he sat on the boards of fifty-nine corporations. The House of Morgan would have a contradictory reputation as both a gentleman's club and a posh sweatshop. During the Morganization period, lights burned at the bank long after the rest of Wall Street was dark. The partners shouldered unbearable tasks. One journalist remarked that the House of Morgan was always known as a partner killer, and the body count mounted steadily. One day in 1894, while waiting for an elevated train after the business day, partner J. Hood Wright dropped dead at the age of 58. The most shocking death was Coster's in March 1900 at age 48. He contracted flu or pneumonia and died within a week. Mixing sympathy with outrage, the New York Times charged that the tasks piled upon Coster had grown far heavier than any one man ought to bear, or could bear with safety. Naming Morgan partners who died from overwork by 1900, John Moody said they had succumbed to the gigantic, nerve-wracking business and pressure of the Morgan methods, and the strain involved in the care of the railroad capital of America. Jupiter Morgan had alone come through that soul-crushing mill of business, retaining his health, vigor, and energy. In choosing partners, Pierpont wouldn't tolerate a refusal. He was shameless enough to recruit Coster's successor, railroad lawyer Charles Steele, at Coster's funeral. As the cortege moved along, Pierpont presented a partnership to Steele as a fait accompli. Charles, he said, it looks as if the Lord had taken charge of this question, and I am going ahead to make the partnership agreement. The courtly Steele later accumulated thirty-six corporate directorships, including those of United States Steel and General Electric, and his wealth would rival Jack Morgan's. Even as the exhausting pace of work created scandals, a Morgan partnership became the most coveted financial post. Judge Elbert H. Gary, a chairman of United States Steel, said of Pierpont's partners, He made them all wealthy beyond their dreams. Indeed, in exchange for exquisite torture, a Morgan partner received a guarantee of riches and a seat on the High Council of American Finance. Chapter 5 Corner. In 1895, Pierpont Morgan engineered his most dazzling feat. He saved the gold standard and briefly managed to control the flow of gold into and out of the United States. The concept behind the gold standard was simple. Ever since January 1879, the government had pledged to redeem dollars for gold, thus ensuring the value of the currency. To make this more than an empty boast and reassure worried investors, Washington had a policy of keeping on hand at least $100 million in gold coin and bullion. In the early 1890s, huge amounts of gold began to flow from New York to Europe. 
In the circuitous way of world finance, the trouble started in Argentina. In the 1880s, the city of London was swept by a craze for Argentinian securities, which attracted almost half of British money invested abroad. The principal conduit was Baring Brothers, which shared a good deal of Argentinian business with Junius Morgan. Then the Argentinian wheat crop failed and was followed by a coup in Buenos Aires. The prospect of default hurt the Morgan Bank in London, but nearly collapsed the August Barings, which lost heavily on its Argentinian bonds. To save Barings from bankruptcy in 1890, the Bank of England organized a rescue fund, to which J. S. Morgan and Company and other rivals contributed. The old Baring partnership was liquidated, the reorganized firm would never regain its former power, and a major Morgan rival was weakened. Before long, Barings shared supremacy in Argentina with the Morgans. Meanwhile, with a stigma attached to foreign holdings, British investors retrenched and drained gold from America. This exodus of metal was greatly accelerated by the 1893 panic, with its bank failures and railroad bankruptcies. Adding to European jitters were American attempts to tamper with the U.S. currency. Under the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890, the U.S. Treasury had to buy 4.5 million ounces of silver monthly and issue certificates redeemable in gold or silver. This effectively put America on a bimetal basis, that is, money was backed by both gold and silver, expanding the money supply. For the hard money men of Europe, this looked as if it were an effort by American debtors to debauch the currency and repay loans in cheaper dollars. These creditors venerated the gold standard as their safeguard against such backdoor default. So European bankers redeemed their dollars for gold and shipped the gold back to Europe. For Pierpont Morgan, this was an alarming throwback to the days when George Peabody had to prove that Americans honored their debt. The Silver Act was repealed in 1893 under pressure from Morgan and other bankers. But wary Europeans feared that populist forces might yet wreck the gold standard and force them to accept unwanted silver for dollars. Among the indebted farmers of the South and West, the gold standard generated fanatic hatred. The United States was still an agrarian debtor nation, and poor rural debtors far outnumbered big city bondholders. These farmers had many legitimate grievances, for they contended with the curse of steadily falling prices in the late 19th century. Deflation meant they had to repay debt in dearer money, a recipe for ruin. There was no central bank to expand credit during hard times. At the same time, because of tariffs and industrial trusts, the prices of finished goods didn't fall as fast as the price of food. Thanks to Pierpont and the railway barons, freight rates actually rose. So farmers welcomed inflation, specifically higher prices for their own produce, as the only way to remain equal in the contest against bankers and industrialists. This discontent made bankers the favorite boogeymen in rural political demonology. So venomous was the mood that several western states outlawed bankers, and Texas banned them altogether until 1904. This pervasive anger in the hinterlands crystallized around the House of Morgan, which was seen as a mouthpiece for European finance. A popular grassroots mythology claimed that the Bank of England and New York bankers had suborned Congress into enacting the gold standard. For decades, William Jennings Bryan rallied the populist faithful by inveighing against America's financial servitude to British capital. From this period dates the folklore of the House of Morgan as heartless money men, traitors in the pay of British gold, glorying in the ruin of American farmers. The 19th century inflationary nostrums that make for tedious study today, greenbacks, free silver coinage, bimetallism, and so on, were attempts by indebted farmers to lighten their debt load. As the 1893 panic worsened, agrarian populists asked the government to mint silver coins and create cheap money, a move supported by the new silver-producing states. Farming districts scoffed at the notion that any damage might be done by going off gold. The Atlanta Constitution remarked that the people of this country, outside the hotbeds of gold buggery and Shylockism, 
don't care how soon gold payments are suspended. For Pierpont, however, destruction of the gold standard would subvert European faith in American securities and destroy his life's work. As he later said, his aim in 1895 was to build up such relations of confidence between the United States and the money markets of Europe that capital from there could be secured in large sums for our needs. During 1894, the U.S. gold reserve dipped below the $100 million floor. Bad money, silver, was driving good money, gold, out of circulation. By January 1895, gold was fleeing New York at a frightening pace. One could watch this flight capital in action as gold bullion was loaded onto ships in New York Harbor bound for Europe. At fashionable Manhattan restaurants, sporting men placed wagers as to when America would go bust and declare its inability to redeem dollars for gold. The beleaguered president, Grover Cleveland, was a friend of the House of Morgan and a staunch advocate of the gold standard. During the four years he spent on Wall Street between his two presidential terms, Cleveland worked in the law offices of Bangs, Stetson, Tracy, and McVeigh. This was the law firm of Pierpont's father-in-law, Charles Tracy, located next door to the Morgan Bank at 15 Broad Street. Cleveland had been good friends with the shrewd Francis Lind Stetson, Pierpont's lawyer for the railroad reorganizations and known on Wall Street as Morgan's attorney general. He also befriended many Wall Street people and was one of the twelve pallbearers at the funeral of August Belmont Sr. in 1890. Although Pierpont was a Republican, he wasn't antagonistic toward the Democratic Cleveland. In 1884, he cast his lone Democratic vote for Cleveland precisely because the candidate endorsed sound money. As the gold reserve dipped, Cleveland faced a hostile Republican Congress, which favored free coinage instead of gold. Many Prairie Democrats concurred. Amid this gloomy death watch, Congress refused to grant President Cleveland the authority to replenish the gold reserve through a public bond offering. At the same time, populist fury made resorting to private bankers like Morgan unthinkable. Cleveland sat paralyzed. By January 24, 1895, gold reserves had declined to $68 million, and gold coin was especially scarce at the nine sub-treasuries around the country, including that in New York, across Wall Street from the Morgan Bank. As a crisis approached, Cleveland turned to the Rothschilds in London, perhaps to deflect charges of being in Wall Street's pocket. When approached by Rothschilds about a bond issue, J. S. Morgan and Company agreed to participate only if Pierpont handled the American end with the Rothschild representative August Belmont, Jr. On January 31st, Pierpont and Belmont met at the New York Sub-Treasury with William E. Curtis, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Although no action was taken, the report of the meeting relieved skittish investors and $9 million in gold on ships in the harbor was returned to land overnight. For populists, news of the Morgan-Belmont-Curtis meeting confirmed suspicions of a Wall Street-Washington conspiracy. In the cables he sent to the London partners during this period, Pierpont affords a glimpse into his deepest ideological impulses, his contempt for politics, his regard for European opinion, his allegiance to neoclassic economics, and his disdain for certain Jewish firms. Referring to one leading Jewish house, he said, We should dislike see business largely in the hands of Speyer and Company and similar houses. His identification with the London creditors was patent. We all have large interests dependent upon maintenance, sound currency, U.S. Important use every exertion, success negotiations, greater factor is European absorption, even temporarily, of bonds. His dispatches were often fervent and even melodramatic in tone. By early February, the New York sub-treasury was losing gold rapidly. Default seemed imminent. Yet the Treasury Secretary, John G. Carlyle, informed Morgan and Belmont that the Cabinet had flatly rejected their proposed private bond issue. So on Monday, February 4th, Belmont set off for Washington, followed by Morgan. Aware of Francis Stetson's friendship with Cleveland, Morgan told him, 
There may be papers to be drawn, and I want you, and brought him along with a new Morgan partner, the handsome young Robert Bacon. Pierpont told his London partners that the United States was on the brink of the abyss of financial chaos, and that he wanted to help the U.S. government avert calamity. Morgan, Bacon, and Stetson took a private railroad car down to Washington, hitched up to the Congressional Limited. When they arrived, they were greeted by Secretary of War Daniel Lamont, who said that the President had decided against a private syndicate and refused to see the party. Pierpont said magisterially, I have come down to see the President, and I am going to stay here until I see him. While Stetson tried to lobby Cleveland, Bacon applied his charms to Attorney General Richard Olney. That night, in a technique he used to steady his nerves, Pierpont played solitaire, a game called Miss Millican, until the early hours. After breakfast at the Arlington Hotel, he crossed a snowy Lafayette Square to the White House. One pictures the famous stride, described by a biographer as elemental, jungle-like. Pierpont was often taciturn in meetings. At the White House, obedient as a schoolboy, he sat wordless while Cleveland, Attorney General Olney, and Treasury Secretary Carlyle debated the issue. Edgy, he crushed an unlighted cigar, leaving a pile of tobacco on his pants. Cleveland still clung to the hope of a public bond issue, which would spare him congressional obloquy. Not until a clerk informed Carlyle that only nine million dollars in gold remained in government vaults on Wall Street did Pierpont pipe up, saying he knew of a ten million dollar draft about to be presented. If that ten million dollar draft is presented, you can't meet it, Pierpont said. It will be all over before three o'clock. What suggestions have you to make, Mr. Morgan? replied the President. Pierpont laid out an audacious scheme. The Morgan and Rothschild houses in New York and London would gather 3.5 million ounces of gold, at least half from Europe, in exchange for about $65 million worth of 30-year gold bonds. He also promised that gold obtained by the government wouldn't flow out again. This was the showstopper that mystified the financial world, a promise to rig, temporarily, the gold market. There was some question as to the legality of the proposed issue, and either Morgan or Carlyle dusted off an 1862 statute that granted the Lincoln administration emergency powers to buy gold during the Civil War. When the deal was concluded, Cleveland gave Pierpont a fresh cigar to replace the one he had nervously ground up. Pierpont's blood was now at full boil. He wired London, "'We consider situation critical.' Politicians appear to have absolute control. If fail and European negotiations abandoned, it is impossible overestimate what will be result U.S. Populist pressure still demanded a public bond issue. As a practical matter, Cleveland awaited congressional action on the Springer Bill, which would have allowed the Treasury to sell long-term bonds. If Congress defeated it, Cleveland thought he could then resort to Wall Street bankers with far less popular abuse. At the Tuesday morning meeting, it was agreed that Morgan and Belmont should return when the Springer Bill was killed. By the time it was defeated on Thursday evening, Pierpont was already en route to Washington, arriving in a blizzard. News of the Morgan-Rothschild operation was a sedative for the financial markets. When the syndicate bonds were offered, on February 20th, 1895, they sold out in two hours in London, in only twenty-two minutes in New York. Pierpont was jubilant and exhausted. You cannot appreciate the relief to everybody's mind, for the dangers were so great, scarcely anyone dared whisper them. Yet the syndicate was a victim of its success. It took up the bonds at one o four and a half then sold them at an opening price of one twelve and one quarter. They quickly soared to one nineteen. For the cynical, this sudden appreciation proved the syndicate had cheated the government and underpriced the issue. The interest rate of three and three quarters was thought extremely harsh. In just twenty-two minutes, the bankers had booked six or seven million dollars in profits. 
Morgan would later claim these figures were vastly exaggerated and that the syndicate had earned less than a 5% return. Even commentators such as Alan Nevins and Alexander Dana Noyes, otherwise sympathetic to the operation, condemned the stiff terms. Nonetheless, the bankers believed that they themselves had induced the confidence that had led to the higher prices. The populist uproar was furious and laced with anti-Semitism because of the Rothschild participation. Populist rabble-rouser Mary Lease called President Cleveland a tool of Jewish bankers and British gold. The New York World described the syndicate as a pack of blood-sucking Jews and aliens. In his vehement denunciation in Congress, William Jennings Bryan asked the clerk to read Shylock's Bond from The Merchant of Venice. Bryan always denied that his attacks pandered to anti-Semitism. Campaigning in 1896, he told Jewish Democrats in Chicago, Our opponents have sometimes tried to make it appear that we are attacking a race when we denounced the financial policy of the Rothschilds. But we are not. We are as much opposed to the financial policy of J. Pierpont Morgan as we are to the financial policy of the Rothschilds. The gold syndicate, alas, was just a temporary victory. Even Pierpont could dam up the gold supply for only so long. By the summer, gold again left the treasury in large amounts. When a new loan was raised in early 1896, Pierpont had a fresh scheme for a global syndicate which would include the National City Bank of New York, Deutsche Bank of Berlin, and Morgan Hargis of Paris. Perhaps to appease the anti-Semites, it was a syndicate of Christian bankers. But Cleveland didn't want to incite populist wrath a second time, and decided on a public loan, with Morgan taking only about half of a $67 million bond issue. Despite his venality, the gold operation had been a tour de force for Pierpont. He had functioned as America's central bank, stepping into the historic breach between Andrew Jackson's 1832 veto of the Second Bank of the United States and passage of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. So long as governments were financially weak, with primitive monetary methods and small budgets, they had to rely on private bankers. For his part, Grover Cleveland never regretted his decision, praising the lightning-like rapidity with which Pierpont Morgan reached his decision and extolling him as a man of clear-sighted, far-seeing patriotism. By stubbornly adhering to principle, Cleveland alienated small-town farm elements in his own party. In 1896, the Democrats rejected him in favor of William Jennings Bryan. For Bryan, Morgan was a Pontius pilot who nailed starving farmers to a cross of gold. The sheer savagery of these attacks contributed to the secretive, cautious style of the Morgan Bank, which in turn further fed popular fantasy about its power. During the 1896 presidential campaign, Pierpont lobbied for a gold standard plank in the Republican Party platform. He entertained Mark Hanna, Ohio banker and chairman of the Republican National Committee, aboard the Corsair II. Generous contributions by Morgan and other bankers to the campaign of William McKinley, 23 Wall Street was hung with banners in his support, were thought instrumental in persuading him to champion the gold standard, and in 1900 he signed a law bestowing upon it new legal status. The farmer-banker conflict subsided somewhat when a European wheat famine pushed up farm prices. Also, the Yukon gold rush and gold strikes in South Africa and Australia helped expand the U.S. money supply and led to higher prices. The bitter deflationary politics of the late 19th century subsided. In the 1890s, Pierpont Morgan represented a fact unpalatable to Americans that America was still financially dependent on Europe. As a debtor nation, the United States had to placate its creditors abroad. England exerted much the same influence over American economic policy as Japan would nearly a century later, when it financed much of the U.S. budget deficit in the 1980s. Like Japan, England was criticized for curbing homegrown American excesses. As Keynes noted, a debtor nation does not love its creditor, and it is fruitless to expect feelings of goodwill. The ill will descended upon the House of Morgan. Tutored in London finance, 
Pierpont knew that British bankers considered the pound's stability the basis of British wealth. In the 19th century, it was the currency every investor wanted to hold. Pierpont adopted the same attitude toward the dollar. Sound monetary policy in the United States would be a precondition of America's rise as the chief creditor nation. In the 1920s, by one of those ironies so abundant in Morgan annals, the bank would put England itself back on the gold standard, forcing a later British Prime Minister to suffer the same repudiation by his own party as Grover Cleveland experienced in 1895. In Pierpont Morgan's career, success often bred more controversy than acclaim, so the 20th century was his time of bittersweet triumph. Sleek and portly in top hat and black overcoat, gray slacks reaching the tops of shiny shoes, and a watch chain stretched across his paunch, he personified the new tycoon and the industrial gigantism threatening pastoral America. His exploits were rendered in mythic terminology. Life magazine produced a lasting catechism. Question. Who made the world, Charles? Answer. God made the world in 4004 B.C., but it was reorganized in 1901 by James J. Hill, J. Pierpont Morgan, and John D. Rockefeller. Finley Peter Dunn's character, Mr. Dooley, pictured Morgan this way. Pierpont Morgan calls in one of his office boys, the president of a national bank, and says he, James, he says, take some change out of the damper and run out and buy Europe for me. He says, I intend to reorganize it and put it on a paying basis. When Pierpont was quoted as saying, America is good enough for me, William Jennings Bryan's commoner snapped back, whenever he doesn't like it, he can give it back. Editorial writers competed to mint Morgan titles. King of Trusts, Morganizer of the World, Financial Titan, Napoleon of Finance, or, more simply, Zeus or Jupiter. For a Republican country lacking a feudal tradition, Morgan and other robber barons were ersatz aristocrats, their feats avidly chronicled by the press. The public reacted with fear and resentment, but also with some vicarious pleasure. When Pierpont brusquely ordered his chauffeur to bypass traffic and drive up on a curb, the public was shocked by his arrogance, but admiring of his implacable will. When Wall Street broker Henry Clues said of Morgan, he has the driving power of a locomotive, he suggested something brutish and uncontrollable, but also something of superhuman strength. Now the world's most powerful private banker, Pierpont regarded himself as a peer of royalty. With real munificence, he dispensed benefactions to the masses. Regretting the dark interior of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, he underwrote the expense of electric lighting. He visited the Kaiser aboard his yacht and advised King Leopold of Belgium on his finances. In 1901, Jack reported to his mother how his father and London partner Sir Clinton Dawkins went down to Gravesend and dined with the King of the Belgians, who wanted to see them about some business, and brought his yacht over because father would not go to Brussels. Pierpont did business on his own territory, even if it sometimes meant treating a king as a commoner. In 1906, Pierpont vouchsafed a private tour of his art collection at 13 Prince's Gate, the townhouse he inherited from his father, to King Edward VII. He had given the king financial advice, and the two often met at European watering holes. Gazing at Sir Thomas Lawrence's famous portrait of the Countess of Derby, the king said the ceiling was too low for the picture. "'Why do you hang it there?' he asked. "'Because I like it there, sir,' said Pierpont tersely, feeling no need to elaborate. His son-in-law, Herbert Satterley, noted a perfect equality between king and banker. "'They were just two friends together,' and seemed quite content to sit in silence sometimes and not try to entertain each other. As a coronation gift, Pierpont had given the king a $500,000 tapestry, which set off a long-lasting relationship between the House of Morgan and British royalty. Pierpont also pleased Italian royalty. In 1904, he was honored by Italy for returning a treasured cope that turned out to have been stolen from the Cathedral of Ascoli. 
King Victor Emmanuel conferred upon him the great cordon of Saints Mauritius and Lazarus, making him a cousin of His Majesty whenever he set foot on Italian soil. Even as Pierpont aspired to heaven, he made religious men think in earthly terms. After a 1905 audience, Pope Pius X breathed with regret, What a pity! I did not think of asking Mr. Morgan to give us some advice about our finances. The House of Morgan would later advise the papacy on its purchases of American stocks. As a rule, Pierpont didn't assemble palatial homes. In business as well, he showed surprisingly scant interest in real estate, which produced so many fortunes among his contemporaries. He would say laughingly that he only needed a place to live in and a lot in the cemetery, and his son Jack proudly confessed himself an ignoramus about land. Instead of grand estates, Pierpont had his solid but unpretentious Madison Avenue townhouse and his Hudson River retreat, Cragston, with its kennels, dairies, and gardens. The splendid exception was Camp Uncas, in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York, and that came to him only by accident. In 1898, a friend, architect William West Durant, defaulted on a loan and signed over the rustic camp as payment. Deep in the woods, Camp Uncas crouched beneath wooded cliffs that were thick with evergreens. It covered more than a thousand acres and required a year-round staff of thirty to care for the main lodge and dozens of outlying buildings. Durant had popularized such millionaire retreats in wilderness areas, producing the most lavish log cabins ever made. They had thick wooden posts, walk-in fireplaces, and heavy exposed beams. To lend a rustic woodland atmosphere, the furniture was nicked with axe scars and bark was left on the pine logs. Wool Indian blankets, moose heads, and prize fish decorated the walls. When Pierpont threw parties there, he would bring up a private railroad car full of friends, and a baggage car loaded with racks of vintage champagne would rattle along behind them. With his vagabond nature, Pierpont was too restless to be a member of the landed gentry. His splendor shone most fully at sea. As Commodore of the New York Yacht Club, he offered Morgan Cups for races and helped finance the Columbia, which defended the America's Cup. He even provided land for the Yacht Club's new headquarters on West 44th Street. Pierpont's boats, more impressive than his homes, were the real monuments to his wealth. In 1898, over his heated protest, the Navy conscripted Corsair II for use in the Spanish-American War. The Morgans had opposed the war, and Jack, later labeled a warmonger for his role in World War I, lamented the needless waste of life and property. The Navy paid Pierpont $225,000 for the ship and transformed it into the gunboat Gloucester. It saw action in the Battle of Santiago and was damaged by a Spanish shell. Pierpont kept a piece of the ship's splintered mast as a memento. Corsair III was an even more megalomaniacal affair, a modern pharaoh's tomb. Like a lover mourning his dead mistress, Pierpont had reproduced, at fantastic expense, the carpeting and other details of Corsair II. Measuring over three hundred feet at the waterline and requiring a crew of seventy, this black-hulled, ocean-going ship was built on an altogether new and more garish scale. Among its many details was a special humidor to freshen Pierpont's black eight-inch Meridiana Koinor cigars. He reveled in nautical spectacle. When he returned by liner from Europe, the Corsair would steam out to greet him as he waved his handkerchief from the larger ship's deck. By transferring to the Corsair, he could slip through quarantine without having to mingle with the liner's steerage passengers. Pierpont often slept aboard his yacht and took clients for sunset cruises. Sometimes, after entertaining friends at Cragston for the weekend, they would all steam back to Manhattan on a Sunday evening sleep on board, and then awake to a plentiful breakfast before disembarking. The Corsair was a therapeutic, if expensive, toy for Pierpont. He continued to slip into depressions that he couldn't shake, and his triumphs seemed only to deepen his gloom. The sea alone would lighten his mood. As Jack told his mother of one 1898 ocean voyage, J.P.M. has been so worried and bothered by the number of things on his mind 
and this annoyance of war rumor that it will be a great thing for him to have this voyage. Then if things calm down, he will come back for his ex-cure and get two more voyages. Those are the only things which really seem to do him any good. Though this may have been partly a cover story, Jack's way of shielding his mother from his father's growing number of affairs, it was also true that for Pierpont Morgan the sea was always his sovereign remedy. The dawning of the new century was accompanied by the first great wave of mergers in American history. Spurred by the telephone and telegraph and better transportation, local markets were newly interlaced in regional and national markets. And with American victory in the Spanish-American War, the attention of business also shifted from internal expansion to a global quest for markets. Driven by such changes in the economy, the number of mergers jumped from a modest 69 in 1897 to over 1,200 by 1899. So long as markets were local, industry seldom required large-scale financing, and there was a Wall Street and city bias against manufacturers as small-time businessmen. The Morgans had been mostly associated with railroad securities. As late as 1911, the second Baron Revelstoke of Barings could snobbishly protest, I confess that personally I have a horror of all industrial companies. Now, as the great merger wave gathered pace, the focus of elite Wall Street banks shifted from railroads to industrial trusts. In a trust, stockholders would trade their shares in constituent companies for the trust certificates of a super-holding company. After enacting a law that permitted one company to own another, New Jersey became the preferred state for trust incorporation. By 1901, these new corporate leviathans dominated a long list of industries, sugar, lead, whiskey, plate glass, wire nails, smelting, and coal. Wall Street bankers affected many of these industrial transformations, and their power swelled in tandem with their creations. Often, trusts were cobbled together from family-owned or closely held firms that had a visceral contempt for competitors joining the same trust. The bankers were the honest brokers who arbitrated the disputes among them. Since the bankers appraised the value of participating companies, they had to be fair. Since this appraisal was seldom accepted by everyone, they had to be stern. Most of all, they had to be trusted. The populace might dread the power of Pierpont Morgan, but he paid his bills promptly, always stuck by his word, and was almost universally respected among businessmen. He also saw competition as a destructive, inefficient force, and instinctively favored large-scale combination as the cure. Once, when the manager of the Moet and Chandon Wine Company complained about industry problems, Pierpont blithely suggested he buy up the entire Champagne country. In William McKinley, the business community had a Republican president who approved of consolidation and didn't interpose any bothersome antitrust obstacles. The genesis of United States Steel in 1901 was inseparable from this permissive regulatory mood, which followed the 1900 GOP landslide. With the defeat of William Jennings Bryan and his anti-imperialist, trust-busting supporters, the business community felt emboldened to try bigger things. A few weeks after the GOP's massive victory, Vice President Theodore Roosevelt invited Elihu Root, the Secretary of War, to attend a dinner in honor of Pierpont Morgan. "'I hope you can come to my dinner to J. Pierpont Morgan,' he wrote. "'You see, it represents an effort on my part to become a conservative man in touch with the influential classes, and I think I deserve encouragement.' This dinner preceded by a week the first discussions about U.S. steel, and must have reassured Pierpont that the McKinley administration would be supine in its attitude toward trusts. The inception of the steel trust is still debated. The more colorful versions attribute the idea to steel man John W. Betamillion Gates, who allegedly came up with it while shooting pool at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, then on Fifth Avenue at 34th Street. A former barbed wire salesman and stock market plunger, Gates was a stout, raffish-looking character, with a derby always tipped back on his head and a big cigar stuck in the corner of his mouth. He used to bet on the speed of raindrops running down a train window, 
and won his nickname from an enormous wager he once made on an English thoroughbred. Not content with an American steel trust, Gates wanted to include German manufacturers and attempt a global cartel. The more sober versions of U.S. steel trace the trust to a looming collision between Andrew Carnegie's steel company and two of Pierpont's steel creations, Federal Steel and National Tube. As the top manufacturer of crude steel, Carnegie decided in July 1900 to branch out into finished products, such as pipe and wire. As head of the second-largest steel group, Pierpont feared a replication of the railroad chaos, with overbuilding and price wars. He growled that Carnegie would demoralize the entire industry through competition. Bracing for a grim battle, he had his makers of finished products prepare to meet Carnegie head-on in crude steel. On December 12, 1990, a week after he was feted by Teddy Roosevelt, Pierpont attended a famous dinner held for Charles M. Schwab at the University Club in Manhattan. A handsome young man, with a long, smooth face, dark hair, and clear brow, Schwab was a faithful lieutenant of Andrew Carnegie's. Morgan sat at Schwab's right and stared at his plate as the young man delivered his after-dinner address. A mellifluous orator and self-dramatizing individual, he evoked for Morgan and the eighty other financiers present a vision of a steel trust which would handle all phases of the business, from mining ore to marketing steel products. The Carnegie and Morgan Steel Enterprises would be the trust's obvious nucleus. The steel trust was to be a superior sort of conspiracy. Through economies of scale, it would attempt to lower prices and compete in burgeoning world markets. It was a form of national industrial policy, albeit conducted by businessmen for private gain. After the dinner, Morgan, intrigued, conferred with Schwab for half an hour. As Morgan partner Robert Bacon later said, it was apparent that Morgan had seen a new light. It has never been clear whether Schwab acted at Carnegie's behest or whether he planned to recruit Pierpont first, then take the proposal to Carnegie. In any event, within three weeks, Morgan, Bacon, Gates, and Schwab worked out a proposal in an all-night session at Morgan's Black Library. The proposed trust would control more than half the steel business. Besides Carnegie Steel and Morgan's Federal Steel, it would include American Tin Plate, American Steel Hoop, American Sheet Steel, American Bridge, American Steel and Wire, National Tube, National Steel, Shelby Steel Tube, and Lake Superior Consolidated Mines. In forging U.S. steel, Pierpont had to deal with two industrialists who represented very different aspects of American business, Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. Both were hard-bitten individualists, scornful of bankers, who preferred to finance their operations from retained earnings. Rockefeller entered the deal through his ownership of ore mines and shipping companies on Lake Superior. Pierpont considered both men too crude for his stuffily refined tastes. They saw him as pompous and overbearing. The prudish Carnegie also disapproved of Pierpont's adulterous escapades. Carnegie frowned on anything savoring of the flesh and the devil, Schwab said. After the meeting in the Black Library, Schwab sounded out Carnegie on his willingness to sell his steel company to the trust. After a game of golf at St. Andrew's Golf Club in Westchester, Carnegie ruminated, then penciled his selling price, $480 million, on a scrap of paper. He wanted payment in bonds, not watered stock. When Schwab delivered the slip of paper to Morgan, the banker stared at it and said promptly, I accept this price. In the hurly-burly, Pierpont didn't formalize the deal with a signature and weeks later had to send a lawyer uptown with the contract. Despite his veneration of Junius Morgan, Carnegie enjoyed petty jousting with Pierpont. When Pierpont invited him to 23 Wall Street, Carnegie insisted that Morgan come to his own 51st Street office instead. After a cool 15-minute chat, Morgan said in parting, Mr. Carnegie, I want to congratulate you on being the richest man in the world. Thin-skinned and vindictive, Carnegie gloated over the deal. Pierpont feels that he can do anything because he has always got the best of the Jews in Wall Street. It takes a Yankee to beat a Jew and it takes a Scot to beat a Yankee.
Carnegie celebrated too quickly. He later admitted to Morgan that he had sold out too cheap by $100 million. Not about to spare the industrialists' feelings, Morgan replied, Very likely, Andrew. In trying to coax recalcitrant companies into the steel trust, Pierpont showed his ringmaster's flair for cracking the whip. He was irate with those who tried to extract undue advantage. During negotiations at 23 Wall, one major holdout was Betamillion Gates and his American Steel and Wire. To break a deadlock, Pierpont materialized like the wrath of God and thumped a desk. Gentlemen, I am going to leave this building in ten minutes. If by that time you have not accepted our offer, the matter will be closed. We will build our own wire plant. His bluff called, Gates capitulated and sold out. Pierpont then went home, boyishly elated. The House of Morgan generally didn't sponsor new companies and abhorred stock speculation. Junius Morgan had long ago advised his son, I would recommend your forming a resolution never to buy any stock on speculation. So Pierpont's promotion of U.S. Steel in early 1901 lent old money cachet to the rage for trusts. The year 1901 was not unlike 1929 or 1987. The stock market was on everybody's lips. Daily share volume tripled. Wall Street seers babbled of a new age, and newspapers recounted tales of hotel waiters, business clerks, doormen, and dressmakers who made fortunes on Wall Street. U.S. Steel stoked the bonfire of speculation. At a time when million-dollar issues were considered large, the new corporation was capitalized at a whopping $1.4 billion, $23 billion in 1989 dollars, the first billion-dollar corporation in history. At the time, all U.S. manufacturing combined had only $9 billion in capitalization. To manage the flood of bonds and stock that financed the deal, Pierpont mustered a monster syndicate of 300 underwriters. He appointed ace stock manipulator James R. Keene, a sharp-faced man with a pointed beard, known as the Silver Fox of Wall Street, to make a market in the shares. By simultaneously buying and selling shares, Keene created steadily rising prices and the illusion of tremendous volume. Despite predictions that so much stock would saturate the market, the issue's success confirmed the boast of Morgan partner George W. Perkins that a Morgan issue from the desert of Sahara would find buyers. For its services, the syndicate took in $57.5 million in stock, nearly $1 billion in 1989 dollars. The U.S. Steel promotion made explicit the marriage of finance and industry that marked the baronial age. When four Morgan partners joined the new trust's board, the marriage was consummated. For many observers, the sheer size of U.S. Steel seemed sinister and unnatural. Even the Wall Street Journal admitted to uneasiness over the magnitude of the affair. Among others, Yale President Arthur Hadley, a noted economist, saw a new need for federal control of large corporations. Ray Stannard Baker, later Woodrow Wilson's biographer, pointed out that the new corporation would have revenues and expenses exceeding the budgets of all but a few world governments. Yet Wall Street was heedless of the critics and celebrated with a record volume of trading. In January 1901, the big board traded a record two million shares in one day. After the launching of U.S. Steel that spring, volume reached three million shares. Wall Street was so awash in shares that the stock exchange declared a special holiday just to catch up on paperwork. An unending controversy would surround U.S. Steel. Was it Pierpont's greatest deal, as he believed, or a giant scam? The share flotation made multimillionaires of dozens of steel men, and the spectacle of so much sudden wealth appalled the public. In 1905, Charles Schwab, U.S. Steel's first president, built a 75-room mansion on Manhattan's Riverside Drive, complete with a pipe organ, art gallery, bowling alley, private chapel, and 60-foot swimming pool. Gaudy mansions went up all over Pittsburgh with the new steel money, symbolizing a new class of nouveau riche industrialists. 
Later, the U.S. Bureau of Corporations, a federal agency set up by Teddy Roosevelt, would value U.S. steel at only half its $1.4 billion selling price, suggesting that investors had purchased an enormous bag of hope, at least half of it hot air. From Vanderbilt, Morgan had learned the trick of basing value not on current assets, but on projected earnings. U.S. Steel's subsequent history provided evidence for both detractors and admirers. From an opening price of 38, its stock zoomed to 55, only to skid to less than 9 during the rich man's panic of 1903. By January 1904, U.S. Steel couldn't even cover its dividends. Yet it is fair to say that in time the enterprise expanded to the contours of Morgan's vision, becoming America's foremost steel company. It amply rewarded its investors, at least the patient ones. Behind the growing pomp of Pierpont Morgan lay an ever-present vulnerability. If tragedy, as Aristotle said, has the power to arouse fear and pity, then Pierpont wore a tragic mask. In 1903, Pierpont sat for two minutes as Edward Steichen snapped the famous photograph of him. From deep shadow and gripping the blade-like chair, Pierpont stares out, a tense crease between his brows, his collar stiff, his eyes pitiless points of lights, the gaze legendary in its terror. Steichen tried to make him turn, but Pierpont, self-conscious about his nose, stared straight ahead. The photographer snapped him bristling with anger. Pierpont hated the photo and tore up the first prints. Yet there was sadness as well as fire in the eyes, volcanic energy in despair. The photograph captured the man whole. When Pierpont later relented and offered to pay a stratospheric $5,000 for the photo, the wounded Steichen took two years to deliver copies. The blazing eyes were linked to the grotesque nose. As the years went by, the acne rosacea made Pierpont's nose monstrous in size and hideous in shape. The nose was invariably touched up in official photographs, perhaps adding to the shock of those who saw him in person. Of his initial encounter with Wall Street's Cyrano, art dealer Joseph Duveen wrote, No nose in caricature ever assumed such gigantic proportions or presented such appalling excrescences. If I did not gasp, I might have changed color. Morgan noticed this, and his small, piercing eyes transfixed me with a malicious stare. Many anecdotes link Morgan's nose with his short temper, an old story of the vanity of the mighty. He would furiously avenge taunts, and one writer said he never recovered from the phrase, a ruby-visaged magnate. When Betamillion Gates dubbed him Liver Nose, the jest proved costly. Pierpont blackballed Gates from the Union League and New York Yacht Clubs. About his nose, Pierpont could be more sensitive than he was about his trusts. After the newspapers of clubmate Joseph Pulitzer attacked his business dealings, Pierpont complained to the newspaper man not about the allegations, but about the prominence of his nose in the paper's cartoons, which he thought very unfair. Everybody came to terms with the nose differently. Lady Victoria Sackville West, probably Pierpont's last mistress, recorded in her diary in 1912, I have never met anyone so attractive. One forgets his nose entirely after a few minutes. Perhaps intimates did, but not rival businessmen, and children found it scarily hypnotic. When a later partner, Dwight Morrow, brought Pierpont to his home, his wife Betty, having warned the children not to mention the nose, asked the tycoon, Do you like nose in your tea, Mr. Morgan? Pierpont tried everything to cure it, including an electrical remedy recommended by England's Queen Alexandra. But it persisted, like nature's revenge, reminding him of his humanity. In philosophic moments, he converted it into a mark of pride. When the Russian minister of finance, Count Vita, suggested surgery, he replied, Everybody knows my nose. It would be impossible for me to appear on the streets of New York without it. Still more grandly, he said his nose was part of the American business structure. It was probably the nose that made Pierpont eager to hire handsome young men, and he often sent pedigreed collie puppies as a sign of impending partnerships. 
Over time, the early reputation of Morgan Partners as harried technicians caught in the grinding machinery of railroad reorganizations gave way to another equally pronounced tradition, the Morgan Partner as elegant fashion plate, suave member of the social register catering to rich clients. A homely man had no chance of being selected a Morgan Partner, wrote an early Pierpont biographer. The same could be said, with a few exceptions, of the bank under his son Jack. The prototype was Robert Bacon, taken on as partner in 1894, after J. Hood Wright died suddenly. As soon as Bacon was hired, his former boss, Major Henry Lee Higginson, warned him, Don't overwork like Coster just because you can and like to do it. He is wonderful and unwise to do so. Trim and athletic, with a strong, wide face and debonair mustache, Bacon was called the Greek god on Wall Street. As a Harvard undergraduate and classmate of Teddy Roosevelt's, he boxed, ran the hundred-yard dash, captained the football team, was president of the glee club, and was number seven on the university crew team and model man of his class. His presence at the corner of Broad and Wall inaugurated a new image for the Morgan partners. With Bacon in mind, a novelist wrote, When the angels of God took unto themselves wives among the daughters of men, the result was the Morgan partners. Pierpont doted on Bacon and wanted him constantly by his side. It was said Morgan had fallen in love with Bacon and rejoiced in his presence. Bacon's elevation in the bank signaled a problem with the Morgan empire. Bacon, a charming lightweight, reflected Pierpont's fear of hiring commanding figures. That Bacon was second in command spoke poorly of his boss's managerial judgment. Art critic Roger Fry saw Morgan as a vain, insecure despot who likes to be in a position of being surrounded by people he has in his power to make and unmake. The most talented early partners, the apostles of Pierpontifex Maximus, or Jupiter's Ganymedes, as they were called, might have been legal and financial wizards, but they were not leaders. Since they were few in number, New York had six partners in the 1890s, the Philadelphia office four, they had to pull enormous weight. The danger of Pierpont's despotism was glaringly exposed during the so-called Northern Pacific Corner of 1901, perhaps the most controversial takeover fight in American history. After U.S. Steel was successfully launched, Pierpont had sailed to France, where he entertained a dark French countess on the Riviera, leaving the firm in Bacon's hands. Since Coster's death the year before, Bacon knew he was in over his head and reeled under the responsibility. "'My life is simply engrossed in this maelstrom,' he told his wife. He was soon blindsided by the most powerful Wall Street combination outside that of the Morgan firms an amalgam of Edward H. Harriman, William Rockefeller, the National City Bank, and Kuhn Loeb. It was a ganging up of Pierpont's most determined enemies. A battle had been brewing since 1895, when Pierpont decided not to reorganize the bankrupt Union Pacific, which he scoffed at as two streaks of iron rust across the plains. His willingness to write off America's southwestern states provided an opening for outsiders, Edward Harriman took up the Union Pacific and merged it with the Southern Pacific. He and his bankers, the Jewish house of Kuhn Loeb, dominated the southwestern roads as invincibly as Morgan did those of the East and the Northwest. The Northern Pacific Corner was the thunderous, head-on crash of the railroad systems under the personal dominion of Harriman and Morgan. Harriman was a very different type from Pierpont. He was short and bandy-legged, had shifty eyes, and wore wire-rimmed spectacles, an unkempt mustache, and a peevish expression. Like many on Wall Street, he was the son of a poor clergyman and an unabashed social climber. A crack shot, he had a taste for blood sport, and played tough on the stock exchange as well. Where Pierpont preferred backroom deals sealed with a handshake, Harriman was a market operator, more a raider than a deal-maker. Where Pierpont usually served as proxy for bondholders, Harriman preferred to buy common stock and exert direct control. Finally, where Morgan was the establishment figure, Harriman was an embittered outsider who showed the damage that could be done by a bright man barred from Pierpont's club.
If bankers proved they could dominate companies through voting trusts and other devices, Harriman showed that the stock raider could dominate both the bankers and their companies. Harriman's banker was the German-born Jacob Schiff, the unbending, white-bearded patriarch of Kuhn Loeb, who was second only to Pierpont as a financial railroad overlord. Schiff was such a grandee that one private Pullman car was seldom enough for him when he traveled. He was stiff and formal, and as haughty as Pierpont Morgan himself. Like the London merchant bankers, the early Jewish bankers on Wall Street had started out as dry goods merchants. The Lehmans began as Alabama cotton brokers, Goldman as the owner of a Pennsylvania clothing store, Kuhn and Loeb as Cincinnati clothiers, and Lazard in a New Orleans dry goods business. These firms were dynastic, with only blood or marriage securing partnerships. They worked in the interstices left by the big Christian houses and dealt more directly in markets than the Morgans did. Markets were considered coarse by fancy Gentile bankers. So Goldman Sachs specialized in commercial paper, Lehman in commodity trading. Around 1900, they began underwriting shares for companies that were spurned by the Gentile firms as too lowly, retail stores and textile manufacturers, for instance. Among them was Sears Roebuck, introduced by Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers in 1906. Of such relatively small issues, the Gentile firms would sniff, let the Jews have that one, snobbery for which they paid dearly in the twentieth century. Schiff didn't want to settle for the scraps left to the Jews. Alone among the Jewish bankers, he had the gumption to play the grand game and contest Morgan in government issues and railroad financing. He funneled German and French money into American shares no less expertly than Pierpont did with British money. Much of Kuhn Loeb's exceptional power derived from the fact that it voted stock shares in American railroads as proxy for legions of German investors. Morgan referred to Schiff dismissively as that foreigner. Schiff, in turn, professed to admire Morgan, but his compliments sometimes had a slightly hollow, envious ring. After Pierpont's heroic role in the 1907 panic, Schiff said, Probably no one could have got the banks to act together as he did, in his autocratic way. Political, ethnic, and religious differences among bankers permeated Wall Street in the early 1900s. The Yankee-Jewish banking split was the most important fault line in American high finance. And since the two groups would come to dominate American investment banking, their feuds form a recurring theme in the Morgan banking saga. Pierpont's anti-Semitism was well known. Said an early biographer, he had a deep-seated anti-Semitic prejudice and on more than one occasion needlessly antagonized great Jewish banking firms. His dislike of Jews may have been sharpened by dealings with the Rothschilds. The Jewish tycoon Joseph Seligman noted Pierpont's freeze-and-thaw attitude toward him, which he attributed to his discomfort with Jews. During thaws, the two men collaborated on issues, and when Seligman was barred from a fashionable Saratoga hotel, the Morgan Bank signed an advertisement protesting the exclusion. In addition, Kuhn Loeb, in particular, managed many syndicates with the Morgans. The strain of anti-Semitism running through the Morgan story is fascinating precisely because it had to be so carefully suppressed. The group making common cause with Harriman and Schiff against Morgan in 1901 was the Rockefellers. In 1881, John D. Rockefeller had financed the Standard Oil Trust from its huge cash reserves, staying free of Wall Street. As the 1880s progressed, Standard Oil was generating so much cash that the Rockefellers looked about for a financial repository. They chose the National City Bank, the forerunner of today's Citibank, and pumped in so much money that by 1893 it ranked as New York's largest bank. It was a significant development. At a time when bankers tightened their grip on industry, here was an industrial empire fastening its grip on banking. National City became known as the Oil Bank, much as J.P. Morgan & Company would be called the Steel Bank. National City Bank's president, James Stillman, with his coldly alert and penetrating eyes, would oppose Pierpont in the Northern Pacific battle, but become a close ally later on. 
Two of Stillman's daughters married two of William Rockefeller's sons, sealing the union of the Rockefellers with the National City Bank. The Northern Pacific quarrel began when Northwestern Railroad magnate James J. Hill decided to buy a Midwestern road called the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. Hill was a garrulous man with a bushy, white, untamed beard, shoulder-length hair, and a troll's face. With Morgan's help, he had consolidated the Great Northern and Northern Pacific into a railroad system that dominated transport in the northwestern United States. The purchase of the CB&Q, Harriman feared, would provide Hill with an entree into Chicago and a possible connection for a transatlantic line. It might even link up with Morgan's New York Central. Schiff and Harriman pleaded with Hill and Morgan for a stake in the road, but were rebuffed. Harriman said implacably, Very well. It is a hostile act, and you must take the consequences. In a manner that anticipated mergers of the 1980s, Schiff and Harriman decided to swallow the railroad that had swallowed the CB&Q, the Northern Pacific. The Northern Pacific ran west from Wisconsin through North Dakota and Montana, terminating in Seattle, Washington. Schiff, torn between dreams of glory and dread of Morgan, passed a sleepless night before acceding to Harriman's plan. It was an extraordinary act of Les Majesty, because the House of Morgan had a substantial stake in the Northern Pacific and wouldn't tolerate such an attack. The raiders went into the market secretly, buying up $78 million in Northern Pacific shares, at the time the largest such market operation in history. As share prices rose in April 1901, Pierpont credited it to the bullish tone of stocks set by the launching of U.S. Steel. Schiff cunningly circulated rumors that the rise reflected Northern Pacific's enhanced value after the CB&Q purchase. When a block of shares came into Robert Bacon's hands, he gladly sold. Even the railroad's board sold. It was a masterly con job by Harriman's forces, camouflaged by the ebullient financial markets that followed McKinley's re-election. The newspapers noted that many young men about town with newfound stock market fortunes were now calling themselves financiers. At the same time, many investors, apprehensive about the giddy market activity, predicted a general panic. Then, in May, Northern Pacific stock shot up so fast it seemed to levitate. Hill, who had been beguiled by Bacon's beauty, was troubled by bad dreams. Asleep in his private railroad car in Seattle, he was visited by a dark-complected angel who warned of trouble in New York. Hill raced clear across America to Wall Street. On Saturday, May 4th, he alerted Bacon to what he saw as a catastrophe in the making. They cabled Pierpont, now in aix les bains and awaited instructions. At this point, the Harriman Schiff forces were 40,000 shares short of majority control of the Northern Pacific. That Saturday morning, Harriman ordered Kuhn Loeb to buy the needed stock, but Jacob Schiff was attending services at Temple Emanuel, and the order never got executed. The lapse was fateful, for the next day Pierpont told Bacon to purchase 150,000 shares at any price. That Monday morning, Morgan brokers spanned out across the exchange floor, and insane trading in Northern Pacific ensued. The jumps in the stock were staggering. On Tuesday, May 7th, the stock closed at over 143, a gain of 70 points in three days. The next day, it shot up to 200. This was a corner, a bloody trap for speculators. Speculators kept shorting the stock, that is, selling borrowed shares in the belief that the bubble would pop and enable them to buy back the shares at a cheaper price. Instead, the Northern Pacific geyser kept rising, forcing them to liquidate shares of other companies to pay for their borrowed Northern Pacific shares. Hence, the problem was generalized to the entire stock market. By Wednesday, almost every stock on the exchange was crashing, with money sucked from the rest of the list to feed the spectacularly surging Northern Pacific. Then came Thursday, May 9th, and the biggest market crash in a century. Northern Pacific zoomed up as much as 200 or 300 points per trade, finally hitting 1,000. Then it dropped 400 points on a single trade. 
The exchange was a scene of wild pandemonium, as speculators found it impossible to locate certificates to cover short sales. The New York Times reported, Brokers acted like insane men. Big men lightly threw little men aside, and the little men, fairly crying with indignation, jumped anew into the fray, using hands and arms, elbows, feet, anything to gain their point. To the spectators in the distant gallery of the produce exchange, it was something incomprehensible, almost demonic, this struggle, this babble of voices, these wild-eyed, excited brokers selling and buying, buying and selling. When brokers appeared with Northern Pacific certificates, they were clawed at by men who feared they would be ruined without them. One broker hired a train from Albany just to deliver one certificate of 500 shares. Amid this free-for-all, Pierpont Morgan regained control of the Northern Pacific, but at the price of a full-blown panic. It was the madly destructive act of an egotist bent on winning at any cost. The carnage ended when a new Morgan partner, George Perkins, acting with Schiff and Harriman, announced that short sellers would be allowed to buy up shares at only $150 a share. Had the action not been taken, more than half the brokerage houses on Wall Street might have gone belly up. It had been a pageant of extreme cupidity, one that sparked public apprehension about the omnipotent new financial magnates. The New York Herald banner headline of May 9, 1901, summed up the popular view. Giants of Wall Street, in fierce battle for mastery, precipitate crash that brings ruin to horde of pygmies. The devil-angel nature of Pierpont Morgan was such that he alone started and stopped panics. He often appeared to be two different people of identical appearance but contrasting personalities. Comically, at the panic's height, a New York Times reporter found a forlorn investor named Jefferson M. Levy at the Waldorf Astoria. Levy sighed, If Mr. Morgan had been here, this never would have happened. Pierpont brooked no criticism of his role in the Northern Pacific. Appearing at the Morgan Harges offices in Paris, he said with baronial bluntness, I owe the public nothing. The closest he ever came to an explanation was a reiteration of the gentleman banker's code. I feel bound in honor when I reorganize a property, and am morally responsible for its management to protect it, and I generally do protect it. Yet his power on Wall Street was now such that like a female elephant charging to protect her young, he couldn't help but crush innocent bystanders. He was too large for the flimsy regulatory structures that encased him. He had outgrown his age. Coming after the U.S. Steel promotion, the Northern Pacific Corner reinforced the view that the public was being held hostage by the stock manipulations of a few Wall Street moguls. For the most part, President McKinley was deaf to such outrage. Then, on September 6, 1901, he was shot by an anarchist named Leon Cholgos as he stood in the Temple of Music at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo. We have graphic descriptions of Pierpont's reaction to the news. He was about to leave 23 Wall Street for the evening and already had on his silk hat when a New York Times reporter rushed in with the report. What? said Pierpont seizing the man's arm. He stared into his eyes, overcome with amazement. Then he slumped into a desk chair, awaiting the confirmation that soon came by telephone. This is sad, sad, very sad news, he told the Times reporter. Other accounts describe him as red-faced and almost reeling with shock. McKinley's assassination would be a turning point in Pierpont Morgan's life for it installed in the presidency 42-year-old Theodore Roosevelt, a man whose view of big business was far more ambivalent than his predecessors. Jack Morgan was mildly hopeful about the new president, although T.R.'s noisy chatter had grated on him after the March inauguration. What I fear is that he may perhaps talk too much, which would be very undesirable, he said. In fact, the presidency of Teddy Roosevelt would mark the start of periodic warfare between the White House and the House of Morgan, warfare that would rage through three straight presidencies, those of Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson. 
Two months after McKinley's assassination, the feuding parties of the Northern Pacific Corner made their peace. They set up a holding company, the Northern Securities Company, which merged the Northern Pacific, Great Northern, and CB&Q lines. Both Hill and Harriman were given seats on the board. If this brought peace between the two most important groups on Wall Street, it also heightened public alarm that a railroad monopoly had taken hold west of the Mississippi. And it will be much easier for them to obtain the second half than it was the first, said one newspaper editor, foreseeing a subsequent eastern rail monopoly. One railroad after another will slide gently into their grasp until any passenger anywhere who objects to traveling on their lines can take a trolley car or walk. The dreams of the architects of northern securities went beyond the most vivid populist fear. After tying up transcontinental railroads, they planned to link them with steamship lines to Asia, a vision that later would culminate in Edward Harriman's plans for an around-the-world transportation network. Pierpont, meanwhile, meditated on a railship monopoly of the North Atlantic, extending his domain beyond the borders of the United States. Wall Street increasingly gazed abroad. Besides bankrupting thousands of investors, the Northern Pacific Corner claimed a last casualty, Morgan partner Robert Bacon. Although he remained at 23 Wall for another year and a half, his nerves were shot by the strain. On doctor's orders, he rode to Hounds for two years, a very Morgan form of therapy. When he returned to the United States from his travel abroad, he occupied a series of positions, Assistant Secretary of State, Secretary of State, and Ambassador to France, of a far less taxing nature than being Chief Lieutenant to J. Pierpont Morgan. Chapter 6 Trust Assigned to J. S. Morgan and Company in London in 1898, Jack Morgan, now thirty-one, was a lonely prince in exile. Tall and broad-shouldered, he was a husky young man with a broad face, a direct gaze, a black mustache, and prominent nose that never assumed the gross proportions of his father's. From afar, Jack watched the epical events unfolding in New York, the formation of U.S. Steel and the cornering of Northern Pacific, with a vague yearning. He may have felt his date with destiny had been continually rescheduled. While conceding London's pleasures, he complained to his mother, "'When I think of home, the time does seem a bit long.' He grumbled how profoundest peace reigned at 22 Old Broad Street, while everything was jumping about at 23 Wall Street. Worst of all, he had to watch Pierpont turn the spotlight of his favor on Robert Bacon." At first, Jack's stay in London was meant to be temporary, but it took a few years before tangled personnel problems at J.S. Morgan & Company were straightened out. In 1897, Pierpont's brother-in-law, Walter Hayes Burns, died and was replaced by Jack's cousin, Walter Spencer Morgan Burns. The senior Burns's death left the London bank short of experienced hands. Young Walter's sister Mary married Lewis Harcourt, the first Viscount Harcourt, spawning a branch of British Morgans, who were lineal descendants of Junius Morgan. From this blue-blooded lineage would spring Lord William Harcourt, a post-war Morgan Grenfell chairman. A photograph of Pierpont at a house party at the Harcourt estate, Newnham Park, in 1902, shows Mary Harcourt seated next to King Edward VII. During his London exile, which lasted until 1905, Jack often seemed embarrassed by his remoteness from Pierpont. To inquiries as to whether Pierpont would attend Edward VII's coronation, he confessed sheepishly, "'He is not easy to keep track of, and I have almost given up.' In the end, Teddy Roosevelt made Jack a special attaché to the Westminster Abbey coronation. Once, when Jack wished to join his father for a naval pageant at Spithead, he lamented that Pierpont will probably not think of asking us. He was often excluded from business deals and had to read about the U.S. Steel Trust in the newspapers. Pierpont liked Jack, but found him lacking in fire and grit, which only accentuated Jack's insecurities. When Pierpont sailed from London in 1899, 
Jack wrote his mother how things couldn't proceed in New York in Pierpont's absence. He added, I only hope it will never come to that with me. Probably it won't, owing to the fact that things always will move on without me. The scope of Pierpont's business ventures was too vast to allow for a son's self-doubt to be of concern, and the problem was exacerbated by Jack's not being as bright or as forceful as his father. Another son might have rebelled. Jack sulked and pined, waiting for approval. Like Junius, he worried perpetually about Pierpont's work binges and imprudent appetite, and was steadily watchful of him. He described with whimsical humor the sight of his father playing dominoes with Mary Burns. It is too funny to see father and Aunt Mary gravely sitting down to play that imbecile game. He also saw his father's vanity, noting how after one good deed he was simply too pleased with himself. Jack also spied Pierpont's inner pain, his secret well of loneliness. He is very well and jolly by bits, but sometimes I see he feels as lonely as I do, and he looks as glum as if he hadn't a friend in the world. Considering that Jack was also cheering up his mother, a partially deaf, sickly woman abandoned by Pierpont for months at a time, one finds admirable his capacity for even-handed empathy and tender solicitude toward both parents. Jack's fatalistic acceptance of the London years was eased somewhat by a show of generosity from Pierpont. When Jack arrived in 1898, his father gave him and his wife, Jessie, the use of Thirteen Princes Gate. Pierpont added Fourteen Princes Gate to the property and joined the two townhouses. The original house now had the magnificence of a great museum and was resplendent with oils by Velasquez, Rubens, Rembrandt, and Turner. Export duties kept Pierpont from taking the collection to America. Jack also used Dover House, Junius's country estate at Roehampton, with its Jersey cattle and old-fashioned dairy. Ecstatic at this fatherly attention, Jack told his mother, "'He has been dear to us ever since we landed, most thoughtful of everything, and immensely interested in Jesse's social career. I know he has much enjoyed our being in the house, for it must have been very lonely for him, with no one there, and we have not hampered him at all, or bothered him with responsibilities. In 1901, Pierpont gave Jack a Christmas gift, an amount of money so large that he bought a portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds with just part of it. Yet Jack and his family found life amid such splendor a shade overwhelming. Every evening, whether Pierpont was in Europe or not, the domestic staff would place periodicals and warm milk beside the master's bed and adjust his reading lamp. And with the townhouse full of so many fragile masterpieces, the housekeeper just didn't dust on days when she felt jittery. Jessie took pride that nothing was broken, but the Morgan children, who now numbered two boys and two girls, found the need for self-control in their play stifling. Later, the children are called family prayers, reading Thackeray and Trollope, strolling in Hyde Park, everything but fun at Prince's Gate. In 1901, Jack rented Aldenham Abbey, a 300-acre country estate in Hertfordshire, stocked with pheasant and Southdown sheep, said to rival the kings in quality. Jack had a British gentleman's taste for solid country comforts. After buying the abbey in 1910, he restored its original name, Wall Hall. Landscaped by Humphrey Repton, the estate included a turreted house with fake ruins, a conservatory full of tropical plants, and a library that resembled a college chapel. In the Anglophile Morgan world, Pierpont's Dover House staff would meet Jack's Wall Hall crew for cricket matches. The Morgans counterbalanced this Britishness with American touches, for instance by shipping New York State pip and apples to the London partners. For Jack, the London years were passed in a gilded cage. He had many friends from merchant banking families and worked out at Sandow's gym with Eric Hambro. As neighbors, there were Earl Grey and Florence Nightingale. For occasional dinner companions, Rudyard Kipling, Henry James, Sir James Barry, and Mark Twain. Most of all, he had Jessie, a beautiful round-faced woman with pale golden hair, a fair complexion, and smoky blue eyes. Although she had gone to England grudgingly, 
Its society soon reminded her of Boston's, and she became a confirmed Anglophile. She hoped that one of her two sons, Junius Spencer, Jr., born in 1892, or Henry Sturgis, born in London in 1900, would marry an American and the other a British woman. They both ended up marrying Americans. Jesse Morgan didn't believe in an outside education for girls, and her daughters, Jane and Frances, were tutored at Wall Hall. They never set foot in a formal schoolroom. Jack held that a university education reduced a young woman's femininity, so college was also out of the question. The girls weren't allowed to talk to strangers on steamers or in public places, and later saw their upbringing as a suffocating round of social duties. Jesse and Jack Morgan's marriage was so all-encompassing and so absorbing as to exclude their own children at times. Jesse would not only rule Jack's estates with crisp managerial efficiency, but she would guide her husband, advise him, and support him emotionally. Having watched the chill descend upon his parents' marriage, and been conditioned by a confessional intimacy with his mother, Jack established a marriage that would be the exact opposite of his father's. Philandering, for instance, was one Morgan tradition he would not perpetuate. Jack's London stay had immense advantages for the House of Morgan. England would be Jack's second home, and he grew as tearfully patriotic as any British subject. In 1900, after watching Queen Victoria ride by, he said, "'That wonderful little old woman in black and sables with the big spectacles means so much to so many. She represents in a current form so much of the past that it is very thrilling to see her driving through the crowd.'" During the Boer War, he stood in a cheering throng before the mansion house after Ladysmith, under siege by the Boers for four months, had been relieved by British troops. Amid a fanfare of silver trumpets, he heard the new King Edward VII proclaimed at St. James' Palace. He always loved British pageantry. Jack and Jesse were received into social circles that were closed to most American industrialists of the era. On February 21, 1898, Jack trooped along in sword and cocked hat as Jesse was presented in the throne room of Buckingham Palace. Bedecked in glittering jewels and black robes, Queen Victoria presided in solemn state while Jesse came forward in diamond tiara and obligatory ostrich feathers. The London Daily Mail later gushed in describing her beauty and her white satin train trimmed with blue velvet and pink roses. The Morgans also befriended the vivacious Lady Sybil Smith and her husband, Vivian Hugh Smith. Lady Sybil took them to Windsor Castle to meet her mother, Lady Antrim, a lady-in-waiting, who gave them a private showing of the Queen's Holbein and Leonardo drawings. Almost without realizing it, Jack was forging connections that would provide the Morgans with a unique entree into the society of British nobility and politicians. As a microcosm of the Anglo-American alliance, the House of Morgan would faithfully reflect its internal power shifts. If the New York office basked in London's glory after the Civil War, the situation was reversed in the new century, with J. S. Morgan and Company participating increasingly in issues that originated in New York. Much of the London capital came from Pierpont, who by the early 1900s was pocketing anywhere from one-half to three-quarters of the annual profits booked at 22 Old Broad Street. The London House reflected some of Pierpont's rambunctious spirit. Pierpont's first biographer, Carl Hovey, wrote, Inside the office there is always a marked amount of bustle and confusion, contrasting with the sedate atmosphere of the typical London institutions surrounding it. Pierpont was just egalitarian enough to stop the practice of clerks bowing in his presence. Although the Morgans were the darlings of the British establishment, the relationship would always be fraught with tension, less a love affair than a tense jockeying for power. The British could never figure out whether Pierpont and company were allies or the first wave of a barbarian horde. Wall Street was gaining on the city in the fight for financial supremacy with the Morgans overtaking the Barings and Rothschilds. In London, the resuscitated Barings are the only people nearly in the same rank with us, said Sir Clinton Dawkins, a new partner of J.S. Morgan and Company, in 1901. In the U.S., they are nowhere now, a mere cipher, and the U.S. is going to dominate in most ways. 
To combat the Yankee upstarts, Barings and Rothschilds, the great 19th century rivals, became less antagonistic toward each other. During the Boer War, the British government, its gold depleted, turned to Rothschilds in London and Morgans in New York to raise exchequer bonds. When Pierpont initially balked, the British Treasury brought in Barings as well, adding to his displeasure. Sir Clinton Dawkins called the Chancellor, Hicks Beach, notoriously stupid and most unbusinesslike. The Boer War financing of 1900 had disquieting effects in the city. J. S. Morgan's new office manager, Edward C. Grenfell, noted dismay in London when half of the issue was scheduled for New York. Where Junius had accommodated the Rothschilds, Pierpont defied them, secretly demanding a higher commission on the issue, blackmail to which Britain reluctantly acceded. On the 1902 issue, the Rothschilds unsuccessfully tried to freeze Morgan from the syndicate. From then on, Grenfell, with grim triumph, would note in his journal the mounting ascendancy of the House of Morgan over the House of Rothschild. With the 1901 creation of U.S. Steel, British financiers were unnerved by Pierpont's daring. The New York Times said they were appalled by the magnitude of the American steel combination, and the London Chronicle termed the trust little less than a menace to the commerce of the civilized world. Among other things, formation of the trust heralded an export boom of U.S. products to Europe, which would sharpen commercial rivalry between the two. Around this time, too, Pierpont took a controversial interest in proposals to electrify underground and surface rail lines in London. New tube lines were being built as inner-city congestion required new building in London's outskirts. Pierpont competed to finance an underground line running from Hammersmith through Piccadilly and into the city. By taking over tube financing, Pierpont also hoped to generate business for two companies in which he had a stake, British Thompson Houston and Siemens Brothers. Eventually, he lost the underground financing to a syndicate headed by Chicago tycoon Charles Tyson Yerkes, the Traction King best known as the model for Theodore Dreiser's ruthless Frank Cowperwood, protagonist of The Financier, The Titan, and The Stoic. Despite his rare loss, Pierpont's involvement kindled fears that he would steamroller the English economy, and the London County Council warned that the metropolis was being handed over to the two Americans. There was now enormous British ambivalence toward Pierpont. On the streets of London, peddlers sold penny sheets entitled License to Stay on the Earth and signed J. Pierpont Morgan. A 1901 cartoon in the New York World showed Pierpont asking John Bull, the personified Englishman, What else have you for sale? Yet however much the British were distressed by Pierpont's bravado, they relied upon him in American financial matters. In 1901, to safeguard their American investments, London financiers insured his life at Lloyd's for two million dollars, placing him, as Jack said, in the same category with Queen Victoria and other rulers on this side of the Atlantic. No Morgan move could have aroused more primordial British fears than the one Pierpont made in 1902, the formation of a shipping trust to monopolize the North Atlantic. This was a natural extension of America's new export orientation. Soon after he had formed U.S. Steel, Pierpont was asked by a shipping executive whether it was possible to put North Atlantic steamships under common ownership. It ought to be, he replied. The shipping scene was then reminiscent of an earlier railroad era, too many ships and destructive rate wars. The Germans threatened British naval superiority, while Americans believed they should profit more from the immigrant traffic, as well as the new vogue among rich Americans for making luxurious transatlantic crossings. Nakedly asserting American interests, Pierpont assembled a plan for an American-owned shipping trust that would transpose his community of interest principle, cooperation among competitors in a given industry, to a global plane. He created an Anglo-American fleet of over 120 steamships, the world's largest under private ownership, dwarfing even the French merchant marine. From a political standpoint, his critical conquests were the Belfast shipyard of Harland and Wolfe and the White Star Line. 
In the new trust, Lord Peary of Harland and Wolfe saw a captive market for his ships, but J. Bruce Ismay, whose father had co-founded White Star, balked at the deal. Pierpont offered White Star shareholders such a rich premium, ten times over the high 1900 earnings, that Ismay not only stayed on as White Star chairman, but was coaxed by Pierpont into becoming president of the trust itself, to be called the International Mercantile Marine. Through the White Star purchase and his hiring of Ismay, Pierpont would become ensnared in the Titanic catastrophe ten years later. It was imperative that Pierpont bring the Germans, newly dominant in the North Atlantic, into his trust. Their jumbo transatlantic liners, multi-tiered wonders of wedding cake extravagance, were setting speed records for Atlantic crossings. An important architect of the shipping trust was Albert Balling, whose Hamburg-America steamship line, with hundreds of vessels, was the world's largest shipping company. In a secret 1901 report, Balin sketched out the scope of Morgan's ambitions. It is no secret that Morgan is pursuing his far-reaching plans as the head of a syndicate which comprises a number of the most important and the most enterprising businessmen in the United States, and that railway interests are particularly well represented in it. Morgan himself, during his stay in London a few months ago, stated to some British shipping men that, according to his estimates, nearly 70% of the goods which are shipped to Europe from the North Atlantic ports are carried to the latter by the railroads on through bills of lading, and that their further transport is entrusted to foreign shipping companies. He and his friends, Morgan added, did not see any reason why the railroad companies should leave it to foreign-owned companies to carry those American goods across the Atlantic. It would be much more logical to bring about an amalgamation of the American railroad and shipping interests for the purpose of securing the whole profits for American capital. In late 1901, Morgan struck a deal with Bowling for carving up the North Atlantic traffic. The Morgan Syndicate wouldn't inaugurate service to German harbors without express permission from the Germans, while they, in turn, vowed not to expand their service to Britain or Belgium. The partners in the shipping trust would also pool profits and jointly acquire the Holland-America line. After meeting with Morgan in London, Balin, the court Jew of his day, went to Kaiser Wilhelm's Berlin hunting lodge and briefed him on the pact. At first, the Kaiser feared American financial trickery. But Balin pointed out that while the British companies were being swallowed whole, the Germans would remain independent partners. Impressed, the Kaiser sat down on his bed and read the agreement, making changes and insisting on the inclusion of North German Lloyd in the cartel. Later, when the Kaiser came aboard Corsair III at Kiel, Pierpont strolled the deck with him. But in inviting the Kaiser to sit down, he committed a serious faux pas. Wilhelm, however, accepted the offer from the Royal Morgan. As news of the German agreement leaked out, the public was shocked that consolidation had reared its head on a global scale. In an editorial entitled Incredible, the New York Times said, If dispatches from Paris should tell us that Mr. Morgan had cabled orders to his home office to take out all the telephones, discharging the stenographers and typewriters, and smash the ticker, no man, woman, or child in New York would believe the yarn. Neither will intelligent persons accept as true the story about the terms of the agreement with the German lines. The Times saw this restraint of competition as outmoded and inefficient a line of reasoning now gaining new adherents as revulsion from the trust kings increased. The British were especially edgy about Pierpont's shipping cartel. They feared that international mercantile marine ships might exclusively transport to Europe those goods that originated in the American interior and traveled on Morgan railroads to East Coast ports. Morgan partner George Perkins confirmed this when he exulted that the shipping trust would practically result in stretching our railroad terminals across the Atlantic. It seemed as if Pierpont Morgan were spinning a seamless web around the world. Pierpont had to contend with a single holdout, Britain's Cunard Line, whose exclusion Balin thought might wreck the trust. There may have been some personal pique here. Once detained by a strike of Cunard workers at Liverpool, Pierpont had sworn on the spot never to use the line again. 
Now, with near panic in British shipping circles and a popular clamor for Parliament to save the seas for Britain, a cabinet committee pressed Cunard not to sell. The British Admiralty wanted transatlantic liners available as warships in an emergency and feared having Cunard in foreign hands. To woo the line, the British government granted it lavish subsidies to build two new ships, the Mauritania and the Lusitania, which would be the world's biggest steamships. In exchange, Cunard agreed to stay in British hands and keep its fleet at the government's disposal. In crafting a trust, Pierpont had never before had to contend with foreign governments. But as finance became increasingly international and affected sovereign interests, it took on a more political coloring. To temper British fears, Pierpont lobbied Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain, a vocal critic, and resorted to a ruse familiar to modern multinationals. He camouflaged American ownership, first with the Trust's very name, the International Mercantile Marine. Pierpont also agreed to man his British ships with British crews, fill their boards with British directors, and have them fly the Union Jack. Finally, his British ships would be in the reserves of the British Navy and could be conscripted in case of war. Yet the IMM's five-man voting trust would have an American majority, with Pierpont and his partner Charles Steele joined by P.A.B. Widener, along with Ismay and Lord Peary. The IMM would become a famous Pierpont Morgan flop. When shipping traffic slackened after the Boer War, the Morgan Combine and Cunard exhausted each other in debilitating rate wars. From its inception in April 1902, the Morgan Syndicate struggled to unload the IMM's unwanted securities. The stock had so much water, that is, inflated value, that it couldn't get a New York Stock Exchange listing. In 1906, the underwriters still held nearly 80% of the shares. As the Wall Street Journal concluded in a post-mortem on Pierpont's shipping trust, the ocean was too big for the old man. The British revulsion toward Pierpont probably changed the complexion of his London partnership, J.S. Morgan & Company. Not only had the bulk of its capital been his, but its mostly American partners had largely been recruited from among family members. In the new century, more partners would be British, and the choice is more political as Pierpont spent lavishly to build up the London house. In 1900, he signed up as a partner Sir Clinton E. Dawkins, a distinguished civil servant who had just completed a tour of duty in Egypt and was about to become a finance minister in India. The press saw fresh plans to expand the Morgan domain into Asia. It was dissatisfaction with Dawkins, apparently, that led Pierpont into merger talks with Barings in 1904. He also feared his new rivals on Wall Street. Lord Revelstoke of Barings, in recalling his meeting with Pierpont on the subject, wrote, He inveighed bitterly against the growing power of the Jews and of the Rockefeller crowd, and said more than once that our firm and his were the only two composed of white men in New York. The two firms had long identified with each other as the leading Protestant houses in their respective cities. The proposed merger centered on a plan for the House of Baring to handle the London side, the House of Morgan, the New York side. J.S. Morgan and Company would disappear. The talks foundered for two reasons, according to Lord Revelstoke. Pierpont was afraid of disappointing Dawkins by merging the London House, and with Jack Morgan spending so much time in London, his position in the merged firm would be a ticklish affair. I expect there is little sympathy and less confidence between father and son, said Revelstoke, who was also afraid of being smothered by Pierpont. Soon after these talks collapsed in 1905, Dawkins had a heart attack and died. Jack was then entrusted with the sensitive assignment of recruiting well-connected British partners for the firm of J.S. Morgan & Company. Now the Morgans would buy some expensive British bloodlines. In 1904, Edward Grenfell was elevated to partner. He became a Bank of England director a year later. A cool, dapper young bachelor who wore smart clothes and had a sharp tongue, Grenfell was snobbish and conservative and possessed a penetrating intellect. He also had a taste for practical jokes. Educated at Harrow and Trinity College, Cambridge, he had eminent ancestors, both his father and grandfather having been directors of the Bank of England and members of Parliament. 
Even as a young man, he peered at the world unsentimentally and spied out the fraudulent and hypocritical in people. Grenfell would become the London firm's political fixer and ace diplomat, its main contact with the British Treasury and the Bank of England. In 1905, Grenfell brought in his cousin and Jack Morgan's friend, Vivian Hugh Smith, then working in a family business that managed wharves. A tall, handsome redhead and a charming raconteur, he had gone to Eton and Trinity Hall, Cambridge. He, more than Grenfell, was in Pierpont's mold. He was a business go-getter, with his hands in many deals. He invested in Caucasian copper and African gold fields, and in other Rhodesian enterprises. Smith's father had been a Bank of England governor, and he was a member of the most prolific banking family England has produced, the so-called City Smiths, descended from a 17th-century Nottingham banker. Grenfell wasn't a Smith. He and Vivian were related through their mothers. Charting the power of this prodigious brood in 1959, Anthony Sampson estimated that 17 Smith descendants in the city controlled 87 directorships in 75 companies and were chairmen of six companies. The Martin Smiths would intermarry with the Hambros, strengthening that banking alliance. Vivian Smith married the tall, slender, flaxen-haired Lady Sybil, the mischievous, high-spirited only daughter of the sixth Earl of Antrim, who owned Glenarm Castle and several square miles of land in Ulster, and whose mother had been a lady-in-waiting to Queen Victoria. Gradually, then, the London Bank shed its character as an American colony in the city. When Jack returned to New York in 1905, Grenfell and Smith were in charge. When the firm was restyled Morgan Grenfell in 1910, it was the first time it had ever carried a British name. The Morgans had built their Trojan horse well. During Theodore Roosevelt's presidency, Pierpont Morgan received his most pronounced comeuppance for his role in the American scene. He was now so grand and cloud-wreathed that only a president could chop him down to mortal scale. The public revulsion from him was easy to explain. Wall Street had flourished with the trusts. Many were headquartered in New York and enjoyed closer relations with Wall Street bankers than with the companies from which they were compounded. Teddy Roosevelt wanted to correct the imbalance between government and corporate power, and in so doing, he inevitably collided with Pierpont Morgan. Although he had created great industrial combines, Pierpont couldn't allow commensurate power to accrue to labor and government. Despite his reverence for the past, patent in the religious and renaissance art he collected, he was a radical force, unsettling to small-town America, with its agrarian traditions and faith in its own innocence. However much businessmen might respect him, he was now an ogre in the popular press. One Broadway hit show depicted devils blowing across a fiery seat as they sang in unison, This seat's reserved for Morgan, the great financial gorgon. Soon after President McKinley was shot, the House of Morgan tested his successor. Pierpont's new lieutenant, the smooth, insinuating George W. Perkins, cabled the new president, The country's only consolation at this time is that it has an honest, fearless, loyal American to assume its worldwide burdens. A few weeks later, Perkins and Robert Bacon, a former classmate of T.R.'s at Harvard, visited the White House to urge caution and scout out Roosevelt's intentions. The president said he wanted reform, and afterward described Perkins and Bacon arguing like attorneys for a bad case, and at the bottom of their hearts each would know this if he were not the representative of so strong and dominant a character as Pierpont Morgan. As much a showman as Pierpont, T.R. would endlessly manipulate the Morgan symbolism. With the public appalled by the Northern Pacific corner, Roosevelt saw the political wisdom of filing an antitrust suit against the Northern Securities Company, whose formation had marked the Morgan-Harriman truce. Attorney General Philander C. Knox announced the suit after the stock market's close on February 19, 1902. The news caught Morgan by surprise at a dinner. Clearly, this White House wouldn't automatically succumb to Morgan pressure. The subsequent confrontations between T.R. and Morgan showed the tycoon in all his sublime arrogance. The two men shared membership in New York's aristocracy. 
Pierpont and T.R.'s father were both founders of the American Museum of Natural History. This common background perhaps gave their feud a special rancor, a pattern that would repeat itself with Jack and another notable class traitor, Franklin Roosevelt. At a White House meeting that included Attorney General Knox, Morgan expressed indignation that he hadn't received advance word of the Northern Security suit. In what history has engraved as the ultimate hauteur, he suggested to Roosevelt that Knox and his lawyers meet privately. If we have done anything wrong, said Pierpont, send your man to my man and they can fix it up. Knox said testily that they didn't want to fix the merger, but stop it. Worried about U.S. Steel, his favorite stepchild, Morgan asked Roosevelt if he planned to attack my other interests. Not, unless we find out they have done something we regard as wrong, Roosevelt replied. In Roosevelt's reaction to the meeting, there was the keen relish and cynicism of the well-bred rebel. He told Knox how Morgan could not help regarding me as a big rival operator, who either intended to ruin all his interests, or else could be induced to come to an agreement to ruin none. Back at 23 Wall, Pierpont dashed off an angry letter to the President, but cooler associates dissuaded him from sending it. In 1903, a court in St. Paul, Minnesota, backed the government in dissolving the Northern Securities Company, and the Supreme Court narrowly upheld the decision a year later. The Sherman Antitrust Act, moribund under McKinley, suddenly took on new life with T.R. Although the Roosevelt-Morgan relationship is sometimes caricatured as that of Trust Buster versus Trust King, it was far more complex than that. The public wrangling obscured deeper ideological affinities, as first demonstrated in the anthracite miners' strike of May 1902. The principal coal companies were owned by railroads, such as the Reading, Lehigh Valley, Erie, and others close to the House of Morgan. They wanted to avenge a 10% wage increase granted the miners in 1900, a deal that Pierpont had helped to broker, and reacted to the strikers with feudal ferocity. By the fall of 1902, schools were shut in New York for lack of coal, and the Republicans feared retribution in the elections. On October 11, 1902, Elihu Root, the Secretary of War, met with Pierpont aboard Corsair III in the Hudson River. Roosevelt was ready to run the mines with soldiers and wanted Morgan's support for an arbitration committee. T.R. was taking an enlightened stand for a president. Strike-breaking had been the more typical presidential response. The approach appealed to Morgan, who liked order and negotiation. He and Root went straight to the Union Club to meet with some railroad presidents. Paternalistic in his own bank, he was more conciliatory toward the miners than the railroad presidents were. At a White House meeting on October 3rd, the railroad men angrily abused John Mitchell, the young president of the United Mine Workers of America, who reacted with commendable dignity. Two days later, Roosevelt sent Robert Bacon a letter designed to enlist Pierpont's further help. The president said of Mitchell, He made no threats and resorted to no abuse. The proposition he made seemed to me eminently fair. The operators refused even to consider it, used insolent and abusive language about him, and in at least two cases assumed an attitude toward me which was one of insolence. While sympathetic to Roosevelt's plea, Morgan lacked the total power over the railroad men popularly attributed to him, and Roosevelt complained to Henry Cabot Lodge that Morgan hadn't been able to do much with those wooden-headed gentry. The crisis climaxed on October 15, 1902, when Perkins and Bacon visited the White House and stayed up close to midnight with Roosevelt, trying to find a way out of the impasse. Roosevelt again saw the two Morgan partners as melodramatic, even slightly ridiculous. As the night wore on, he said, they grew more and more hysterical, and not merely admitted, but insisted that failure to agree would result in violence and possible social war. Roosevelt finally hit upon a way that would allow the operators to save face. They would place the labor representative on the board in a seat reserved for an eminent sociologist. In the end, the arbitration board granted the miners a 10% wage increase, but no union recognition. Roosevelt glowingly wrote Morgan, If it had not been for your going in the matter, 
I do not see how the strike could have been settled at this time, and the consequences that might have followed are very dreadful to contemplate. Even on the trust issue, Roosevelt and Morgan were far from antithetical. Roosevelt saw trusts as natural, organic outgrowths of economic development. Stopping them, he said, was like trying to dam the Mississippi River. Both T.R. and Morgan disliked the rugged, individualistic economy of the 19th century and favored big business. They wanted to promote U.S. entry into world markets. But whereas Roosevelt thought economic giantism warranted an equivalent growth in government regulation, Morgan saw no need for countervailing powers. A Victorian gentleman banker at bottom, Pierpont saw trust, honor, and self-regulation among businessmen as providing the needed checks and balances. That Roosevelt and Morgan were secret blood brothers can be seen in the strange odyssey of Morgan partner George W. Perkins, who ended up a lieutenant to both. He was a handsome, highly imaginative man, with roguish, heavy-lidded gambler's eyes and a sinister baby face behind a handlebar mustache. His father had founded a missionary slum school in Chicago, and George grew up on the grounds of a reform school that his father ran. Before he joined the bank in 1901, he was already an empire-building executive at New York Life Insurance. A voluble, glad-handing deal-maker, he was an experiment on Pierpont's part, more chief than Indian, and showed Morgan's knack for picking bright people. He had come to the corner to solicit a donation for preserving the Palisades, the high cliffs on the western bank of the Hudson. Pierpont gave $25,000 of a requested $125,000, then said to Perkins as he was leaving, I will give you the whole $125,000 if you will do something for me. When Perkins asked what, Pierpont motioned toward the partner's area. Take that desk over there. Morgan gave Perkins a day to decide. President McKinley warned him against the killing regime of a Morgan partner, but the cocky Perkins accepted. Things were stormy from the start. J.P. Morgan and Company employed men for secretarial positions, and Perkins wanted to bring his female secretary from New York life. "'I will not have a damned woman in the place!' Pierpont roared, and poor Mary Kim was stashed away in a bank building around the corner." Later, Perkins moved her over to 23 Wall, but with the proviso that she remain upstairs and never appear on the banking floor. Flamboyant and outgoing, George Perkins stands out among early partners because he wrote about trusts, even as he created them. He challenged the mores of tight-lipped bankers of the baronial age. In August 1902, he pulled off a deal that put him in Pierpont's League. For a three million dollar fee, he merged the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company and the Deering Harvester Company, plus three smaller companies, into International Harvester. This new trust had an 85% share of the farm equipment market. Perkins chose the name International Harvester because he foresaw the rise of global corporations and hoped the new trust would comply with the laws of various countries and be at home everywhere. Because of the popularity of McCormick harvesting among farmers, International Harvester was spared the trust-busting fervor that was directed against U.S. Steel. As the Deering and McCormick families vied to control International Harvester, Perkins came up with an ingenious solution. The House of Morgan would control it. Perkins boasted to Pierpont, The new company is to be organized by us, its name chosen by us, the state in which it shall be incorporated is left to us, the board of directors, the officers, and the whole outfit left to us. Nobody has any right to question in any way any choice we make. Cyrus Hall McCormick, Jr., later called Perkins the most brilliant negotiator he had ever known. When International Harvester was listed on the stock exchange, Perkins proudly sent its first report to Roosevelt, writing that, so far as I know, this is the first instance on record that a corporation, on offering its securities to the public, has given to the public complete information as to its affairs. Perkins's advent came at an auspicious time for Pierpont Morgan. The trusts had thrust Wall Street into the national spotlight and brought about growing federal scrutiny of high finance. 
Pierpont was still mired in a 19th-century businessman's contempt for government, when a fellow vestryman at St. George's Church, William J. Shefflin, the son-in-law of Dr. Marco, came one day to talk to him about a civil service reform movement, Pierpont thundered, "'What do I care about civil service reform?' To worsen matters, Pierpont had a ferocious attitude toward the press, rarely granted interviews, violently refused to be photographed, and warned employees to withhold information from reporters. The slick, cool George Perkins, with his natty gray alpaca suits and ingratiating manner, enjoyed the smoke-filled rooms. He was the House of Morgan's first real power broker and high-level lobbyist. His later antagonist in the struggle for Theodore Roosevelt's soul, the Kansas progressive William Allen White, has left some marvelous impressions of Perkins as a silver-tongued devil. White became fascinated with Perkins after Senator Albert J. Beveridge urged White to go into the Senate, and said that Perkins, who liked him, could arrange it. White observed that Perkins made quick decisions, spoke in a soft voice, smiled ingratiatingly, easily. He wrote, I used to watch him fishing for men with a certain pride in his skill, which I greatly admired. He also declared that he exuded pleasantly the odor of great power that came from the Morgan connection. At the Bull Moose National Convention in 1912, White saw a smiling, simpering Perkins, spick and span, oiled and curled like an Assyrian bull, and a young one, trim and virile. From his days at New York life, Perkins would always carry a faint spice of scandal and a reputation as a master manipulator. In 1905, the New York State Legislature held sensational hearings regarding the life insurance industry. They were named after Senator William Armstrong, and they made the reputation of Chief Counsel Charles Evans Hughes, later Secretary of State and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The committee showed how rapacious insurance executives poured money into trust companies in which they held stock and squandered policyholders' money on fancy balls. There were stories about a racy house of mirth in Albany and other devices used by New York Life and other insurance companies to sway legislators. Perkins had been in too high a position at New York Life to get off scot-free. Against Pierpont's advice, he had retained his New York Life position, and Hughes pummeled him with conflict of interest issues. Perkins was charged with illegal campaign contributions and falsifying company records related to the sale of railroad securities. Although the indictments were later thrown out, he had to resign from New York Life. Where Pierpont's theorizing was largely non-existent, Perkins's was sophisticated. He gave speeches and published pamphlets on every conceivable subject. He was an oddity at the world's most cryptic bank. He preached a gospel of industrial cooperation, contending that small-scale business depressed wages and retarded technological advance. Not Wall Street, he said, but steam engines and telephones produced trusts. What is the difference, he proclaimed, between the U.S. Steel Corporation, as it was organized by Mr. Morgan, and a Department of Steel, as it might be organized by the government? He drew a parallel Pierpont wouldn't admit to, that trusts, with their centralized production and distribution, were a form of private socialism. And unlike Pierpont, he saw that they had acquired a public character, and he favored government licensing of interstate companies and extended worker benefits, including profit-sharing, social insurance, and old-age pensions. This, he boasted, would be socialism of the highest, best, and most ideal sort. Although Teddy Roosevelt sometimes wondered whether Perkins simply rationalized a selfish Morgan agenda, there was a striking likeness between their views. That a Morgan partner should advocate socialism is not so startling. After all, Pierpont, starting with his railway associations of the late 1880s, espoused industrial cooperation instead of competition. He liked his capitalism neat, tidy, and under bankers' control. The House of Morgan was banker to established enterprises, the great industrial planning systems that favored stability over innovation, predictability over experimentation, and were threatened by upstart companies. So the bank had a heavy stake in the status quo. Perkins wasn't the only one in the Morgan camp to applaud moves toward a planned, integrated economy. 
Later on, Judge Elbert Gary of U.S. Steel, who held private dinners to fix prices in the steel industry, testified, I would be very glad if we had some place where we could go to a responsible governmental authority and say to them, Here are our facts and figures, here is our property, here our cost of production. Now you tell us what we have the right to do and what prices we have the right to charge. As we shall see, the mortal attacks on the House of Morgan came not from socialists, but from such trust-busters as Louis D. Brandeis, Felix Frankfurter, and William O. Douglas, who favored small economic units and sharp competition. This tradition would lambaste the Morgan Money Trust as the biggest and most dangerous trust of all. Because the House of Morgan preached socialism for the rich, it always had a partial affinity for those who preached it for the poor. Yet another dimension of the Pierpont Morgan-Teddy Roosevelt relationship may be seen in the Panama Canal affair. Even as T.R. fulminated against excessive financial power at home, he gratefully exploited it abroad. In 1902, Congress authorized Roosevelt to pay $40 million to France to buy its uncompleted assets in the Isthmus of Panama for the construction of a canal. Two years later, Pierpont carried out the financing for this largest real estate transaction in history. He traveled to France to oversee the shipment of gold bullion and paid the rest in foreign exchange to the Banque de France. After receiving payment from the United States, the new state of Panama, which T.R. helped to pry loose from Colombia, named J.P. Morgan & Company its fiscal agent on Wall Street with exclusive rights to receive its U.S. government payments. The House of Morgan also handled Panama's single biggest investment, six million dollars of first mortgages on New York City real estate. So integral was Pierpont in the whole shady Panama Canal affair that one biographer has dubbed him Roosevelt's bagman in the taking of the Panama Canal. Thus, in the sparring between Roosevelt and Morgan, there was always a certain amount of shadow play, a pretense of greater animosity than actually existed. In the 1904 campaign, the Morgan Bank gave $150,000 toward Roosevelt's re-election. In return, Pierpont was sternly lectured by T.R. at a 1907 dinner of the Gridiron Club, the president wagging his finger at Morgan and Standard Oil's Henry Rogers and thundering for business reform. And if you don't let us do this, he insisted, those who will come after us will rise and bring you to ruin. When T.R. enunciated the famous phrase about malefactors of great wealth, reporters thought he glanced in Morgan's direction. Nevertheless, some of the most eloquent encomiums of Pierpont came from T.R. himself, who was struck by his very great power and his truthfulness. Any kind of meanness and smallness were alike wholly alien to his nature. Morgan was less forgiving. When Roosevelt went on an African safari, Pierpont declared that he hoped the first lion he met would do its duty. Badgered by trustbusters, Pierpont turned with relief to other matters in his later years. By the 1900s, in his early 60s, he was often an absentee boss, cabling instructions to Wall Street two or three times daily from vacation haunts. He never loosened his grip. He was a restless, frustrated man. He didn't gloat over the stupendous sums he earned, and one doesn't picture him counting up his net worth in the dead of night. He never mistook business for the whole of life. His real passions and temptations were women, art, and religion. Pierpont tried to suppress press gossip about his escapades, but the Morgan estrangement was no secret. Husband and wife had little in common, and Fanny remained aloof from the social rigors required of a famous man's wife. In a 1902 photograph, she still looks tall, refined, and handsome, with her wavy hair swept up. Yet she was frail and sickly, and sometimes lacked the strength to travel. By the early 1900s, she had become rather deaf and used an enormous ear trumpet. She was a semi-invalid and ate alone upstairs when the family gathered for Sunday breakfast. Despite the tensions between Pierpont and Fanny, the Morgans were family-oriented. In 1904, Pierpont bought Jack a big Victorian brownstone at the corner of Madison Avenue and 37th Street, almost a twin of his own. 
Unexpectedly light and spacious inside, it had forty-five rooms, twenty-two fireplaces, and a dozen bathrooms. By tearing down an intervening house, Jack and his father lived as next-door neighbors, with a common garden in between, from 1905 until Pierpont's death in 1913. Jack continued to manage emotional acrobatics, propping up his mother's failing spirits while retaining his father's love. In later years, he functioned as a post office, informing his mother of Pierpont's movements abroad and reporting to his father on his mother's whereabouts. It was formal and awkward, yet Pierpont and Fanny never turned their children against one another. A thoroughgoing Victorian, Pierpont would inquire respectfully after Fanny and try to minimize Jack's discomfort. In letters often heavy with piety, Jack preached resignation to Fanny. Life, he argued, was simply a matter of bowing to eternal verities. Hadn't he dealt with his father by accepting the inevitable? In the stuffy, patriarchal Morgan world, Fanny's options were terribly limited. In one 1900 letter, he congratulated her for her better health, then said, Do keep hold of it now it's come at last, and don't squander your health on things which seem a necessity to you because they would be a pleasure to others. Keep on letting people do things without you. You'll be better able to do things for them later on. Here endeth the sermon, and there is no collection." Fanny never achieved such holy resignation and suffered terrible anguish. In 1901, when she visited Rome, Jack wrote her a letter that poignantly stated his conviction that she had to submit to her fate. Although Pierpont isn't mentioned, his ghost hovers in the air. Your letter from Rome struck me as distinctly blue. I know there are lots of things in your circumstances which you and others would like to have differently, but one must accept the inevitable as a thing which is not in one's own hands, as one does a death or a great anxiety. Nothing one could ever have done and left undone would make two and two into five. If the four is unpleasant, there is a moral and religious necessity for accepting the fact and believing in the eternal love which lies behind the troubles. It seems doubtful that any woman could have wholly gratified Pierpont's appetites. There were two Pierponts, the proper banker and the sensualist, yoked together under extreme pressure. Pierpont could never integrate the two. His attitude toward women was characterized by the common double standard. At the bank, he was stoutly opposed to women employees, and he didn't discuss business with women, whom he saw as inhabiting a separate realm. Once a year, on New Year's Day, Fanny lunched at the corner, the only time women were invited. At home, however, he was a different man. A female visitor to 219 Madison Avenue once teased Pierpont, saying that while he was charming at home, she heard of the fear he inspired at work. Pierpont blushed, began to protest, then said, I'm afraid you are right. For Pierpont, marriage required discretion, not fidelity. It was a matter of paying homage to convention. In January 1902, Charles Schwab, now president of U.S. Steel, motored to Monte Carlo with Baron Henri Rothschild. Their scandalous escapades at roulette made the front pages of New York papers. Disgusted with the wicked Schwab, Andrew Carnegie wrote Pierpont, Of course he never could have fallen so low with us. His resignation would have been called for instanter had he done so. George Perkins cabled Schwab that the incident hadn't scandalized Pierpont, and that Schwab should go ahead and have a bully good time. When he returned to New York, Schwab defended himself, telling Morgan he hadn't resorted to closed doors. "'That's what doors are for,' snapped Morgan. There's no question he possessed a wide streak of cynicism. He once told an associate, "'A man always has two reasons for the things he does, a good one and the real one.'" A revealing comment from a man who styled himself Wall Street's conscience. In matters of art, Pierpont's standards were puritanical. As a member of the board of the Metropolitan Opera, he was instrumental in cancelling production of Richard Strauss's Salome. The first night audience had found the story of the crazed princess who wanted John the Baptist's head too daring for its tastes. Also, rehearsals had been held on Sunday mornings, which infuriated the local clergy. The production was spiked. 
In embarrassment, another board member, Otto Kahn, wrote to Strauss that the responsibility for the Salome veto must be shared by the clumsiness and the honestly felt, but in this case totally inappropriate, religiosity of Morgan. While protecting public morals, Pierpont conducted amorous escapades aboard his yachts, in private railroad cars, and at European spas. Wall Street wits said he collected old masters and old mistresses. Few women could withstand his leonine lovemaking, insisted an early Pierpont biographer. In his larks can be seen the familiar comedy of the older man suddenly unbuttoned. He could be a jovial Santa Claus. In Paris, he would squire mistresses to a jeweler on the Rue de la Paix and invite them to indulge themselves. Once, in Cairo, he tossed a handful of gold jewelry on a hotel table and cried to the ladies, Now help yourselves! The party included a bishop. Did he join in the merriment? During one Seattle outing, everyone was given a fur. A New York joke of the early 1900s apparently referred to Pierpont's florid face and generosity. One chorus girl says to another, I got a pearl out of a fresh oyster at Shankly's. That's nothing, replies her friend. I got a whole diamond necklace out of an old lobster. Given Pierpont's theatrical approach to business, it is fitting that he preferred the company of actresses. He gravitated toward women who were free and independent, sassy and high-spirited. Rumors had him competing with Diamond Jim Brady for the affections of Lillian Russell. His most celebrated affair involved the tall, voluptuous Maxine Elliott. She was a stately woman with dark eyes, a long neck, and an imposing presence. She had a provocative tongue, something that always seemed to attract Morgan. "'Why, you men in Wall Street are like a lot of cannibals,' she taunted him. "'You devour anything that comes along, if it is edible.' She made such withering comments about the design of Corsair III— especially Pierpont's having placed the cabins below decks, that he shifted the arrangements. Maxine Elliott was the first woman to build a Broadway theater, purchasing the needed lot two months after the 1907 panic. Scandalmongers attributed the financing to Morgan. When he and Maxine returned from Europe aboard the same ship in 1908, a rare lapse in Morgan discretion, reporters asked him if he had a stake in the theater. The only interest I have in Maxine Elliott's theater is that I'd like to get a free ticket on opening night, he said. Legend claims he shared her favors with King Edward VII, whom she met at Marienbad in 1908. These larks, concentrated in Pierpont's later life, were not without Falstaffian pathos. Yet Pierpont could also be a courtly, old-fashioned lover— his last mistress seems to have been Lady Victoria Sackville West, the daughter of a former British ambassador to Washington. She recorded how the portly old banker, Randy as a schoolboy, suddenly crushed her in his embrace. She wrote in her diary in 1912, He holds my hand with much affection, and says he would never care for me in any way I would not approve of, that he was sorry to be so old, but I was the one woman he loved, and he would never change. For a financial god, how tenderly apologetic. Even at the end of his life, Pierpont had a craving for romance that had probably not been satisfied since his brief marriage to Mimi Sturgis fifty years before. Some spot inside him was left untouched by the storied maneuvers on Wall Street, some emptiness that his giant exploits couldn't fill. Even after Pierpont's death, his family would track his liaisons as objets d'art he had owned mysteriously surfaced in the collections of other families. In 1936, a German wrote to Jack, claiming to be a bastard from Pierpont's student days at Göttingen. Jack wasn't sure the whole thing was a hoax until he established that the man hadn't been born until after his father had left the university. Yet years after his father's death, Jack didn't dismiss the notion out of hand. In spite of their number, these affairs consumed less of Pierpont's time and interest than his true aphrodisiac, art collecting. When Junius died, Pierpont had a Thackeray manuscript and a few Egyptian antiquities. Then his collecting blossomed, along with his bank's profits. At first he concentrated on books and manuscripts and letters of British royalty, storing them in his Madison Avenue basement. 
Soon they were heaped upon chairs, and he couldn't keep track of them. Other works gathered dust in Twenty-Three Walls vaults and in a warehouse on East 42nd Street. In 1900, he bought property adjoining his house on East 36th Street and drafted architect Charles F. McKim to design a library for his collection. McKim created an Italian Renaissance palace of a coldly remote and balanced beauty. Its marble blocks were so perfectly fitted they required no binding material, a method McKim copied at considerable expense from the Greeks. When he settled into the library in 1906, Pierpont took for his office the magnificent West Room, with its walls of crimson damask from the Kiji Palace in Rome. A door in the corner opened into the vault. Junius's portrait hung above the mantel. The library was nicknamed the Uptown Branch of J.P. Morgan and Company. To catalog the collection, Pierpont in 1905 hired a pretty young woman named Belle de Costa Green. Only twenty-two, she had impressed Pierpont's nephew with her knowledge of rare books at Princeton's library. She was the product of a broken marriage. She grew up in New Jersey with her mother, who was a music teacher, and had no college education. Dark and enchanting, with green eyes, she had a complexion so dusky that she referred fancifully to her Portuguese origins, and she was probably part black. Belle Green had a ferocious wit and remarkable self-confidence. She became more than Pierpont's librarian. She was his confidant, soulmate, and possibly mistress. She read Dickens and the Bible to him, and would even attend him at the all-night library session during the 1907 panic. If the financier liked saucy women, Belle Green surpassed all rivals. When a lumber magnate proposed to her, she cabled back, "'All proposals will be considered alphabetically after my fiftieth birthday.' She daringly posed nude for drawings and enjoyed a bohemian freedom. Also the toast of the Harrimans and the Rockefellers, she stayed at Claridge's in London and the Ritz in Paris when on Morgan missions. She could be a buccaneer as well. She once told an assistant, If a person is a worm, you step on him. Even when she became famous as the director of the Pierpont Morgan Library, she was as mysterious as her mentor and never lectured in public or accepted any honorary awards. Like Pierpont, she burned her letters and diaries before she died in 1950. In Belle Green, Pierpont's infatuation with women and art converged. There was some sexual element to the relationship. When she had a four-year affair with connoisseur Bernard Berenson, she insisted that he keep it secret so as not to awaken Pierpont's jealousy. She flowered in her role as doyenne of the library, presiding in Renaissance gowns, gesturing with a green silk handkerchief, and personally representing Pierpont at art auctions. The forty-six-year age difference between tycoon and librarian didn't seem to matter. He was almost a father to me, she said after Pierpont died. His never-failing sympathy, his understanding, and his great confidence and trust in me bridged all the difference in age, wealth, and position. She would be an important figure for many members of the Morgan family, and would later appeal to Jack no less than to his father. Eventually, Pierpont put together the largest art collection of any private individual of his day, perhaps of any day. It had Napoleon's watch, Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks, Catherine the Great's snuff-box, jewelry of the Medici family, Shakespeare first folios, a five-page letter of George Washington's, Roman coins showing the heads of all twelve Caesars, save one. Oblivious to Impressionists and modern American artists, he favored objects with long romantic histories, European art sanctified by age. The banker of old money did prefer old masters and valued exquisite craftsmanship and costly materials. Yet paintings accounted for a scant five percent of his collection. He preferred tapestries, jewel-encrusted books, gilded altarpieces, illuminated manuscripts, gold and silver cups, porcelains and ivory. In stressing decorative arts, he followed in the footsteps of the Rothschilds, the Medicis, and other merchant princes. He was proud of his holdings and printed up private catalogues of his collection, which he distributed to the royal households of Europe. Morgan the Collector was recognizably the same man as Morgan the Banker. He hated to haggle. 
he would come to terms by asking a dealer what he had paid and then tacking on 10 or 15 percent. One recalls Pierpont barking bids for foreign exchange on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. In art and finance, he relied on the deal-maker as much as the deal. Francis Henry Taylor, who studied Morgan's habits as a collector, wrote, He was accused of not looking at the objects, when in reality he was looking into the eye of the man who was trying to sell it to him. It was, after all, how he had reached the summit in finance, and it had paid off well. To protect himself, he would buy a picture conditionally and leave it on a chair, gathering the free comments of other dealers before completing the purchase. Once, to test art dealer Joseph Duveen's knowledge of Chinese ceramics, he set out five on display. Only three of them are genuine, he said. Now tell me which they are. Duveen smashed the two fakes with his cane. The godfather of U.S. steel knew that to create a big collection, he had to buy art in huge batches and purchase entire collections. He roared tenaciously through art history like a freight train shunting from one track to the next. "'I have done with the Greek antiquities,' he wrote his sister Mary Burns. "'I am at the Egyptian.' His determination was awesome. Wanting manuscripts owned by one of Lord Byron's relatives in Greece, he stationed an agent there, armed with a letter of credit. For several years this lonely sentinel bought Byron manuscripts as they came on the market, until the collection was complete. Pierpont could also be childishly impulsive. He loved to hear the stories behind works of art, which he would commit to memory. This genuine interest served him better than the feigned sophistication of insecure millionaires who bought fine art and ended up with high-priced junk. When one art dealer appeared with a Vermeer, Pierpont asked, Who is Vermeer? After being told, he peered at the $100,000 painting again. I'll take it, he said. The story may be apocryphal. Morgan had visited European museums for decades and would have seen Vermeer's, yet it captures his enthusiasm. In the last analysis, Pierpont relied on his own fallible judgment. In 1911, Jack excitedly reported that a dealer had offered $176,000 for an original 1530 Copernicus manuscript, the basis of modern astronomy. In a huff, Pierpont cabled back, Do not care for Copernicus. Certainly not at such absurd price. And Pierpont could be disarmed by sentiment. One dealer tried to sell him a manuscript collection that included Poe's Tamerlane and Hawthorne's Blythedale Romance. When Morgan wouldn't budge, the dealer played his trump card. He noted a Longfellow poem about his grandchildren. That, the dealer said, reminded him of Pierpont and his grandchildren. Let me see it, replied Morgan. He put on his spectacles, read the poem, then pounded the table. I'll take the collection. The scale of Pierpont's collection was so outsized, it included 225 works of ivory, 140 pieces of majolica, 150 works of continental silver, and so on, that vanity alone cannot explain it. Rather, it was founded in an impulse that paralleled his banking ambition, to put America on a par with the European civilization he so admired. As in banking, he honored old-world traditions, even as he ransacked them. It was said he wished to acquire a collection so huge that Americans wouldn't have to travel to Europe for culture. After 1897, he gave steadily to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and became its board president in 1904. The board of trustees often met in his house. To mount a patriotic assault on European masterpieces, he packed the board with millionaire friends, Frick, Harkness, Rogers, and other industrial captains. In 1905, he brought Sir Purdon Clark from the South Kensington Museum to direct the museum, and then Bloomsbury art critic Roger Fry as its curator of paintings. Fry would later taunt Pierpont for his perfect insensibility and crude historical imagination. But the high quality of the Morgan collection would be proof against Fry's petty jibes. In 1904, after acquiring the townhouse next door to 13 Prince's Gate, he considered converting the two buildings into a museum as a memorial to his father. He also hoped to create memorials to Junius in the four cities in which he had lived, 
Holyoke, Massachusetts, Hartford, Boston, and London. After deciding that the enlarged London house still couldn't encompass his collection, he commemorated Junius by building the $1.4 million Morgan Memorial in Hartford, doubling the size of that city's art museum, the Wadsworth Athenaeum. This single bequest, Pierpont's largest, surpassed the $1 million he had given to the Harvard Medical School in 1901 to honor his father. A final note on Pierpont's collection concerns the rashness with which he financed it. Usually buying art during the summer, he would postpone payment until early the next year, extraordinary to think of the world's foremost banker buying art on credit. As early as 1902, Teddy Grenfell noted in his journal vague and disquieting rumors in the city about the Morgan Bank's financial soundness as a result of the whirlwind art collecting. He also noted the tension when the time came to settle these purchases at the London or Paris offices. The sums weren't trivial. At Pierpont's death, the collection was valued at an estimated $50 million, or nearly half his entire fortune. This non-stop buying posed a potential threat to Pierpont's banking capital. This was especially serious because he chose partners for their talent, not to inject fresh capital into the business. It was one of the House of Morgan's glories that poor boys could join its exclusive club. Yet Pierpont didn't always husband his capital. Years later, Morgan partner Russell C. Leffingwell passed along the insider stories about the problems created by the art sprees. The notion that the elder Morgan bought pictures and tapestries partly to make money is certainly contrary to the fact, he told a colleague. It was a self-indulgence on a magnificent scale and a source of great anxiety and at times weakness to his firm, which could well have used the money as capital in the business if he had not spent it so lavishly. In the last analysis, the collector's impulse to spend won out over the banker's impulse to save. Chapter 7 Panic The folk wisdom of Wall Street says that if a crash is widely expected, it won't occur, for a saving fear will filter through the marketplace. This was refuted in 1907, when Wall Street spent a cliffhanging year awaiting the crash that came. On March 25th, panic selling roiled the stock exchange. The financial powers, Henry Clay Frick, Edward H. Harriman, William Rockefeller, and Jacob Schiff, assembled at the corner for a secret meeting. They wanted a $25 million pool to steady prices. Jack cabled Pierpont in London, saying Schiff, thought amount of money really needed would be very small, as moral effect of concerted action on part of large interests heretofore antagonistic would be sufficient without actual purchases. While Jack favored cooperation, Pierpont fired back a hostile cable, saying such an action would be unwise, entirely at variance with all the policies we have ever adopted, being at the head of a declared stock exchange manipulation. The next day the market rallied, partly on the basis of incorrect reports that Pierpont had joined relief efforts, and the plan was scrapped. All spring, as Pierpont cruised around Europe, his partners wired him that a serious autumn drop appeared likely. At age 70, Pierpont was often in low spirits. In photographs, his eyes looked slightly unfocused, as if telling of inner turmoil. The October 1907 panic found him at the Episcopal Convention in Richmond, Virginia, as a lay delegate from New York, he would attend these conventions in opulent style, bringing bishops down by private railroad car and throwing parties catered by Louis Sherry. Nothing pleased him more than recondite controversies over prayer book revisions and other matters remote from the material world. At the same time, the contradictory Pierpont brought with him a lady friend, Mrs. John Marco of Philadelphia a relative of his personal physician, Dr. James Marco, and often mentioned as a possible mistress. As the Richmond Convention progressed, emergency telegrams came in thick and fast from 23 Wall Street. Morgan's friend, Bishop William Lawrence, noted in his diary how Morgan would study the telegrams, place his palms on the table, then stare fixedly ahead. 
Though Pierpont was needed on Wall Street, his partners feared a premature return might itself touch off a panic. By Saturday, October 19th, he decided to rush back by private railroad car to deal with a spreading bank crisis. They are in trouble in New York, he told Bishop Lawrence. They do not know what to do, and I don't know what to do, but I am going back. The 1907 panic was Pierpont's last hurrah. Although semi-retired, reporting to work periodically for only an hour or two, he suddenly functioned as America's central bank. Within two weeks' time, he saved several trust companies and a leading brokerage house, bailed out New York City, and rescued the stock exchange. His victory was Pyrrhic, however, as America decided that never again would one man wield such power. The 1907 panic would be the last time that bankers loomed so much larger than regulators in a crisis. Afterward, the pendulum would swing decidedly toward government financial management. The panic was blamed on many factors. Tight money, Roosevelt's gridiron club speech attacking the malefactors of great wealth, and excessive speculation in copper, mining, and railroad stocks. The immediate weakness arose from the recklessness of the trust companies. In the early 1900s, national and most state-chartered banks couldn't take trust accounts, wills, estates, and so on, but directed customers to trusts. Traditionally, these had been synonymous with safe investment. By 1907, however, they had exploited enough legal loopholes to become highly speculative. To draw money for risky ventures, they paid exorbitant interest rates, and trust executives operated like stock market plungers. They loaned out so much against stocks and bonds that by October 1907, as much as half the bank loans in New York were backed by securities as collateral an extremely shaky base for the system. The trusts also didn't keep the high cash reserves of commercial banks and were vulnerable to sudden runs. That Pierpont rescued the trusts was ironic, for they were anathema to the Wall Street establishment. As George Perkins said, Indeed, we hadn't any use for their management and knew that they ought to be closed, but we fought to keep them open in order not to have runs on other concerns. When J.P. Morgan and other prestigious houses referred clients to them for trust work, the unscrupulous trusts tried to steal the non-trust business of these clients. Two young bankers, Henry Pomeroy Davison of the First National Bank and Thomas W. Lamont of Liberty Bank, were among those who in 1903 set up a captive trust called Banker's Trust. Although commercial banks couldn't do trust business, they could own trusts and they pooled their money to set up the new bank. The idea was that the House of Morgan and its allies would refer trust business to Banker's Trust, which would politely return the customers once their trust business was complete. By no accident, the Morgan Bank would stare vigilantly at Banker's Trust across the corner of Broad and Wall. On Monday, October 21st, the day after Pierpont returned from Richmond, a collapse in copper shares undermined the trusts. There were fears of a copper glut, spurred partly by news that the Morgans would join the Guggenheims in developing new Alaskan copper mines. When an attempt to corner United Copper burst, its stock skidded 35 points in just two hours, spreading ruin and dragging stocks to levels unseen since the 1893 Depression. Charles T. Barney, president of Knickerbocker Trust, was associated with F. Augustus Heinze and other speculators who had cornered United Copper. So the stock's fall alarmed the Knickerbocker's 18,000 depositors. At its new main office at 34th Street and 5th Avenue, customers lined up on Tuesday morning to empty their accounts. As panic spread to other trusts around town, Pierpont took charge of the rescue operation. Emergencies seemed to fortify his confidence, even as they introduced doubt or terror in others. He formed a committee of young bankers, including Henry Pomeroy Davison of the First National Bank and Benjamin Strong of Bankers Trust. He sent them to audit the Knickerbocker's books. Later, as all-powerful governor of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, Strong would recall peering out at grim depositors from the bank's back room. The consternation of the faces of the people in the line, many of them I knew, I shall never forget. 
I know that Harry left the building with a sense of dejection and defeat which it is quite impossible for me to describe. Pierpont wrote off the Knickerbocker as hopeless, and it failed on Tuesday afternoon, October 22nd. I can't go on being everybody's goat, he said. I've got to stop somewhere. A few weeks later, refused admission to see Pierpont, Charles Barney of the Knickerbocker shot himself, an act that produced a wave of suicides among the bank's depositors. On Tuesday night, Pierpont and other bankers met at a Manhattan hotel with Treasury Secretary George B. Cortelyou, who pledged cooperation. The next day, Cortelyou put $25 million in government funds at Pierpont's disposal. It was an extraordinary transference of power to a private banker, and further proof of Teddy Roosevelt's high regard for Morgan. The Knickerbocker's failure triggered runs on other trusts, especially the Trust Company of America, which was just down Wall Street from the Morgan Bank. On Wednesday, October 23rd, Pierpont summoned the Trust presidents and tried to prod them into a rescue pool. It turned out they didn't know one another, making it difficult for them to band together in a crisis. The situation illustrated why bankers believed implicitly in their old boy networks. After Ben Strong delivered a favorable report on the Trust Company of America, Pierpont made his ex-cathedra pronouncement. This is the place to stop the trouble, then. Morgan, George F. Baker of First National Bank, and James Stillman of National City Bank provided $3 million to save the Trust Company of America. For two weeks, Morgan and his associates stood fast against a spreading typhoon. As panic increased, depositors thronged banks across the city. People sat overnight in camp chairs, bringing food and waiting for the banks to open in the morning. New York police distributed numbers to people to save their places. In other cases, exhausted depositors paid enterprising standees to wait for them. A later Wall Street eminence, Sidney Weinberg of Goldman Sachs, earned $10 a day holding down places in line. To reduce withdrawals and avert the need for shutdowns, trust tellers counted out the money in slow motion, like people in a trance. Strapped for cash, the trusts called in margin loans from stock market speculators. The price of call money, that is, the interest rate on margin loans to buy stocks, zoomed to 150 percent. Nevertheless, there remained a shortage of ready funds. Perkins cabled Jack, who was in London. At all times during the day, there were frantic men and women in our offices, in every way giving evidence of the tremendous strain they were under. Pierpont was accosted by hundreds of distraught brokers who faced ruin and pleaded for help. Photographs of the corner showed dense throngs of men in derbies and dark coats, solidly massed along Wall Street in somber ranks. For these terrified men, Morgan emerged as the Redeemer, the one man who could save them. In a human wave, they surged right to the door of 23 Wall, where the struggling mob fought their way on, all looking up at the windows of J.P. Morgan and Company. On Thursday, October 24th, with stock trading virtually halted, New York Stock Exchange President Ransom H. Thomas crossed Broad Street and told Morgan that unless $25 million were raised immediately, at least 50 brokerage firms might fail. Thomas wanted to shut the exchange. At what time do you usually close it? Morgan asked. Though the stock exchange was twenty paces from his office, Pierpont didn't know its hours. Stock trading was vulgar. Why, at three o'clock, said Thomas. Pierpont wagged an admonitory finger. It must not close one minute before that hour today. At two o'clock, Morgan summoned the bank presidents and warned that dozens of brokerage houses might fail unless they mustered twenty-five million dollars within ten or twelve minutes. By 2.16, the money was pledged. Morgan then dispatched a team to the stock exchange floor to announce that call money would be available at as low as 10%. One team member, Amory Hodges, had his waistcoat torn off in the violent tumult. Then a blessed moment occurred in Morgan Annals. As news of the rescue circulated through the exchange, Pierpont heard a mighty roar across the street. Looking up, he asked the cause— he was being given an ovation by the jubilant floor traders. 
The next day, call money soared again to extortionate rates. Eight banks and trust companies had already failed during the week. Pierpont went to the New York Clearing House, the banker's trade group for clearing checks, and got it to issue Scrip as a temporary emergency currency to relieve the serious cash shortage. Herbert L. Satterley has left a wonderful vignette of his father-in-law returning to 23 Wall. It shows why contemporaries saw Morgan as the incarnation of pure will. Anyone who saw Mr. Morgan going from the clearing house back to his office that day will never forget the picture. With his coat unbuttoned and flying open, a piece of white paper clutched tightly in his right hand, he walked fast down Nassau Street. His flat-topped black derby hat was set firmly down on his head. Between his teeth he held the paper cigar holder, in which was one of his long cigars, half-smoked. His eyes were fixed straight ahead. He swung his arms as he walked and took no notice of anyone. He did not seem to see the throngs in the street, so intent was his mind on the thing that he was doing. Everyone knew him, and people made way for him except some who were equally intent on their own affairs, and these he brushed aside. The thing that made his progress different from that of all the other people on the street was that he did not dodge or walk in and out or halt or slacken his pace. He simply barged along as if he had been the only man going down Nassau Street Hill past the sub-treasury. He was the embodiment of power and purpose. That Friday night, Pierpont called in city religious leaders and asked them to preach calm in their Sunday sermons. Archbishop Farley held a special Sunday Mass for businessmen. Grappling with a bad cold that had dogged him for days, Pierpont went up to Cragston for the weekend. On Monday, October 28th, New York City Mayor George B. McClellan came to the Morgan Library with another serious brush fire to extinguish. Alarmed by events on Wall Street, European investors were withdrawing money from America, and the city couldn't place its warrants abroad. The city needed $30 million to cover its obligations, McClellan said. Morgan, Baker, and Stillman agreed to provide the needed money, the first of four Morgan-led rescues of New York City in this century. In a bravura performance, the 70-year-old Pierpont extemporaneously drafted a letter-perfect contract on Morgan Library stationery. He also demanded a banker's committee to monitor the city's bookkeeping practices, a feature of later New York City crises as well. For a seventy-year-old man with a bad cold, Pierpont handled the 1907 panic like a virtuoso. He sucked lozenges and worked nineteen-hour days. He said that he missed Jack. At moments, his physician, Dr. Marco, plied his throat with sprays and gargles, as if the banker were an aging boxing champ being resuscitated between rounds. The doctor also extracted a pledge that Pierpont would cut down his cigar consumption to only twenty a day. When he dozed during an emergency meeting, nobody dared disturb the royal snooze. One banker reached forward and lifted from the relaxed fingers, as one might take a rattle from a baby, the big cigar that was scorching the varnish on the table. For a half hour he was fast asleep, as bankers discussed a $10 million loan. During the 1907 panic, Pierpont proved that American finance could aspire to high drama. In an elaborate finale on Saturday night, November 2nd, he devised a rescue for the still shaky Trust Company of America, for Lincoln Trust, and for Moore & Schley, a speculative brokerage house that was $25 million in debt. This last company held a gigantic majority stake in the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company as collateral against loans. If it had to liquidate that stake, it might collapse the stock market. If Moore and Schley in turn collapsed, it might topple other houses as well. Like an impresario creating his theatrical masterpiece, Pierpont gathered the city's bankers at his library. He settled commercial bankers in the East Room, beneath signs of the Zodiac and a tapestry of the Seven Deadly Sins, while in the West Room trust company presidents sank into deep red couches and armchairs beneath the gaze of saints and madonnas. In between, like Jupiter above the fray, Pierpont played solitaire in Bell Green's office. One spectator was Tom Lamont, now a vice president of Bankers Trust. 
Then only an experienced errand boy, as he said, he was entranced by the pageantry. Of Pierpont's successors, only Lamont would possess the flair to stage such events. He recalled, A more incongruous meeting place for anxious bankers could hardly be imagined. In one room were lofty, magnificent tapestries hanging on the walls, rare Bibles and illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages filling the cases. In another, that collection of the early Renaissance masters, Castagno, Ghirlandaio, Perugino, to mention only a few, the huge open fire, the door just ajar to the Holy of Holies where the original manuscripts were guarded. To save Moore and Schley, Pierpont wanted some payoff for himself. With his usual sense of martyrdom, he felt it was his due. With his peculiar bifocal vision, he saw the panic as a time for both statesmanship and personal gain. At this point, he told friends that he had done enough and wanted some quid pro quo. He now took an appropriately big fee. Pierpont hatched a scheme that would save Morinschlei, avert its need to sell the Tennessee coal and iron block in the open market, and benefit his favorite creation, U.S. Steel. He knew U.S. Steel could profit from Tennessee coal's huge iron ore and coal holdings in Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. For antitrust reasons, it was a prize unattainable under ordinary circumstances, so he struck a deal. U.S. Steel would buy Tennessee coal stock from Moore and Schley if the hesitant trust company presidents assembled a $25 million pool to protect the weaker trusts. What a characteristic mix of high and low motives. Ben Strong noticed that Pierpont had locked the enormous bronze doors and pocketed the key. He was up to his old tricks. Confinement of adversaries, a deadline, the abrupt appearance of the menacing host after long hours of bargaining. At a quarter to five in the morning, Pierpont pushed a gold pen into the hand of Edward King, leader of the trust presidents. Here's the place, King, and here's the pen. Beaten down by all-night bargaining, King and the other trust company presidents agreed to contribute to the $25 million pool. On Sunday night, Henry Clay Frick and Judge Elbert Gary of U.S. Steel sped down to Washington on a midnight train. They traveled in a single Pullman car specially hitched up to a locomotive. They had to secure Roosevelt's approval for U.S. Steel's takeover of Tennessee coal and iron before the stock market opened on Monday morning. They ended up interrupting Roosevelt in the middle of his breakfast. Mindful of the panic, T.R. said it was no public duty of his to interpose any objections. In other words, the Sherman Antitrust Act wouldn't be used against U.S. Steel. Five minutes before the stock market opened at 10 a.m., Gary called 23 Wall Street from the White House and told George Perkins that the president had agreed to the plan. The stock market rallied on the news. Immediately, there were charges that Pierpont had duped Roosevelt into scuttling his antitrust policy and sanctioning, under duress, an anti-competitive steel merger. Wisconsin Senator Robert La Follette even said the bankers had rigged up the panic for their own profit. Certainly, the $45 million distress sale price of Tennessee coal and iron was a steal. Financial analyst John Moody later said that the company's property had a potential value of about $1 billion. Grant B. Schley, head of Moore and Schley, also admitted later that his firm could have been rescued by an outright cash infusion rather than the purchase of the Tennessee coal stock. So there was far more than altruism at work in the famous all-night rescue of the firm. Despite this controversy, Pierpont reached the zenith of his influence with the 1907 panic. As his biographer Frederick Lewis Allen wrote, where there had been many principalities, there was now one kingdom, and it was Morgan's. Pierpont was suddenly not a pirate, but a sage. Woodrow Wilson, then president of Princeton University, said the nation should be advised on its future by a panel of intellectuals, and he recommended Pierpont Morgan as its chairman. The tributes, nonetheless, coincided with new concern about America's financial system. U.S. financial panics recurred with worrisome regularity every ten years. The 1907 panic exposed many systemic defects. As people hoarded money and banks called in loans, there was no central bank to instill confidence or offset the sudden credit contraction, 
sharp drops in the money supply then led to severe recessions. The country needed an elastic currency and a permanent lender of last resort. From the ashes of 1907 arose the Federal Reserve System. Everybody saw that thrilling rescues by corpulent old tycoons were a tenuous prop for the banking system. Senator Nelson W. Aldrich declared, "'Something has got to be done. We may not always have Pierpont Morgan with us to meet a banking crisis.' By confirming his storied powers, Pierpont also inadvertently fostered talk of an omnipotent Wall Street money trust. President Roosevelt now recommended federal regulation of the stock exchanges, while New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes wanted margin requirements raised from 10 to 20 percent. If these suggestions had been enacted, the country might have been spared some of the lurid excesses of the 1929 crash. The one direct consequence of the 1907 panic was a universal clamor for banking reform. In 1908, Congress passed the Aldrich Vreeland Currency Act, which created the National Monetary Commission to study changes in the banking system. The commission was chaired by Senator Aldrich of Rhode Island, and the House of Morgan quickly moved to exert influence on it. Perkins cabled Pierpont in London that he and George F. Baker, the walrus-mustached head of the First National Bank, had stayed away from Washington, lest the new legislation be seen as a Wall Street plot. At the same time, Perkins sent a coded cable saying that Harry Davison, Baker's young protege, would be Aldrich's advisor. It is understood that Davison is to represent our views, and will be particularly close to Senator Aldrich. Davison had been Pierpont's cool lieutenant during the 1907 panic, and had greatly impressed him. When the Aldrich Commission was about to depart for a tour of Europe's central banks, Davison went ahead to confer with Pierpont, who wanted a private central bank on the Bank of England model. Davison would be the only banker to accompany the senators and congressmen on their mission. A central bank was by no means supported by all Democrats. William Jennings Bryan and the populists feared that a central bank would be dominated by the same hard-money men who ran Wall Street. They saw it as an institution that would slay the Silverites. In many ways, the concept was associated more with conservative hard-money men. Pierpont was amenable to central banks so long as they were private and had boards composed of bankers. As Pierpont's man on the commission, Davison reflected his mentor's uncompromising preference for banker rather than politician control of a central bank. He also expected such a bank to introduce a level playing field and end the competitive advantage of the trusts. In November 1910, in what was billed to the press as a duck-shooting holiday, Davison, now a Morgan partner, and other Wall Street bankers met secretly at the Jekyll Island Club a palm-shaded seaside compound of turreted buildings off the Georgia coast and a favorite Morgan hideaway. Known as the resort of the 100 millionaires, Jekyll Island claimed among its organizers Pierpont's chum, George F. Baker. Pierpont kept an apartment in its Sans Souci building. The Jekyll Island meeting would be the fountain of a thousand conspiracy theories. Here, Wall Street bankers worked out their plan for a central bank under private aegis a system of regional reserve banks topped by a governing board of commercial bankers. Davison, an architect of the meeting, not only got a suspicious station master in Brunswick, Georgia, to keep quiet about his suspicions, but often led the discussion. As Paul M. Warburg of Kuhn Loeb, one of the key theoreticians at the meeting, later said, Davison had an uncanny gift in sensing the proper moment for changing the topic for giving the discussion a timely new turn, thus avoiding a clash or deadlock. When Senator Aldrich presented his bill for a central bank to Congress in 1910, the Democrats blocked it. In 1913, Congressman Carter Glass, a Virginia Democrat, used it as the basis for the Federal Reserve Act, although making extensive modifications. President Wilson successfully demanded that the system of twelve private regional reserve banks be placed under a central political authority, a Washington board that would include the Treasury Secretary and presidential appointees. Progressives hoped the Federal Reserve would reduce the House of Morgan's unique power. As we shall see, the truth was far more complex. 
for the bank would skillfully harness the Fed and use it to amplify its powers. In an ironic outcome, unforeseen by reformers, it would become the private bank of choice for central banks throughout the world, giving it an incalculable new advantage. When the Republican president, William Howard Taft, took office in 1909, the wily George Perkins flattered himself, thinking that he had already wormed his way into its inner council. Taft sent him a confidential draft of his inaugural address, which was, in all respects, conciliatory and harmonizing in tone, Perkins reported to Pierpont. He felt convinced Taft would water down the troublesome Sherman Antitrust Act. In coded cables to Morgan, who was vacationing in Egypt, Perkins made it sound as if he alone had picked the new cabinet. Acting on suggestion made solely by me two weeks ago, Franklin McVeigh, Chicago, has been selected for Secretary of Treasury. Wickersham will be Attorney General, and other places are filled to our entire satisfaction. Yet the one-term Taft administration would be deeply ambivalent toward the House of Morgan. On the surface, it would seem even more hostile than Roosevelt's, and surprisingly aggressive in battling the trusts. It filed antitrust suits against two cherished Morgan progeny, U.S. Steel and International Harvester. The Taft years also saw the dismemberment of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Trust and James B. Duke's American Tobacco Trust. For all his windy attacks on the trusts, Teddy Roosevelt had been far more circumspect about translating his words into tough action. Yet there was more to the Taft-Morgan relationship than a progressive crusade against a Wall Street cabal. If trust-busting made good political theater, the deeper story was one of foreign collaboration. Even as Washington chastised the banks at home, it was forging them into foreign loan syndicates in a new age of dollar diplomacy. With the U.S. defeat of Spain and the colonization of the Philippines and Puerto Rico, the country had acquired a new taste for imperialist adventure, and the House of Morgan would be one of its main instruments. Henceforth, much of the Morgan saga revolves around incestuous dealings between the Morgan banks in New York and London and their respective governments, intrigue that would drape them in mysterious new raiment. The baronial age was one of unbridled laissez-faire, marked by often unqualified hostility on the part of bankers toward government. But in the dawning diplomatic age, there would be an explicit fusion of financial and government power. In time, it would become hard to disentangle the House of Morgan from various aspects of Anglo-American policy. Yet there would also be spectacular instances in which Morgan policy would take on a clandestine life of its own, diverging from official dictates. The new alliance was mutually advantageous. Washington wanted to harness the new financial power to coerce foreign governments into opening their markets to American goods or adopting pro-American policies. The banks, in turn, needed levers to force debt repayment and welcomed the government's police powers in distant places. The threat of military intervention was an excellent means by which to speed loan repayment. When Kuhn Loeb considered a loan to the Dominican Republic, backed by customs receipts, Jacob Schiff inquired of his London associate, Sir Ernest Castle, If they do not pay, who will collect these customs duties? Castle replied, Your Marines and ours. During its first year, the Taft administration recruited the House of Morgan in a scheme to create a financial protectorate over Honduras and bail out British bondholders at the same time. As part of a debt settlement, the bank would buy up old Honduran bonds, which were selling at a steep discount in London. Secretary of State Philander Knox would then impose an American lien on Honduran custom house receipts and sell new Honduran bonds through a Morgan syndicate. The scheme would be backed up by American military might. Although Senator William Alden Smith, for one, was irate that the State Department supported the Morgan scheme, the bank had actually been dragooned by the government. Serving only prime government clients, the House of Morgan had a supercilious attitude toward small, backward countries. As Jack said in a cable to the London office, negotiations only undertaken because the U.S. government anxious get Honduras settled. He and Harry Davison refused to proceed without a treaty that provided ironclad guarantees for the bonds.
After enraged mobs besieged the Honduran Assembly, protesting threats to their sovereignty, the U.S. Senate vetoed the deal, and the operation was scrapped. The new era was most vividly adumbrated in China. As with Honduras, the House of Morgan had no great relish for such a foreign operation. Backward and sprawling, lacking a central army in modern budgeting, fin de siècle China had proved exasperating for foreign bankers. Its officials excelled in playing off one group of foreign creditors against another. The bankers were accused of exploiting the same strategy with Chinese officials. This not only bred resentment among bankers, but fostered a decided Wall Street prejudice in favor of China's ancient enemy, Japan. The French, Germans, and British were already well entrenched in China, controlling their own spheres of influence. The European bankers had entered the picture in the late 19th century, when provincial Chinese merchants lacked the necessary capital to build railroads. In 1899, Secretary of State John Hay had declared an open-door policy toward China that was supposed to guarantee unrestricted foreign access. Under Taft, however, the open door was converted into a blunt U.S. demand for inclusion in China on an equal basis with the European powers. In 1909, the State Department prodded a reluctant Wall Street to undertake Chinese business. A consortium of British, French, and German banks had nearly completed negotiations for a $25 million loan for the Huquang Railway, which ran from Shanghai to Canton. Much to the Europeans' dismay, the State Department demanded an equal share for U.S. bankers. As Herbert Crowley wrote, the majority of these bankers had gone into the group not because they were seeking Chinese investments, but in order to oblige the administration. The State Department placed the House of Morgan at the head of the American Bankers Group that included Kuhn Loeb, the National City Bank, and the First National Bank. Only a few years before, these firms had viciously quarreled during the Northern Pacific Corner. Now, Washington was welding them into an instrument of national purpose, believing that banker unity would magnify American influence abroad. When Jack cabled his father in London about the arrangement, Pierpont couldn't suppress his competitive instincts. "'Strikes me favorably,' he responded, "'but, strictly confidential, and for your own use only, important J.P.M. and Company take lead and name mentioned first. Suppose fact already recognized, but must not be overlooked.' The American group met at 23 Wall Street, with Harry Davison in the chair, but the State Department pulling the strings. Ordinarily commanding and good-humored, Davison chafed at the controls. He instructed Teddy Grenfell in London, "'Think it would be very wise if you would casually but firmly point out to those with whom you come in contact that this is a proposition of the government and not of the bankers.' The popular press applauded the latest salvo in the Morgan White House wars and fancied that trustbusters now had bankers on the run. Meanwhile, Davison moaned, continue to be governed entirely by wishes of State Department. For bankers, who had prided themselves in their fierce independence from government, this new straitjacket was hard to tolerate. Teddy Grenfell, partner in J.S. Morgan & Company, soon to be Morgan Grenfell, represented the American group in its dealings with the British, French, and German banker groups of the Chinese consortium. Now and in the future, he would be an important intermediary between 23 Wall Street and the British government. Bolted together internally, the Morgan banks acted autonomously in many matters. It was a tricky situation, fraught with conflicts, for the New York and London houses were always sensitive to requests from their respective governments. In 1908, for example, J.S. Morgan & Company withheld a Turkish loan at the Foreign Office's behest, then extended it the following year when bureaucratic winds shifted. So long as British and American interests coincided, this situation posed no problem. But a conflict was buried here that would later tear apart the Anglo-American Morgan Empire. However much it might camouflage it, the House of Morgan wasn't a multinational bank, but an American bank with partnerships abroad. Many times it would be impossible to appease both the United States and Britain. From 1909 to 1913, the American group served as a conduit for all Morgan dealings with China. 
Its representative in China was the most dashing, adventurous agent in Morgan history, Willard Dickerman Strait. Strait's life reads like a spy thriller. Fresh out of Cornell, he worked for the Imperial Maritime Customs Service in Peking and studied Mandarin. In 1904, he went to Japan to report on the Russo-Japanese War for Reuters and the Associated Press. A friend in those years described him as tall, slim, with reddish-brown hair, of unusual frankness and charm of manner. While reporting from Seoul, Korea, he met Edward H. Harriman at a dinner, an experience that transformed his life. Harriman then controlled the Union Pacific Railroad and the Pacific Mail Steamship Line, which he saw as the first two legs of a round-the-world transportation system. He recruited the enthusiastic Strait to win the critical China rail link. Then, in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt invited Strait to the White House, saying he was signing up bright young Ivy Leaguers to join the Foreign Service and drum up business for American companies abroad. To assist Harriman's venture, Roosevelt assigned Strait, then only in his twenties, to be the U.S. Consul General in Mukden, a bustling rail center in Manchuria. He would be the sole State Department representative north of the Great Wall. In those days, Manchuria was colorfully described as the cockpit of Asia, the place where Russian and Japanese imperial interests clashed and European powers vied for influence. Nobody could have savored this romantic crossroads more than Willard Strait. He was an improbable mix of frank imperialist and young idealist, viewing American bankers as a buffer against Japanese and Russian encroachment in Manchuria. Cloaking dollar diplomacy in a mantle of altruism, he thought unity among foreign bankers would prevent any single country from exploiting China. This argument would eventually be exposed as a self-serving American delusion, but Strait was young and ardent, and easily convinced himself of his mission of salvation. An intimate of mandarins in the Manchu court, he had a poetic sensibility, sketching watercolors of cued street vendors and illustrating a book about China. He sang Kipling-esque lyrics as he strummed his guitar and loved the themes of imperial conquest. His letters were spiced with vivid, exotic imagery, describing China as the storm center of world politics, a place where everyone more or less is spying on everyone else. In 1909, he met one of America's richest heiresses, Dorothy Whitney, and they became engaged two years later. She was the orphaned daughter of William C. Whitney, a former Navy secretary who had made a fortune in tobacco, traction, automobiles, and stock market speculation, and she had inherited $7 million. Recently president of the Junior League in New York, she was touring China when she met Strait. She had a wild, romantic sensibility that matched his own. In Peking, she recalled, they walked along the city wall at sunset time and watched the soft glow of the distant purple hills. Dorothy and Willard Strait would pass through the turbulence of revolutionary China with the cool insouciance of a couple in an elegant Hollywood farce. In 1909, Strait was appointed representative of the American Bankers Group. He had enough youthful idealism to be disturbed by much of what he saw within the group. During the summer of 1910, he worked at 23 Wall Street. He thought the address a good omen because the street number was the same as Dorothy's birthday, and was appalled at the way the House of Morgan bossed around the State Department. Davison might chafe at government control, but Strait saw things quite differently. When Pierpont instructed Davison, you might as well make it clear that when we want to discuss things with the U.S. government, we want the Secretary of State and not the Assistant Secretary, Strait commented sardonically, it was not difficult to see where the real power lies in this country. Pierpont might have been so imperious because the Secretary of State was Philander C. Knox who, as Attorney General under Roosevelt, had filed the suit against the Northern Securities Company. Knox dutifully came to 23 Wall whenever he wished to speak to the American group. In 1910, the China enterprise expanded beyond the railway loan to include a massive $50 million loan to China for currency reform. Willard rhapsodized about the new loan to Dorothy. It's history, and big history at that, the game for an empire. 
The Chinese objected to a provision that required a Western advisor as a new overseer of Chinese finances. As a compromise, a Dutchman was unobtrusively slipped into the post. In 1911, Strait and representatives from England, France, and Germany signed the loan with Chinese officials. Willard wrote excitedly to Dorothy, We have arranged it so that we can practically dictate the terms of China's currency reform. When you think of holding the whip hand in formulating the first real sound financial basis for a country of 400 million, it's quite a proposition. The loan generated worldwide publicity and made Strait an instant hero. Along with his prestigious association with the House of Morgan, the China loan helped reconcile Dorothy's family to her marrying beneath her social station. Teddy Roosevelt interceded to plead Willard's cause. Dorothy belonged to the polo-playing set of Locust Valley and Westbury, two Long Island communities rich in Morgan partners. Robert Bacon and his wife had been almost substitute parents after her own parents died, and she knew Pierpont as well. Dear Mr. J.P., he's such a sweetie underneath the sternness, she wrote to Willard. In fact, Strait may have clung to the Morgan position longer than he wanted to because of its social utility. Strait's naive hopes about the China loan were soon to be dashed by geopolitical realities. He and the bankers had cast their lot with the corrupt Manchu dynasty, which was oblivious to turmoil beyond the palace walls. Strait himself grew disillusioned with the selfish, narrow-minded bigotry of the Chinese officials. Yet he wanted to perpetuate the Manchu dynasty to save the loan. He was caught up with the wrong issues. He was worrying about the composition of banking syndicates and missed the popular revulsion from all foreign bankers. At a Paris conference on China's finances in 1912, the Japanese and Russians demanded and obtained inclusion in the China Consortium. This was Strait's nightmare. The group now included China's traditional enemies. Bankers, he saw, couldn't operate in a void, but were enmeshed in larger political forces. Gloomily, he foresaw, the inevitable day when China's finances will be administered like Egypt's, by an international board. Another dream shattered. In 1911, a nationalist revolution in China, fueled partly by resentment of foreign bankers, ousted the Manchu dynasty and declared a republic. The liberal activist Dorothy Strait was sympathetic to the revolutionaries. In January 1912, Sun Yat-sen became provisional president, heading a movement seeking to unify China and stop foreign meddling. Willard and Dorothy witnessed the panicky exodus of Manchu nobles from a Peking aflutter with radical banners. Willard slept with a loaded revolver by his side. The imaginative Dorothy thrived on the danger, writing, It would be rather exciting to be attacked by a wild mob in the night. One evening, as the Straits were getting ready to dine with a British neighbor, shooting did erupt nearby. As Willard recalled, The pop-pop-popping continued, and our roof lines stood out sharply against the glow of the first fire. I told Dorothy that it looked like trouble. She didn't mind a bit, but went on dressing for dinner, calm as you please, and objected strenuously when I advised her to get into street dress in order that, if necessary, we could clear out to the legation. During a pause in the fighting, they made it over to the neighbors for dinner. But then soldiers began smashing and looting stores nearby. After gathering up their maid and proper clothing, they fled for the safety of the legation, but were trapped by rioters on a dead-end street. Finally, they were rescued by a contingent of American Marines. Piling into a rickshaw, bags strapped to the back, Dorothy and Willard managed to thread their way through pillaging mobs to the legation. This Morgan foray into China ended with Woodrow Wilson's election and the elevation of that Morgan bete noir, William Jennings Bryan, to Secretary of State. On March 10, 1913, Harry Davison and Willard Strait visited the new Secretary of State in Washington. Unlike Knox, Bryan would never deign to travel to 23 Wall Street. Bryan asked them flat out what the group expected from Washington if China defaulted. Davison didn't mince words and said the government might be called upon to utilize both its military and naval forces to protect the interests of the lenders. Neither Bryan nor Wilson sympathized with such foreign meddling. A week later, 
Wilson denounced the loan as obnoxious to the principles upon which the government of our people rests. The government was obviously withdrawing its support. The next day, the American Bankers Group was effectively disbanded. As a creature of Washington, it couldn't survive without its blessing. Most bankers were relieved, for they had come to doubt China's willingness to repay the loan. The end of the China business wasn't mourned within the House of Morgan, either. As Teddy Grenfell, who had been consumed by it, wrote to Jack, I think that all of us will have China written on our hearts when we die, with several uncomplimentary epithets after it. Yet the experience had bridged differences among big Wall Street banks and made them accustomed to working together abroad. Morgan's National City and First National arrived at an understanding for participating together in all Latin lending. This Big Three arrangement would vastly magnify Morgan power. Kuhn Loeb often formed a fourth member of their syndicates. These same banks, ironically, would shortly be hauled before the Pujo Committee as the Abominable Money Trust. What the public wouldn't know was that the Money Trust had been forged in part by Washington itself in its quest for foreign influence. The new age of banker-government collaboration mellowed even the vehemently anti-government Jack Morgan. After wrangling with Washington over a Honduran loan in 1912, he cabled Grenfell, You will understand we do not wish accuse our own government too loudly in view of necessary relations with them other foreign matters. No less ideologically hostile to government than his father, Jack saw the need to mute his public anger. The days of brusque individualism were dead. Willard Strait returned to work at 23 Wall, but never fit into a mundane office setting. In the 1912 election, he and Dorothy supported their friend from Oyster Bay, Teddy Roosevelt, an act that must have savored of subversive tendencies among the Morgan partners. They also secretly read Louis Brandeis's attack against Morgan's handling of the New Haven Railroad. In 1914, they were the financial angels for a new political weekly, The New Republic, which initially had a strongly pro-Roosevelt slant. Harry Davison and other partners spurned the chance to participate, and only Thomas Lamont joined them. Restless and adventurous, Willard found it hard to submit to a banker's discipline and chafed at not being made a Morgan partner. He was always concocting new schemes, such as the creation of India House on New York's Hanover Square, a club dedicated to foreign trade which he outfitted with model ships and antiques. In the end, even the spacious universe of J.P. Morgan and Company would be too confining for the large, venturesome spirit of Willard Strait. He would last only another two years at the bank. Chapter 8 Titanic. Morose and fatalistic in his last years, Pierpont felt misunderstood by the public and angered by the uproar over his trusts. He shook his cane menacingly at reporters, a murderous gleam in his eyes. He wouldn't admit to legitimate public curiosity about his affairs. At Dover House in 1911, he burned the bound letters he had sent to Junius for thirty-three years, destroying perhaps the most important chronicle of Anglo-American finance in the late nineteenth century. He craved a privacy impossible for the world's most famous banker. Like a ghost, he brooded in the west room of his library, beneath stained-glass windows and thick draperies that muffled the sounds of a changing world. He spent much of his time in Europe, escaping the din of progressive politics, his wanderlust never deserted him. From European spas, he would notify Jack of the next stop on his itinerary, adding those ever-awkward words, Advise Mother. He felt at home in many places. Once asked to name his favorite spots, he replied, New York, because it is my home, London, because it is my second home, Rome, and Carga. Egypt, in particular, held a mystical charm for him, and he visited it three times in his last three years and helped to bankroll the Metropolitan Museum's Egyptian excavations. One 1909 photograph shows an oversized pierpont on a small donkey galloping into the desert ahead of his flabbergasted guides. The excavations at Karga, 400 miles southwest of Cairo, so intrigued him that he asked Thomas Cook and Sons to construct a steel Nile steamer named the Karga. 
From this paddle-wheel boat, he would pitch coins into the water, which were fished up by boys diving from the Nile's bank. Pierpont was a lonely man, and fame probably only deepened his isolation. His first biographer, Carl Hovey, wrote, It is said there are scarcely fifty men in the financial district who have a speaking acquaintance with Morgan. Pierpont had a wide business acquaintance, but few associates knew him well. Hence, he relied on his family for emotional sustenance. This made especially bruising a feud with his youngest child, Anne Tracy, who was six years Jack's junior. Pierpont Morgan could conquer the world, but not his daughter Anne. She was an athletic, spirited girl who liked golf and tennis and rebelled against her formal upbringing. Of all Pierpont's children, Anne most resembled him temperamentally. She was bright, stubborn, imperious, and highly opinionated. Elizabeth Drexel, later the wife of socialite Harry Lear, recalled her as a thin, lanky child with an elfin face and penetrating eyes, but with a personality and a will as strong as Pierpont's own, and a disconcerting habit of putting her elders in the wrong. Once, at a dinner party with Pierpont's cronies, her father peered down the table and asked her what she planned to be when she grew up. "'Something better than a rich fool, anyway,' she snapped. Despite these jibes, she was close to her father and often accompanied him to Europe aboard Corsair III. Once, she served as host to the Kaiser aboard the yacht. By the early 1900s, Anne, now in her early thirties, had grown into a tall young woman with short hair swept back on the sides, a strong nose, dark eyebrows, and her father's intense gaze. She had his executive talents and childlike simplicity, and hated cartoonists who mocked her father's nose. She was big and somewhat matronly, but also stylish in dress. In 1903, Daisy Harriman, a famous Washington hostess, brought her in as a founder of the Colony Club, the first American ladies' club, patterned after a British gentleman's club. At 30th Street and Madison Avenue, it was designed by Stanford White and had a marble swimming pool and Turkish baths. Rules forbade men above the first floor. Pierpont had no sympathy for the project and lectured the ladies that a woman's best and safest club is her own home. Predictably, Dorothy Whitney was an early member. During the founding of this project, Anne met two older women who would change her life. One was the stoutly mannish Bessie Marbury, the American theatrical agent for George Bernard Shaw and Oscar Wilde. The other was Elsie de Wolf the voguish former society girl and actress, now a famed interior designer for her work on the Colony Club. In 1908, Anne, 35, entered into a menage a trois with these two women at their Villa Trianon in Versailles. With its formal gardens, topiary, and trimmed lawns, the Villa Trianon was an incongruously aristocratic setting for such a daring arrangement. De Wolf designed a dressing room that fit Anne's contradictory nature. On its formal mantelpiece were both a French bust and a leopard-skin velvet rug. Over the years, these three patrician ladies pioneered in many cultural areas. They opened a Broadway dance hall and sponsored Cole Porter's first musical. They also took up many liberal and feminist causes. Anne supported the strike by women shirtwaist workers, a largely Jewish group, inspected the sanitary conditions in factories, opened a temperance restaurant in Brooklyn, started a thrift association and vacation fund for young working women, and championed women's suffrage. On December 31, 1908, she lunched at the White House to discuss social welfare with Teddy Roosevelt, who may well have savored the idea of Pierpont's extreme discomfort. Anne's exposure to her father's business friends bred considerable cynicism in her. When Lincoln Steffens once told her he liked Judge Gary of U.S. Steel, she said impatiently, Oh, he's too plausible. He is taking you in as he does others. Pierpont was outraged by Anne's liberal, unconventional behavior. If the three women were discreet about their private affairs, even DeWolf's biographer shrinks from using the word lesbian, they threw gala parties that attracted attention. Bernard Berenson attended their gatherings, as did Pierpont's mistress Maxine Elliott, who had acted with de Wolf. The chain-smoking Anne was in an agonizing situation. As one of the world's richest young women, she was relentlessly courted by titled Europeans, 
scandal sheets frequently reported her upcoming engagement to the French Count Bonny de Castellan, which never came about. All the while, she dove deeper into causes and took stands that aligned her with her father's critics. The facts of the rift between Pierpont and Anne are fragmentary. De Wolfe's biographer, Jane S. Smith, says Pierpont thought that Bessie Marbury had poisoned Anne's mind against him. She apparently told Anne that Pierpont used her to cover up his trysts with mistresses when Anne accompanied him to Europe on Corsair III. Pierpont's other children violently disagreed with this interpretation. Pierpont's middle daughter, Juliet, bristled at references to De Wolfe, while Jack was deeply upset by Anne's behavior. In her memoirs, Marbury handled the controversy tactfully. Mr. Morgan was patriarchal in his views. The emancipated women enjoyed no favor in his eyes. Therefore, as his daughter, she grew up determined that she must think for herself. She also said of him, To acknowledge defeat was foreign to his temperament. He was always loyal to his mistakes. Pierpont was wounded by the estrangement. It broke her father's heart when she elected to part from him one of Anne's friends told Clarence Barron. As we have seen, Pierpont could be grimly implacable when crossed, and he blamed Bessie Marbury for stealing away his daughter. Hence, he found an ingenious way to torture her. Marbury coveted the French Legion of Honor and believed she deserved it for her work in officially representing French dramatists in the English-speaking world. By chance, in 1909, Robert Bacon, the ex-Greek god of Wall Street, was named ambassador to France. Bowing to Pierpont's wishes, he made sure she was denied the honor. Knowing that the House of Morgan objected prevented Bessie Marbury from ever receiving the government award, even after she spent years raising money for France and donated her Versailles home as a hospital during World War I. De Wolfe won the Croix de Guerre, and Anne was decorated as a commander of the Legion of Honor for running an ambulance corps and performing relief work. But Marbury, notwithstanding letters of praise from former Presidents Roosevelt and Taft, couldn't overcome the French fears of offending Morgan interests. Even beyond his grave, Pierpont Morgan would not be thwarted. Pierpont's relationship with Jack improved in his last years, perhaps in reaction to his troubles with Anne and Fanny. Nobody doubted that Jack would take over at the corner, if only because the bank needed the Morgan name and money. Jack was no slouch and ably handled affairs in his father's absence. Yet he didn't have Pierpont's gargantuan ego. Since boyhood, he had been plagued by secret doubts about himself. It wasn't clear to him whether he had the intestinal fortitude to head a banking empire. In 1910, he had a collapse that was diagnosed as strain and fatigue. So, for a number of reasons, he wanted a strong lieutenant— a powerful regent to take charge of the bank on a day-to-day -day basis. He preferred the role of constitutional monarch, shaping policy and delegating authority. Two people competed for the position, Harry Davison and George Perkins. Perkins carried several liabilities. He was always shadowed by the insurance scandal from his years at New York Life. But the cause of Perkins's downfall would be that he saw himself as a king in his own right, not simply a Morgan vassal. At his Riverdale estate, he had nine servants, a swimming pool, a ballroom, and a bowling alley. In 1906, he bought the world's largest custom-made car, an 11-foot French monstrosity with ebony woodwork, a writing desk, and a washstand table. His worst sin may have been not showing due deference to the Morgans. He sneered at Jack and thought he was more highly qualified to run the bank. He sometimes made decisions without consulting the Morgans. In 1910, Pierpont told Harry Davison in London that Perkins had defied his wishes on a financing arrangement for the Studebaker Company, news that Davison passed along to Perkins. Perkins then wrote to Pierpont, saying, I am very deeply disturbed by one remark that Davison made, that is, that you felt I had gone ahead and deliberately disregarded an understanding with you and concluded the business to suit myself. Six months later, Perkins left the bank. He was apparently forced out. Tom Lamont later said that Perkins didn't leave of his own accord. Morgan thought he had been a little second-rate on some deals. When he resigned, Perkins took $5.5 million of his own securities out of the bank, one of many fortunes harvested at the House of Morgan. 
For those skilled at reading the tea leaves, it grew clear that Henry Pomeroy Davison would become chief operating executive. After he became a partner in January 1909, he seemed to have almost exclusive access to Pierpont in his library. As was clear in the 1907 panic, the handsome Davison had star quality, a square-jawed toughness noticed by everyone on Wall Street. He had grown up in a small Pennsylvania town, the son of a farm tools dealer and poor relation in a family of bankers. He skipped college when Harvard denied his scholarship application. He had a steely, distinguished look, long eyebrows, hair parted down the middle, and a wide, firm mouth. Davison started out working for a bank in Bridgeport, Connecticut. One bank director was P.T. Barnum, who liked him and invited him to join a weekly whist game. In 1893, Davison married Kate Truby, and they moved to New York so Harry could start work at the Astor Trust Company. One day, a crank appeared at his teller's window, pointed a gun at Davison, and passed him a $1 million check he wanted to cash, payable to the Almighty. The cool, quick-witted Davison figured out a way to foil the holdup. He doled out the money in small bills, and kept saying in a loud, reverential voice, A million dollars for the Almighty. This gave a bank guard time to notify the police, who arrested the man. Davison rose quickly as a protege of George F. Baker, Pierpont's jowly, side-whiskered chum and head of the First National Bank. He moved from the Astor Trust to another Baker bank, the Liberty. Then Baker said, Davison, I think you'd better move your desk up here with us. And he became a First National Vice President. While there, he organized Bankers Trust in 1903, assisted in the 1907 panic negotiations, and represented Wall Street on Senator Aldrich's National Monetary Commission. These exploits won the attention of Pierpont, who later said, I always believe everything Mr. Davison tells me. Anecdotes about Davison convey rigor, geniality, and self-confidence. Manly and decisive, he shot moose in Maine and elephant, buffalo, rhino, hippos, and antelope during a shooting trip up the White Nile. Once he dreamed he was a small-town Pennsylvania bank clerk. In a sweat, he couldn't balance the books. When he awoke, his wife asked what had happened. I finally solved the problem. I bought the bank, he replied. Immensely sociable, he seldom sat down to dine at his North Shore estate, Peacock Point, with fewer than twenty guests. Taking people under his wing, he had a way of guiding them, sometimes brusquely and a bit intrusively. He was the great talent scout in Morgan history, and brought Tom Lamont, Dwight Morrow, Ben Strong, and John Davis into the bank's orbit. Tom Lamont said that to young bankers on Wall Street, Davison was not simply a leader— he was a king, an idol, if you please. Lamont was Davison's most important find. After college, he had worked for two years as a reporter on the New York Tribune. Later, he would brilliantly parlay this fleeting experience into an image of himself as an old newspaper man. After salvaging a failing import-export house through clever newspaper advertisements, he renamed it Lamont Corliss & Company. On Wall Street, he acquired a reputation for straightening out troubled companies. This caught the attention of Harry Davison, his neighbor in Englewood, New Jersey. Tom Lamont never pushed or clawed his way to the top. He did everything easily, jauntily, effortlessly. In 1903, at the age of 33, he was returning home on the commuter train to Englewood when Harry Davison took his life in hand. As he entered the car, Davison was musing about choices for a secretary-treasurer post at the new banker's trust. When Lamont appeared, Davison saw his man. Lamont laughed at the offer. But I don't know the first thing about banking. All my brief business life I have been borrowing money, not lending it. Fine, said Davison. That's just why we want you. A fearless borrower like you ought to make a prudent lender. It was a momentous intuition. Lamont followed in Davison's footsteps, taking his spot as vice president at First National Bank in 1909. In late 1910, Pierpont summoned him. "'You see that room over there? It's vacant,' he said. "'Beginning next Monday, I want you to occupy it.' Lamont professed bewilderment. "'But what can I do for you that is worthwhile?' he asked. 
Oh, you'll find plenty to keep you busy. Just do whatever you see before you that needs to be done. Was Lamont's reluctance simple candor or splendid calculation? Interestingly, with both Davison and Pierpont, Lamont refused the crown being proffered. He told Pierpont he had a dream of traveling three months each year. Far from being put off, Pierpont said, Why, of course, take off as much time as you like. That is entirely in your hands. He advised Lamont to take a cruise down the Nile, bringing along a couple of nurses for his children. There was again a certain guile in Lamont's handling of the offer. He must have known that Pierpont spent months abroad each year. Was he holding up a mirror to the old tycoon, saying tacitly, Look here, don't I remind you of yourself in younger days? Behind Lamont's urbane charm stood a man of exceptional talent, the more winning for its being presented with such apparent modesty. To complete preparations for the succession, Pierpont made his final disposition of J.S. Morgan and Company in London, stipulating that it survive for only a generation, or as long as Pierpont lived, Junius had permitted his name to be used posthumously. Now, the twenty years was about to elapse. Jack explained that, as we approached 1910, Father said, You will have trouble enough when I die without having to think of a new name for this firm, and I suggest that we should now change it to Morgan Grenfell and Company, and make J.P. Morgan and Company partners in it, they to keep one million pounds in capital. On January 1st, 1910, Morgan Grenfell was born. If it bore, for the first time, a British name, its prestige was guaranteed by its New York money and connections. While Teddy Grenfell's name lent a protective British coloring in the city, the capital remained largely American. Before 1910, Pierpont and Jack had been partners of J.S. Morgan & Company. Under the new dispensation, J.P. Morgan & Company itself would be a partner in London and draw half its profits along with Drexel & Company in Philadelphia. Significantly, this arrangement never worked in reverse. Partners at Morgan Grenfell in London or Morgan Hargis in Paris would thus hold second-class citizenship within the Morgan universe. The Morgan dynasty was always carefully arranged so that 23 Wall Street remained primum inter pares. During Pierpont's last year, he was beset by calamities, as if the gods were punishing him on a scale worthy of his grandeur. His shipping trust, the International Mercantile Marine, faced stiff competition from the Cunard Line, which had built the swift and luxurious Mauritania and Lusitania with British government subsidies. To counter Cunard, J. Bruce Ismay, president of the IMM, and Lord Peary, the shipbuilder, decided to build a pair of mammoth ships. Pierpont, always partial to grandiose ventures, approved the plan. The ships were White Star's Titanic and Olympic. The House of Morgan even lobbied the New York Harbor Board for a hundred-foot extension of a Hudson River pier so it could receive the twin ships. In May 1911, Pierpont attended the Belfast christening of the Titanic and studied the spot on B-deck where his personal suite would be. It would contain a parlor and promenade deck with timbered walls in Tudor style, and there would be special cigar holders in the bathroom. Though Pierpont and Vivian Smith of Morgan Grenfell both booked spots for the April 1912 maiden voyage, both had to cancel. Reports of a North Atlantic disaster reached Pierpont in France on the eve of his 75th birthday. "'Have just heard fearful rumor about Titanic with iceberg,' he wired New York, "'without any particulars. Hope for God's sake not true.' As the news spread, European reporters tried to track Pierpont down. When he was finally located in a French chateau, he seemed devastated. "'Think of the lives that have been mowed down.' and of the terrible deaths, he said. Over fifteen hundred people perished, including John Jacob Astor IV, George Widener, the son of P.A.B. Widener, and Benjamin Guggenheim. Survivors were picked up by the Cunard Line's Carpathia. It was a crowning disaster for the shipping trust, unleashing denunciations against both White Star and Morgan himself. The British-run but American-owned ship was charged with many deficiencies, an insufficient number of lifeboats, a crew who ignored warnings of icebergs, a poorly organized rescue, even failure to put binoculars in the crow's nest. 
Newspapers depicted luxurious staterooms laid out for Pierpont and others as proof of a misplaced emphasis on winning the carriage trade from Cunard rather than on safety. Though the Morgan partners had long regarded White Star Chairman Bruce Ismay as abrupt and ill-mannered, he had often threatened to quit, they stuck by him at first. Jack deplored the public drubbing that Ismay took, cabling the message that, from telegraphic accounts, his treatment New York infernally brutal. Later, Jack and Pierpont insisted he resign his post. The Titanic was the last nail in the coffin of the shipping trust. Although the cartel enjoyed a brief revival, as Morgan's export department sent war supplies to the Allies during World War I, that wasn't enough to keep it afloat. In October 1914, Jack Morgan decided it had to default on its bonds. Almost four years after the Titanic went down, White Star conceded responsibility in court, paying out $2.5 million in damages. In 1912, the crusade against the trusts had already reached a thunderous crescendo, as much of the presidential campaign revolved around Pierpont and his enterprises. Morgan represented everything that had bothered Americans for a generation— Factories thrown up helter-skelter across the landscape, brutal mergers, a carnival atmosphere on Wall Street that produced boomlets and busts in crazy, unending succession. A newspaper cartoon from 1912 shows Pierpont jovially sitting atop a heap of gold coins and dollar bills, clutching industrial plants and office buildings in his fist. The legend reads, I have not the slightest power. Indeed, the Morgans saw themselves not as financial pirates, but as public benefactors. When Harry Morgan was born in 1900, Jack noted a resemblance to Pierpont, and said he only hoped his son would help as many people in his lifetime as Pierpont had in his. This sense of virtue contrasted with the reality of their being the target of public calumny, leaving the Morgan family angry and bewildered. Progressive Democrats criticized the trusts as cruel and inefficient, and destructive of the entrepreneurial spirit. Bellwether of the new mood was Woodrow Wilson, then governor of New Jersey. He accused Republican-supported tariffs of shielding the trusts from foreign competition. In January 1910, while still president of Princeton, he had lectured an audience of New York bankers, including Pierpont and George F. Baker, on their duties, saying banking was founded on a moral basis, and not on a financial basis, and chiding them for penalizing small businesses. As Wilson spoke, Pierpont gloomily puffed on his cigar. Afterward, injured, he told Wilson the remarks seemed directed at him. Wilson, saying he meant no offense, contended that he spoke merely of principles. That the Democrats attacked Morgan wasn't surprising. Far more telling was how he became a divisive issue among Republicans and helped to split the party in 1912 over several issues. One involved a Morgan syndicate formed with the Guggenheims in 1906 to exploit the copper of the Kennecott Glacier in Alaska. This Morganheim group, as it was dubbed, had launched a veritable financial invasion of the state, buying up steamship lines, coal fields, and canneries, and investing $20 million in a railroad to carry copper ore to Prince William Sound on the coast. The press lampooned this second purchase of Alaska, and one cartoonist introduced a composite monster called Guggen Morgan. Such wholesale development of Alaska became a test case of the government's attitude toward wilderness areas. It pitted Gifford Pinchot, director of the U.S. Forest Service and a Teddy Roosevelt holdover, against Secretary of the Interior Richard Ballinger, a Taft appointee. Pinchot wanted to preserve the Alaskan wilderness for posterity, while Ballinger thought only the Guggenheim-Morgan combination could finance development in such a remote, costly spot. After public feuding between Pinchot and Ballinger, Taft dismissed Pinchot. When Teddy Roosevelt, on an African safari, heard about this, it fed his sense of having been betrayed by Taft. Toward the end of his second term, Roosevelt had decided not to file an antitrust suit against the Morgan Farm Equipment Trust International Harvester. In 1911, Taft not only filed such a suit, but later released papers purportedly showing that George W. Perkins had blocked an antitrust suit against Harvester back in 1907 by lobbying the head of the U.S. Bureau of Corporations, 
who warned Roosevelt not to antagonize the Morgan interests without any proof of major wrongdoing. In October 1911, the Taft administration lodged a suit against U.S. Steel in a further rebuff to the Morgans. Am horrified at character of Bill, which beyond everything I thought possible, Harry Davison wrote to the London partners. To the Paris partners, he denounced the cheap political methods of Taft and his associates. What made this especially galling to both Morgan and Roosevelt was the stress on U.S. Steel's acquisition of Tennessee coal and iron during the 1907 panic. This was the deal that Judge Gary and Henry Frick had gotten T.R. to approve during his breakfast. The former president was hypersensitive to allegations of having been hoodwinked. Defending his actions, Roosevelt said that the suit against U.S. Steel has brought vividly before our people the need for reducing to order our chaotic government policy as regards business. The combination of the Pinchot firing and the U.S. Steel and International Harvester suit helped convince Roosevelt to bolt from the Republicans in 1912 and run as presidential candidate of the Progressive or Bull Moose Party. The issue of Morgan influence still dogged Roosevelt because of the prominence in his campaign of ex-Morgan partner George W. Perkins. Perkins was furious about Taft's trust-busting. He urged Roosevelt to run, covered many of his pre-convention expenses, stage-managed the convention, and chaired the new party's executive committee. It was said he traveled so often to Oyster Bay to see Roosevelt that his chauffeur knew every pebble in the road, even in the dark. Among Roosevelt's progressive followers, there lurked residual fear that Pierpont had planted Perkins in the campaign. But Perkins had left the bank on bad terms, and this seems unlikely. The 1912 split between Taft and Roosevelt brought to power the man who had lectured Pierpont on his moral duty, Woodrow Wilson. Meanwhile, the U.S. steel suit miscarried, and International Harvester had to divest only three small subsidiaries. The intellectual and political leap most damaging to the House of Morgan was a spreading notion that a Wall Street trust had created the industrial trusts and governed their subsequent destiny. Minnesota Congressman Charles A. Lindbergh, Sr., father of the future aviator, coined the title Money Trust, describing it as the most sinister trust of all. Senator George Norris later said of Lindbergh's attack on the Money Trust that, the gentleman from Minnesota is entitled to more credit than any other member. The Wall Street Journal correctly noted that the Money Trust was just a code name for Morgan. Legions of young muckraking reporters fanned out across Wall Street and rooted out insidious banking connections. Aided by his young assistant, Walter Lippmann, Lincoln Steffens exposed a web of links among ostensibly competitive New York banks. His exposés in Everybody's Magazine termed Pierpont the boss of the United States. During the summer of 1912, swollen Wall Street power was a hot issue at the Democratic National Convention. In a hell-raising speech, William Jennings Bryan introduced a resolution stating opposition to the nomination of any candidate for president who is the representative or under obligation to J. Pierpont Morgan, Thomas F. Ryan, August Belmont, or any other member of the privilege-hunting and favor-seeking class. Wilson was more circumspect. While refusing contributions from Morgan, Belmont, and Ryan, he made exceptions for such financial notables as Jacob Schiff and Bernard Baruch. In accepting the nomination, Wilson said, a concentration of the control of credit may at any time become infinitely dangerous to free enterprise. That summer, he was tutored in economics by lawyer Louis Brandeis, who had combated Morgan control of the New Haven Railroad for several years. Financial reform would form a major part of Wilson's campaign. Congressman Lindbergh introduced a resolution in the House calling for a congressional probe into the concentration of power on Wall Street. The resulting 1912 hearings of the House Banking and Currency Committee were commonly known by the name of subcommittee chairman Arsène Pujol, a Louisiana Democrat, and they got into high gear after Wilson's victory in November 1912. Pierpont Morgan and his friends, colleagues, and partners were to be the star witnesses. The Pujol hearings are always portrayed as Pierpont's martyrdom, the public confrontation that led to his death. Of equal relevance to our story is their haunting effect on Jack Morgan. 
He had coped with the fear of his overpowering father by resorting to awestruck worship. As Pierpont returned the affection in later years, Jack's gratitude contained an extra element of relief, and he deeply resented the blistering political attacks against his father. A new bitterness, a darker shading, crept into his letters. As to attacks on the senior, he wrote Vivian Smith, owing to a laborious and prolonged press attack, in the public mind, J.P.M. is no longer a benefactor or a citizen who would be a credit to any country, but is an ogre lying in the background and always ready to devour. The politicians that run our two countries appear to have been seized with a madness, he told Grenfell. Our country is full of hatred and bitterness and talk. At first, Jack regarded the Pujo investigation as a nuisance. He took heart from the opinion of Morgan lawyer Francis Stetson that as a private bank they could withhold their books and refuse testimony. Jack even fancied Pierpont might lay out some constructive measures for Pujo's consideration. But in late April 1912, the committee chose as its counsel Samuel Untermeyer, a rich, shrewd New York trial lawyer whose pedigree collies had once beaten Pierpont's in competition. Untermeyer had already railed against the money trust, and Jack was aghast. Investigation will probably proceed now on as unpleasant lines as can be arranged he cabled his father. The hearings would sharpen Jack's hostility toward Jews, reporters, Democrats, reformers, all those troublemakers who stirred up the populace. Scarred by the experience, he would grow disenchanted with democracy and what he referred to as America's amateur government. The hearings occurred in December 1912, just as Pierpont hoped to wash his hands of worldly cares. The money kept rolling in, he was making about five million dollars a year, and the bank under Jack and Davison almost ran itself. Pierpont was probably more au courant on Egyptian excavations than on Wall Street underwritings. At first he brusquely said he would testify alone in Washington. But on the cusp of the diplomatic age a new accountability was expected, and bankers had to tend their images more prudently. The new team at 23 Wall adopted an aggressive attitude toward public relations, dramatically at odds with historical reticence. Silence was Wall Street's golden rule of conduct. Its leading exemplar was Pierpont's pal George F. Baker of the First National Bank, whose mutton-chop whiskers and gold watch chain across his paunch made him a prototypical Victorian banker. His bank was as mysterious as 23 Wall itself. Known as the Sphinx of Wall Street, Baker was director of more than 40 companies. He gave his first newspaper interview in 1863, and not another until 1923, when a young woman said she was promised a job if she gained access to the reclusive Baker. Breaking his silence, he said, "'Businessmen of America should reduce their talk two-thirds. Everyone should reduce his talk. There is rarely ever a reason enough for anybody to talk.' By then, Baker's fortune was estimated at between one hundred and three hundred million dollars. He would richly endow the Harvard Business School, in part through the intercession of Tom Lamont. As a private merchant, Pierpont felt no obligation to inform the public and never hired a publicist. Now, a new generation of Morgan partners took charge of a public relations offensive. Not only was Pierpont coached for the hearings by Davison and Lamont, but the bank hired its first publicist. It was the ideal moment for that quintessential banker of the new age, round-faced, smiling Tom Lamont. He laid out a secret plan, approved by Pierpont, that would govern Morgan Public Relations for a generation. To improve the bank's image, Morgan partners would meet with selected reporters, stay in touch with publishers, monitor newspapers, contribute articles, and privately protest critical articles to editors. Lamont's publicity operation for the Pujo hearings went beyond the lone publicist usually mentioned. An associate of his named Brainerd bought the big McClure's newspaper syndicate, which sold material to newspapers across America. This would be their vehicle for countering Pujo. Our idea is for Brainerd to continue this strictly sub rosa, Lamont cabled Davison, who replied, Much pleased learn of Brainerd's purchase. Find Senior and others here much impressed with the importance of doing something promptly. 
we all agreed it is most important have publicity men put to work sub rosa at once on money trust investigation. This flowered into a full-blown scheme for entering publishing. Along with Wall Street friends, the Morgan partners planned to buy papers in major cities, Washington, Chicago, and New York, and purchase two newspaper groups that sold inserts to papers around the country. This part of the campaign apparently lapsed, as did negotiations to buy the Washington Post, but the moves reflected a new wish to shape opinion and emerge from the old Morgan cocoon of secrecy. Instead of going alone to Washington, as he first hoped, Pierpont headed a sixteen-person entourage. The morning of the hearings, he emerged from a big, high-topped limousine and marched up the steps of the Capitol in striped pants, a velvet-colored coat, and silk top hat, grasping a cane. An immense crowd ringed the block. Pierpont was the most famous banker on earth. He was flanked by his daughter Louisa, her hands stuffed deep in a fur muff and her mouth tight with prim disapproval, and Jack, who wore a derby hat, his black mustache flecked with gray. As Pierpont sat in the hearing room, he wore the tragic mask of an old clown, his head mostly hairless, his nose bulbous and grotesquely gnarled, his posture erect and stubbornly proud. The Pujo hearings are celebrated for Pierpont's triumphant retorts and spirited defense of his business honor. In a moment we shall hear the well-worn phrases. But let us first note the awesome Morgan power that was revealed, lest the money trust theorists seem malcontents. Some seventy-eight major corporations, including many of the country's most powerful holding companies, banked at Morgan's. Pierpont and his partners, in turn, held seventy-two directorships in one hundred twelve corporations, spanning the worlds of finance, railroads, transportation, and public utilities. In this era of relationship banking, board seats often meant a monopoly on a company's business. During the previous decade, the House of Morgan had floated almost two billion dollars in securities, an astronomical figure for the time. The money trust hysteria stemmed from a wave of bank mergers. Wall Street was snowballing into one big Morgan-dominated institution. In December 1909, Pierpont had bought a majority stake in the Equitable Life Assurance Society from Thomas Fortune Ryan. This gave him strong influence over America's three biggest insurance companies, Mutual Life, Equitable, and New York Life. Although he subsequently mutualized the equitable and sold it to policyholders, the potential for abuse seemed terrifying. Pierpont also controlled several New York City trusts through that old trick from railroad days, the Voting Trust. His Bankers Trust had taken over three other banks. In 1909, he had gained control of Guarantee Trust, which, through a series of mergers, he converted into America's largest trust. It had two Morgan partners on its voting trust. As a director of both Bankers Trust and Guarantee Trust, Harry Davison blithely claimed that Morgans had no more control over the two banks than over the Pujo Committee itself. But Morgan records reveal a distinctly proprietary tone toward the banks. When Davison vacationed, for instance, Lamont dashed off such memos as, Banking Matters, Everything running along smoothly and successfully at the bankers. At the Guarantee Trust, things are in good shape. Besides these Morgan-controlled trust companies, the core money trust group included J.P. Morgan & Company, First National Bank, and National City Bank. Over the National Bank of Commerce, America's second biggest, Pierpont had such influence that it was styled J. Pierpont Morgan's Bank. Wall Street bankers incestuously swapped seats on each other's boards. Some banks had so many overlapping directors it was hard to separate them. Five of nine Chase directors were also First National directors, giving George F. Baker control over Chase. The banks also shared large equity stakes in each other. Pierpont was the biggest outside shareholder in Baker's First National Bank. After the 1907 panic, Pierpont also took a large block of National City stock and put Jack on its board. The public could be forgiven for suspecting that these Morgan banks avoided competition and exercised veto power over new entrants to the capital markets. 
In part, the new financial giants resulted from the stupendous scale of industrial financing. Business gravitated to New York as companies became national in scope. For instance, in 1906, J.P. Morgan & Company captured American telephone and telegraphs business from Boston's Kidder Peabody, which had marketed AT&T bonds in New England but couldn't handle its new need for national financing. Banks had to grow with their customers, and the industrial trusts created a money trust as much as the other way around. Similarly, with large-scale foreign financing in China, Latin America, and elsewhere, Washington had forged Wall Street banks into an instrument of statecraft, but was then dismayed when they cooperated at home. Why didn't banks just merge instead of carrying out the charade of swapping shares and board members? Most were private partnerships or closely held banks and could have done so. The answer harked back to traditional American antipathy against concentrated financial power. The Morgan First National National City Trio feared public retribution if it openly declared its allegiance. In 1911, the group thought of merging the Bank of Commerce and Chase National Bank, but the move was vetoed by National City President James Stillman. As Jack had cabled Pierpont, his objection arises from his feeling that it is better at present not to call attention to the great power of TRIO, which might increase public sentiment against that power throughout United States. None of the TRIO wishes further large investment in bank stocks for a long period. At the Pujo hearings, Pierpont faced a crafty adversary. Short, sharp-nosed, and mustachioed, Samuel Untermeyer was no scruffy radical, but an affluent lawyer who sported fresh orchids in his lapel. A close student of trusts, he had investigated equitable life assurance and standard oil, he had a suave, insinuating style. Pierpont, by contrast, was rough and uncouth in public. At this moment of supreme crisis, he reverted to those precepts that Junius had pounded into his head, the gentleman banker's code of the city. The famous exchange went as follows. Untermeyer, is not commercial credit based primarily upon money or property? Morgan, no, sir. The first thing is character. Untermeyer, before money or property? Morgan, before money or anything else. Money cannot buy it. Because a man I do not trust could not get money from me on all the bonds in Christendom. Spectators applauded, and businessmen across America stood rapt by this eloquence. The usually taciturn Pierpont had ennobled banking in an unexpected way. On Wall Street, banker Henry Seligman said, stock prices leapt five to ten points on the strength of this testimony. Pierpont phrased the point more colorfully. I have known a man to come into my office, and I have given him a check for a million dollars, when I knew that they had not a cent in the world. However much financiers might cheer such sentiments, to outsiders the statements sounded like Kant preached to dupes. Yet, as we have seen, early merchant bankers used character and class as crude forms of credit screening. Ever since the Medicis and Fuggers, it was a practical way for private bankers to protect their precious capital base. Pierpont's statement was neither as cynical as critics thought, nor as noble as friends imagined. It was a workable business strategy. In the history books, Pierpont's epigrammatic sayings stand out. In the transcript of the Pujo hearings, however, they appear against an arid backdrop of denials and monosyllabic grunts as if he wouldn't concede the hearing's legitimacy. Stamping his cane, Pierpont grew bullheaded and snorted like some angry god held hostage by heathens. Grudging in his explanations, he was led by Untermeyer into some absurd statements. For instance, Untermeyer got Pierpont to state his rationale for the one-man control of the railroads he sponsored. Untermeyer, but what I mean is that the banking house assumes no legal responsibility for the value of the bonds, does it? Morgan, no, sir, but it assumes something else that is still more important, and that is the moral responsibility which has to be defended so long as you live. This was Pierpont in a nutshell. He represented the bondholders and expressed their wrath against irresponsible management.
But Untermeyer saw more than passive surveillance at stake in the directorships and voting trusts. Besides representing bondholders, the House of Morgan represented itself to ensure a steady flow of business. It could intervene to protect its own interests. Because Pierpont wouldn't admit this, he spouted gibberish. Untermeyer, you do not think you have any power in any department or industry in this country, do you? Morgan, I do not. Untermeyer, not the slightest? Morgan, not the slightest. One senses that Untermeyer, far from being displeased, gladly used such intransigence to showcase Pierpont's arrogance. Untermeyer, your firm is run by you, is it not? Morgan, no, sir. Untermeyer, it is not? Morgan, no, sir. Untermeyer, you are the final authority, are you not? Morgan, no, sir. Despite a mass of circumstantial evidence, the Pujo Committee never proved a money trust in a strict conspiratorial sense. Rather, it found a community of interest that concentrated the control of credit and money in the hands of a few men, of which J.P. Morgan and Company are the recognized leaders. It said that six houses, J.P. Morgan and Company, First National, National City, and Kuhn Loeb, along with Boston's Lee Higginson and Kidder Peabody, acted in concert in sponsoring securities of prime corporations and governments. It was hard for large companies to market bonds without this group, or for rivals to take business away from them. The Pujo Committee documented the gentlemanly rules of conduct among old-line Wall Street banks. They competed, but in a manner as formal and ritualized as a minuet. They wouldn't bid against each other for bond issues. Rather, a single house would privately negotiate a deal and then assign syndicate allotments to other firms. Over time, these allotments tended to be unvarying for a particular company. As Jacob Schiff told Pujo, it was not good form to create unreasonable interference of competition. Good practices did not justify competition for security issues. Whether this was a barefaced plot to bar outsiders or just a natural response to market conditions would be debated for the next forty years. The issue would not be settled until the Medina trial of the early 1950s, when the House of Morgan would again be branded the kingpin of the conspiracy. The Pujo hearings had one immediate consequence that seemed to threaten Morgan power. In December 1913, President Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act, providing the government with a central bank and freeing it of reliance on the House of Morgan in emergencies. The new Federal Reserve System was a hybrid institution, with private regional reserve banks and a public Federal Reserve Board in Washington. Yet the House of Morgan moved so artfully to form an alliance with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York that for the next twenty years it would actually gain power from the new financial system. The bankers had not yet been tamed. After the Pujo hearings, Jack and his sister Louisa sat with their father in a private railroad car as he recovered from the strain of his testimony. As soon as servants had brought their luggage from the hotel, they all returned to New York. Jack lauded his father's testimony, thought him perfectly frank, very helpful to situation, but developed a visceral loathing for Untermeyer, whom he tagged the beast. He thought the Pujo hearings a blatant assault on the Morgan Bank, with other bankers only drawn in as a smokescreen. From Yankee pride, both father and son professed to be immune to the whinings of such little men. Striking a brave tone, Jack said, We have all here maintained the note which Pierpont struck so well in Washington, that he was much too big to be annoyed by miserable little things like that. The reality, however, was that Senior never recuperated from the ordeal of this public inquisition. Pierpont was too thin-skinned to be philosophical about political attacks and didn't recognize himself as the ogre of the newspaper cartoons. He thought himself a generous, paternalistic boss and an avuncular grandfather, not a bloodthirsty monster. He was baffled by the new public scrutiny of businessmen and predicted that the time is coming when all business will have to be done with glass pockets. 
He thought Jack might fare better in the new environment. In his last months, Pierpont possessed a melancholy sense of history as having passed him by. He told a visitor in 1913, "'When you see Mr. Wilson, tell him for me that if there should ever come a time when he thinks any influence or resources that I have can be used for the country, they are wholly at his disposal.' Such a time never came. Fleeing up the Nile with Louisa, Pierpont could find no respite from his troubles. As always, his ailments were a mass of amorphous symptoms, rather than a definable illness. Louisa privately reported to Jack on his digestive upsets, depression, insomnia, and nervous attacks. Bilious attack practically overcome, but result months of strain very apparent now, she cabled as they sailed to Luxor. Jack, always in the wrong place, always full of yearning, now wished to join Pierpont. But theirs was no ordinary father-son relationship. A political succession, no less momentous than a presidential transition, was underway, and Louisa reported that executive power was being placed in his hands. Your suggestion coming yourself has touched and pleased him, but he is anxious you should remember how much depends upon you being on the spot in New York, how many interests are in your hands. He is too weak make decision. He wishes leave it you. It was the first time Pierpont had ever explicitly delegated top authority to his son. As Pierpont weakened, fresh doctors were shipped out from New York. The corpulent banker fancied that fresh butter and cream from Cragston might restore him, and asked Jack to send some. The final siege came in a five hundred dollar a day suite of Rome's Grand Hotel. News of Pierpont's terminal illness rattled the art world, which braced for a general collapse of prices. The ground floor of the Grand Hotel teemed with art dealers, antiquarians, foppish noblemen, shabby peddlers, all trying to unload a last painting or statue on the dying financier. So zealous were their assaults that the New York Times described them as being repulsed with the regularity of surf on the beach. Meanwhile, Pierpont's condition required that politics and business not be mentioned. He was groggy but sleepless. Even grains of morphine couldn't soothe his tormented mind or slow his racing pulse. On the night of March 31st, he grew delirious and mumbled about his boyhood. Imagining himself back at school in Hartford or Switzerland, he praised a fine lot of boys in his class. Before he died, he said, I've got to go up the hill. He died shortly after midnight. Within twelve hours, the Pope and 3,697 other people had telegraphed their regrets to the Grand Hotel. The Morgan partners attributed the death to Pujo. The charge may be overstated. Pierpont was seventy-five when he died. Almost twenty years before, worried doctors wouldn't approve a life insurance policy in his name. He smoked dozens of cigars daily, stowed away huge breakfasts, drank heavily, and refused to exercise. If Jack lost weight, Pierpont would grow alarmed. When Jack began playing squash regularly, Pierpont said, Rather he than I. From boyhood, he had been chronically sick, often spending several days in bed each month. Hardly a period of his life was free of illness and depression. That he lasted until seventy-five, with his myriad ailments and resolutely bad habits, is close to miraculous, testimony to a powerful constitution. Then, in his last years, there were numerous disappointments. The Titanic, the U.S. Steel and International Harvester Suits, Woodrow Wilson's attacks on the Money Trust, and so on, that may have created unbearable stress. But at Morgan's, everybody knew Untermeyer was the murderous scoundrel. As Lamont told historian Henry Steele Commager, within three or four months, out of a seemingly clear sky, his health failed, and after a two weeks' illness, from no particular malady, he died. Certainly the hearings hastened Pierpont's death, but who can say they caused it? Nevertheless, the belief was widespread at the bank, and only hardened partners' feelings toward politicians and reformers. Jack began to follow Untermeyer's affairs with a morbid curiosity. When a senator attacked the lawyer in 1914, he fairly gloated. 
I enjoyed reading every account of it, and the more I see him caught in the machinery of his evil deeds, the better pleased I am. How much had Pierpont amassed? Apart from his art collection, his estate came to $68.3 million, of which about $30 million represented his share in the New York and Philadelphia banks. Pierpont's $68.3 million estate would be equivalent to $802 million in 1989 dollars. The value of his art collection was estimated by the Duvines at $50 million. It was testimony to Pierpont's Olympian standing that the release of the figures occasioned some disbelief, even some pity. Andrew Carnegie was truly saddened by the revelation of poor Pierpont's poverty. And to think he was not a rich man, he sighed. Pierpont's fortune didn't approach those of the great industrialists, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Ford, or Harriman, and he didn't quite edge out Jay Gould. One magazine writer even saw the paltry estate as proof that Pierpont hadn't profited from inside information at his disposal. When Pierpont's will was disclosed, it contained many surprises. Overflowing with religious fervor, it had a florid opening in which he committed his soul into the hands of Jesus Christ. He distributed money with great liberality. Besides the Morgan bank capital, Jack was bequeathed $3 million outright, the Corsair, the property at Prince's Gate and Dover House, and that inestimable jewel, the Morgan Collection. Daughters Louisa Satterley and Juliet Hamilton received $1 million apiece, with an extra million thrown in for their husbands. The long-suffering Fanny received Cragston, the Madison Avenue House, a 100000 guaranteed annuity, and a $1 million trust fund. She survived until 1924, faithfully attended by Jack. There was friction in the family regarding Anne Morgan's award of $3 million. Since she would have no children and planned to donate the money to philanthropic activities, some thought she should have received much less. For Morgan retainers, it was a red-letter day, fulfilling their most delirious dreams. Librarian Belle da Costa Green got her first Morgan bequest of $50,000, Jack would later match it, plus a guarantee of continued employment at the library. Dr. James Marco, who pumped Pierpont with medication during the 1907 panic, received a $25,000 annuity, which was to revert to his pretty wife Annette, should she outlive him. This bequest, along with legends claiming that doctors at the lying-in hospital married Pierpont's former mistresses, kept alive rumors that Annette Marco had been a mistress of Pierpont's. Even Pierpont's sailing master, Captain W. B. Porter, received $15,000. In the most astounding act of paternalism, every J. P. Morgan & Company and Morgan Grenfell employee received a free year's salary. When the bill came due, Jack paid out $373,000. There was close to $10 million in charitable bequests, including $1.35 million to Dr. Marco's New York Lying In Hospital, $1 million to Harvard, $560,000 to St. George's Church, and $500,000 for the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. By no coincidence, Pierpont's last rites resembled the Anglo-American tribute he had arranged for Junius. He turned his own funeral into a last act of father worship. As Jack said, Pierpont had left full instructions in regard to funeral, which is to be as like his father's as possible. Again, the morning was transatlantic, with Pierpont honored by both a memorial service at Westminster Abbey and the closing of the New York Stock Exchange. At sea, flags of the shipping trust flew at half-mast. Back in New York, his body lay in state at the Morgan Library. For the funeral service at St. George's, a full complement of Episcopal bishops, one each from New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, came in response to a summons in Pierpont's will. Harry T. Burley, a black baritone, the grandson of an escaped slave and a favorite of Pierpont's, sang the hymns. Pierpont was buried in the family mausoleum at Hartford's Cedar Hill Cemetery, according to his wishes, opposite the place where my father's remains are interred. Perhaps no other event of the year 1913 received as many lines of newspaper copy as Pierpont Morgan's death. Momentarily, the critical drumbeat, 
which had grown so loud and insistent with the Pujo hearings, was silenced. In lengthy obituaries, no analogy was too large to encompass the personage who had just died. The economist called Pierpont the Napoleon of Wall Street. The Wall Street Journal said, Such men have no successors. There were no successors to Napoleon, Bismarck, Cecil Rhodes, or E. H. Harriman, and their authority was not perpetuated. These articles suggested that the last titan had died, and the world of banking would never again see a figure of such scope. From our later perspective, Pierpont Morgan seems large because of certain characteristics of the baronial age. The companies Pierpont Morgan controlled were weak and primitive by today's standards, without a vast, highly trained managerial corps. Many firms had just graduated from the regional to the national level and needed Wall Street bankers in order to obtain broader financing. Even the governments Pierpont lent money to were relatively unsophisticated and lacked the central banks, systems of taxation, and large treasuries of today. Despite the multinational reach of Pierpont's empire, his great exploits, the 1895 rescue of the gold standard, the creation of U.S. steel, the cornering of Northern Pacific, the negotiations in the 1907 panic, were exclusively American in character. After Pierpont Morgan's death, the House of Morgan would become less autocratic, less identified with a single individual. Power would be diffused among several partners, although Jack Morgan would remain as figurehead. In the new diplomatic age, the bank's influence would not diminish. Rather, it would break from its domestic shackles and become a global power, sharing financial leadership with central banks and governments and profiting in unexpected ways from the partnership. What nobody could have foreseen in 1913 was that Jack Morgan, shy, awkward, shambling Jack, who had cowered in the corners of Pierpont's life, would preside over an institution of perhaps even larger power than the one ruled by his willful, rambunctious father.